Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposal proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals shown at item 4 of today's order of business, and an additional proposal has been lodged by the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee for a private meeting today from 1.50 p.m. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I believe you're seeking the call, Senator Gallagher. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day, National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and Associated Bill vote to be taken on the second reading. So the question is that the bills be read a second time, and that's the National Anti-Corruption Commission bill. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022. National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? The, the, there being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And, uh, now that we're the stage, I just do want to indicate to the chamber I only have a few questions uh, that I just want to put to the minister, and then obviously more than happy to move on to the consideration of the amendments, uh, so that we can facilitate the bill through the parliament. Uh, so, minister, as I said, ju just a few questions, uh, just in relation to section 73.3. Given the Australian Human Rights Commission recommended the factors in section 73.3 be made mandatory rather than optional, it's just the rationale behind why the government hasn't adopted this amendment. It is one of the amendments that the coalition is putting forward. I understand the government is not supporting that uh, amendment. Uh, but just in terms of what is the actual rationale, given, as I said, it is the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, that actually have made this recommendation in relation to the factors in section 73.3, um, that they be made mandatory and not optional. And it is an amendment we're putting forward, but I understand won't have the government's support. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, as Senator Cash would be aware, the bill sets out a number of factors which the Commissioner may consider 
when determining whether to hold a public hearing. The government does not consider that it is necessary or appropriate to require the Commissioner to consider each of those factors listed in all cases. The Commissioner will have the discretion to determine which factors are relevant to the question of whether it, should, it would be in the public interest to hold a public hearing and whether exceptional circumstances exist in the context of a specific investigation. Under the bill, the Commissioner will be required to be a former state or federal court judge or an experienced legal practitioner. As such, they could be expected to bring extensive legal expertise in determining whether the requirements for a public hearing are met. There is limited value in mandating a consideration of a particular issue in circumstances where it would not be a relevant factor. Senator Cash. Uh, th thank you for that explanation. Can I just ask then, given that it was a recommendation of the Australian Human Rights Commission, um, did the Attorney General or the government have discussions with the Australian Human Rights Commission in relation to why they made that recommendation and why the government, I mean, given it is the Australian Human Rights Commission, has decided not to? And what was the feedback given uh, by the Australian Human Rights Commission? Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Um, those views that were expressed by the Human Rights Commission were obviously expressed in the context of the Senate inquiry. Um, and my understanding is that the inquiry did not make a recommendation to back in the view of the Human Rights Commission. So, yes, the Attorney General considered those views in the context of the broader inquiry. <clears throat> Senator Cash. Um, We've also proposed, or the opposition has also proposed, an amendment that would require a commissioner and a deputy commissioner to act in concert to commence a public hearing. This was a recommendation of Dr James Renwick, uh, the former independent national security legislation monitor. Again, could, I just, could we just work through the rationale behind why the government has not adopted what many would say um, is a very sensible recommendation. Uh, Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Uh, as Senator Cash has indicated, this is the subject of an, uh, an amendment that the opposition will be moving. Uh, fundamentally, what this comes down to is that the government considers that the commissioner will be best placed to determine whether to conduct a public hearing, including whether it is in the public interest and whether exceptional circumstances justify doing so. The Commissioner will be required to ensure that the benefits of holding hearings in public are balanced with other potential negative impacts. We should not, we should not operate on the presumption that the Commissioner, who will have extensive legal expertise, will not apply this test in a rigorous, fair and dispassionate manner. Senator Cash. Look, and again, these are amendments that we are putting forward. I understand they don't have the government's support, um, but it is just getting the rationale behind why the certain decisions um, were made. Um, just in terms of also um, the Law Council and its suggestions, uh, they made a suggestion including an additional threshold that will allow the National Anti-Corruption Commission to conduct investigations into past conduct only where there's an identifiable no. public interest in doing so. Uh, and again, given that this is a recommendation from the Law Council of Australia, and they have recommended um, the addition of a public interest test, can I just better understand the rationale again behind why the government hasn't taken on this recommendation? And very similar to my first question in relation to the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, in making this determination, uh, what discussions were, were had with the Law Council in relation to uh, why their suggestion uh, was not being adopted, and what feedback the Law Council gave to the government? Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, the Commissioner will be able to investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct that occurred before the Commission was established. 
It will be a matter for the Commissioner to determine what matters involving past conduct to investigate. The government does not support limiting this discretion for the Commissioner. It can be expected that the amount of time that has elapsed since the conduct is alleged to have occurred will be a factor considered by the Commission in determining whether it is a priority for investigation. In some cases, the passage of time will also affect the extent to which the Commission is able to obtain information and evidence. These are entirely ordinary considerations for law enforcement and investigative agencies to take into account when deciding whether to open investigations into allegations relating to historic conduct. Uh, but you'll see a bit of a running theme between my responses to these questions, which is that we are trying to preserve the independence of the Commission to make its own decisions about what to investigate, who, when, without uh, tying it up to, into um, great limitations. Senator Cash. Uh, just in terms of you referred to one factor that the Commissioner or the Commission may take into consideration and that was in relation to the affluxion of time. J just again for the, for the benefit of um, the Hansard record in particular, what are the other factors that will be considered by the Commissioner in determining um, whether or not they should conduct an investigation into past conduct? Minister. I probably can't add a lot to what I've already said, but um, one of the things I also said, which is related to time, is frankly, the strength of evidence. And as Senator Cash would know, being a former lawyer herself, um, the, the longer ago an incident occurs, there are usually evidentiary problems that arise. So um, I would expect, obviously, um, uh, the, the presence of evidence to support an allegation will be an important consideration, and that tends to decrease as time goes on. Senator Cash. Uh, Thank you. And just in terms of another recommendation by the Law Council of Australia, uh, they also recommended that the Administrative Appeals Judicial Review Act apply, be applied to all aspects of the National Anti-Corruption Commission bill. Um, the bill, as you would be aware, currently has significant carve-outs with Part 6 on investigations and Part 7 on hearings. Um, they are excluded. Just in terms of, again, when I mean, this was a recommendation from the Law Council, um, what rationale is there behind the government, um, or why doesn't the government want people brought before the National Anti Corruption Commission? I know in the second reading speech um, that I presented to the Senate yesterday, it's not just obviously about a small group of people being parliamentarians. Uh, it does go to, it is estimated, up to, say, one million people um, could possibly be brought within the remit of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. So it's the concern in relation to people being brought before the National Anti-Corruption Commission um, having that access to judicial review, and I think the examples that we gave, you gave yesterday, you know, com car drivers, cleaners in Parliament House, etc., uh, to have access to judicial review as they would in relation to most other decisions of Commonwealth departments. Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. I think Senator Cash's question goes to an additional amendment um, that the opposition intends to move, uh, which is, and the purpose of that amendment is to remove the provisions that would exempt certain decisions under the NAC bill from review under the ADJR Act. Um, the consequential bill that we're dealing with here provides that decisions relating to the commencement of an investigation or inquiry and intermediary or procedural steps by the Commission on the way to reaching its findings would not be subject to review under uh, the ADJR Act. This is appropriate to ensure that the Commission's statutory functions are not undermined and delayed as a result of lengthy litigation at each interlocutory step of an investigation and that investigations and inquiries can be conducted in a timely manner. A person may still seek judicial review of these intermediary or procedural decisions under the Judiciary Act 1903 or in the High Court's original jurisdiction. Uh, and that's why, when we get to it, the government will not be supporting this amendment. Senator, Senator Scar. Uh, Minister, and again, I've got a number of questions coming out of the uh, Joint Select Committee, which I served on. Uh, so, and I appreciate you weren't there during the course of the hearing. Uh, there, 
The issue arose during the course of the hearing as to whether or not someone who's subject to a notice to produce or to testify at private hearings could tell their spouse. Uh, and we heard testimony during the, the course of the, the hearing about the psychological pressure that people are under in the context of a corruption inquiry. Um, why is it the case that someone uh, should not be permitted to tell their spouse, their closest uh, level of support, psychological support, in circumstances where the spouse themselves is not the subject of a corruption investigation? So, um, why is it that this bill doesn't provide that someone who's the subject of a corruption investigation can't tell their spouse where their spouse is themselves not the subject of a corruption investigation? Doesn't that just reflect the reality of social relationships and the need for people to have the love and support of their closest person in this world? Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Scar. Uh, I can assure Senator Scar that the legislation, as it's currently drafted, does provide the Commissioner with the discretion to allow uh, people um, who are the subject of a notice to produce or a private hearing summons to disclose that to their family members, but on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's not an acro across-the-board um, uh, permission for someone who is the subject of that sort of a notice to uh, inform their spouse, uh, and that's because um, in many cases, it may be that family members may also be the subject of the same or separate investigations. They may be the beneficiaries of allegedly corrupt conduct, or they may be key witnesses in their own right. Um, but nevertheless, the legislation does provide discretion to the commissioner to allow a disclosure to a family member on a case-by-case -case basis. Senator Scar. But, Minister, in a situation where the spouse themselves is not the subject, of, of the corruption investigation, doesn't it simply reflect um, the reality that a, a, one would reasonably expect a person who is the subject of a corruption investigation to communicate with their spouse and to seek love and support from their spouse? And that is something human experience tells us should not be the subject to the discretion of a commissioner or anyone in a position of power. Minister. Well, I, I imagine, Senator Scar, that that is exactly the kind of situation where the commissioner may decide to. Uh, allow someone to disclose this to a, to a family member, but we think it's dangerous to allow that to happen in every single case um, without any reference to the Commission itself, because there are cases where uh, family members may also be the subject uh, of the same or separate investigations. Uh, and if we were to allow an across-the-board permission for people to disclose these types of matters to, to their spouse, uh, then that would potentially jeopardise investigations. But the case-by-case uh, discretion for the Commissioner exists under the legislation. Senator Scar. So the Law Council of Australia raised concerns with respect to the abrogation of the privilege against self-incrimination. And I know, given your experience, you're well acquainted with the foundation stones of the privilege against self-incrimination and also privileges relating to legal professional privilege. Why should it be the case that um, the Commission shouldn't exhaust all other co coercive powers before abrogating the principle against self-incrimination. Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Scar. Of course, uh, the privilege against self-incrimination is an important uh, principle in our justice system. Um, the but, and the bill does contain strong safeguards around the use of information that the Commission obtains at hearings and in, responses, in response to notices to produce. Um, the, uh, the bill does prohibit evidence obtained through the Commission's coercive powers from being admitted in confiscation proceedings, where those proceedings are already on foot or are imminent when the Commission holds a hearing. Uh, we think that this strikes an appropriate balance um, to ensure that, co that co allegedly corrupt public officials can't retain the proceeds of their corruption while ensuring uh, the uh, Commission's powers cannot be used to advance proceedings that are imminent or already on foot. That, that point that I'm making particularly relates to self-incrimination -in as it relates to confiscation proceedings. More generally, um, I guess our, our position is that corrupt conduct poses a significant risk to the community and corrodes public trust in public institutions. 
corruption investigations are inherently concerned with how and why public officials have made allegedly corrupt decisions and therefore requires that anti-corruption commissions have powers to require persons to explain their conduct. Um, for this reason, the bill abrogates the traditional privilege against self-incrimination. This approach is consistent with that of all state and territory anti-corruption commissions, and it's appropriate as it will ensure the Commission can conduct corruption investigations in a timely fashion and hear evidence on matters that would ordinarily be protected to ensure that the Commissioner is fully informed. Uh, again, I know this relates to an amendment the Opposition intends to move, which we will be opposing, uh, because we think that, that for the amendment to pass would significantly limit the Commission's investigative powers. Senator Cash. Thank you. And look, for the purposes of obviously time, um, a number of the questions we have do directly relate to the amendments the opposition will be moving. Uh, so perhaps it may be we won't ask any further questions directly now. We'll ask them in the amendment stage if the Australian Greens wanted to move their first amendment. Uh, well, be... Senator Cash, I just want to open up the call on that, that line of those lines of questioning that the opposition have done. Does any honourable member wish to? contribute to that line of questioning before we go to the amendment. Senator Shoebridge. I had a separate line of questioning. Doesn't, yeah, I'm, I'm open to any line of questioning right. Thank uh, you. before we go into the... I'm holding off the amendment, yep. going to the amendments for the uh, benefit th of honourable members. Thanks, Deputy President. It's to the minister. Can you articulate what circumstances the government um, <coughs> envisages would meet the exceptional circumstances test? Can you articulate one instance that would meet the exceptional circumstances test for the purposes of public hearing? Uh, Minister. Thank you, Deputy President, and thank you, um, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I know that this is a point that you've raised uh, throughout the consideration of this legislation, Senator Shoebridge, and I think I've heard you raise it several times in the media as well. Um, and as we have said on numerous occasions, um, we don't believe that it is useful to narrow the Commission's juris at discretion by explaining for the Commission what ex exceptional circumstances constitutes. Um, all, what this all gets back to, of course, is the ability under the legislation for the Commission to hold public hearings in exceptional circumstances. Um, as I said earlier in response to a question, I think, from Senator Cash, we have deliberately taken the position in constructing this legislation that the Commission should have independence from the government to make its own decisions about what it investigates, who it investigates, the time frame of that investigation and whether it holds public hearings or not in exceptional circumstances. So I'm not going to give examples of what those exceptional circumstances might be because I don't want to um, unreasonably constrain the independence of the Commission. Senator Shoebridge. That's interesting. But of course, if you gave one non-exclusive example, far from limiting the Commission's capacity, that would be a clear example that showed the government's intent is it really the case that you can't think of a single example where the government would be satisfied that the exceptional circumstances test is met? Is that, is that really where we're at? After a decade of debate, a Labor commitment to, uh, to the election, to have the test based on the public interest, and we're now here in the last few hours of debate and the government can't think of a single case that would see a public hearing being held. Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge. Um, I suspect this is something we're going to have to agree to disagree on. Um, it's not that the government can't think of examples of exceptional circumstances. It's that the government does not wish to constrain the Commission by giving examples of exceptional circumstances. I can think of examples of what I think might be exceptional circumstances. I'm sure that you can as well, Senator Shoebridge, but it's neither your job nor mine to decide for the Commission what those exceptional circumstances are. It's the job of the Commission, acting independently of government, without being constrained by examples or, or rules that a government puts down. We want this to be an independent body. We want it to make its own decisions about what it considers to be exceptional circumstances, which may very well be the same as what I think, or it may be something different. Senator Shoebridge. 
If the government genuinely didn't want to constrain the NAC's ability to hold public hearings, then why did the government move away from its election commitment to simply have a test based on the public interest, which works so well in jurisdictions such as the New South Wales ICAC? Why did the government move away from that election commitment um, and insert the additional threshold of exceptional circumstances? What was wrong with the public interest test that you took to the election? Minister. Um, thank you, Deputy President. Senator Shoebridge, while I didn't take part in the Senate inquiry, I have no doubt that this is something that you have asked repeatedly and had answered many times. Um, I respect your right to um, keep asking the same questions, but you have heard these answers before. Um, uh, the government has come to a view uh, that the commissioner is best placed to determine um, what uh, that, that public hearings should be able to be held uh, in exceptional circumstances. Um, the reason we have taken that path is, is we do think that it is the Commissioner's role uh, to, to make that sort of decision rather than setting uh, a different test, the test that you are advocating yourself. Senator Shoebridge. Minister, why does your government think the politicians in this place, in the federal parliament, should have that shield and protection from public scrutiny based on an exceptional circumstances test, when we know that in New South Wales, as a key example, that shield isn't there and the public interest test has been so effective in holding politicians to account at a, at news, at a New South Wales level? What's special about federal politicians that they need this protection? Minister. Well, I suspect this is going to be the first of many times that Senator Shoebridge uh, seeks to mischaracterise the government's position. We've become pretty well acquainted with uh, that style of debate from Senator Shoebridge in his short time here. Um, but uh, as Senator Shoebridge knows, there are different approaches that are taken by state, different states as to how they handle public hearings. Uh, New South Wales does take a different approach to, for instance, what happens in South Australia, what happens in the Northern Territory and possibly other jurisdictions as well where the government has landed. And let's not forget, there were people in this place who didn't think there should be any public hearings whatsoever. Uh, and that is not the position of our government. We do think that there is a place for public hearings for corruption investigations, but we think they should apply the, in, in what the Commission considers to be exceptional circumstances. Um, but I look forward to Senator Shoebridge uh, telling me something different to what I just said in his next contribution. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Thank you Minister. For that, I have a, have a question also relating to exceptional circumstances. I, I note the uh, Labor Party's platform uh, leading into the election, the National Anti-Corruption Commission fact sheet says that the Commission will have the power to hold public hearings where the Commission determines it is in the public interest to do so. I, I've heard and, and take on board your feedback, so my question is, Given how much we've heard about election commitments, can you confirm that your government is open to changing their mind when presented with other information when it comes to an election commitment? Minister. Thanks, Senator Pocock. And can I thank you for your um, cooperation and, and negotiation throughout this debate? I know this is something that's been important to you as well. Uh, I don't think I'm going to fall into the trap, though, of um, answering hypotheticals about what we might do about election commitments. I'd probably want to know a little bit more detail about what you're talking about before I answer that kind of a question. But, but we have, you know, over the process of drafting this legislation, we think that we've got the balance right uh, in, in limiting uh, the Commission's ability to hold public uh, hearings to what it considers to be exceptional circumstances. Senator Pocock. Do you want to swap? Yeah. Thank you for the courtesy. <laughs> Is somebody seeking the call? Thank you, Senator Pocock. You Thank have you, call. Chair. Uh, 
Th thank you, Minister, for that. I, I appreciate your uh, engagement on this issue. So I just wanted to confirm that uh, it is your you accept the view that if this is legislated in its current form, it will differ from what the government went, the now government went to the election, promising the Australian people. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. I don't think I'm going to sort of get get into whether how every word of what we've ended up presenting is identical, slightly different to an election commitment. I think it was very clear heading into the election um, that if the Australian people voted for an Albanese Labor government, they would get a National Anti-Corruption Commission, something that the former government resisted every step of the way. And I'm very proud that it is going to be an Albanese Labor government that delivers for the very first time a National Anti-Corruption Commission. Senator Shoebridge. Minister, do you accept the basic premise of what Senator Pocock has put to you, which is you went to an election promising public hearings based upon a public interest test, and you've now junked that commitment and you've put in this additional, much, much harsher test of exceptional circumstances, which is contrary to what you took to the election? Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, what I would accept is that it will be an Albanese Labor government that delivers a national anti-corruption commission. Uh, that was our promise. That's what we're delivering. Uh, I think it's fabulous and it's a great day for Australian democracy if we can get this passed and established. Um, and the final form of this bill, whether it be in relation to this matter or any other, is the result of extensive consultation that the government has undertaken since winning the election. The question is that the bill stand as printed. All those in favour? No, Senator Shoebridge? Um, I'd seek to move my First Amendment now, if that's appropriate. Uh, yes, Senator Shoebridge. Um, uh, I move amendment number one on sheet 1730. Um, this amendment would, would if accepted, uh, fill a gap in the in the bill. The bill, as proposed um, in its principles, doesn't contain its principles and objects does not contain one key statement of principle, which is that we are establishing an independent national anti-corruption commission. Um, and uh, we heard in the committee uh, from witnesses very familiar with the New South Wales Commission. Um, that that clear statement of intent in the objects of the bill, um, stating unambiguously that we're establishing an independent National Anti-Corruption Commission, um, will be important. Because, of course, if there's any ambiguity about uh, how the Act should operate and it faces legal challenge, well, one of the first things a court will do is go back to the objects and say, well, what was Parliament trying to establish here? And surely we can unite on this. Surely we can unite on this and say what we're trying to establish here, one of the key objects of this bill, is to establish an independent National Anti Corruption Commission. And for those reasons, I commend the amendment to the House. Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President, and thanks, Senator Shoebridge, uh, for his amendment. Uh, the government, of course, supports the independence of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. I've made that point several times myself this morning, and I know other members of our government, in particular the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, have made the same point repeatedly over the last few months. One of the seven design principles for the Commission that the government took to the, to the election was that the, the Commission would, would operate independent from government. The independence of the Commission will be critical to its credibility and effectiveness. The bill contains a number of provisions to ensure the Commission's independence, including that the Commissioner will be able to receive complaints or referrals from any source, including the public. The Commissioner will be able to commence corruption investigations and public inquiries on their own motion. The appointments of the Commissioner and Deputy Commissioners will be subject to approval by a multi-partisan parliamentary joint committee, and the Commissioner will be appointed for a single fixed term and will have security of tenure comparable to that of a federal judge ensuring the officers of the Commission can undertake corruption investigations without fear of removal from office due to any findings they might make. The government does not, however, support amending the Objects Clause to include a reference to the Commission's independence. 
The objects clause in the bill is intended to set out the ultimate purpose of the legislation, which, in the case of the NAC bill, as this bill has become known, is to enable or facilitate the prevention, detection, timely investigation and referral for prosecution of corrupt conduct and to educate and provide information about corruption. The Commission will be the means through which these objects are achieved and its independence will assist in achieving these objects. However, neither the Commission nor its independent status are ends or objects in their own right, and for that reason the government does not support this amendment. Senator Cash. Thank you. And just some very brief comments uh, on behalf of the opposition. Um, the opposition also won't be supporting the amendment. Uh, we consider that the amendment is unnecessary. Uh, I understand it was also not recommended by the committee that looked into the National Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, and it does not reflect common drafting practice across the Commonwealth statute book. Senator Shoebridge. Um, I'd like to thank the minister and Senator Cash for their contributions. Of course, the bill is the National Anti-Corruption Commission bill. Its purpose is to establish a commission, and it's hopeful that that commission will fight corruption and put in place education measures, and hopefully, if they can ever overcome the, the test of exceptional circumstances, expose any existing corruption to the full glare of public um, review to provide that ultimate discouragement from corruption. So given that the bill is to create a national anti-corruption commission, and in fact the bill is a national anti-corruption commission bill, and not a national anti-corruption anti measure, I, I, I cannot understand, Minister, why you can't see that one of the core objects should be to establish a national, an independent national anti-corruption commission. Because I can tell you now that the people of Australia want to see this. They don't just want some amorphous anti-corruption measure. They want us to establish unambiguously in black and white an independent national anti-corruption commission. Why won't you accept that as one of the key objects? Minister? Uh, I refer to my previous answer. I can't really add much more to that other than to remind Senator Shoebridge of the number of provisions in the bill uh, which very strongly preserve the Commission's independence. The question is that Amendment 1 on Sheet 1730 be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I no. think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question, of, the question before the chair is that the amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge on sheet 1730 be agreed to. Those of the question passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator McKim, and teller for the noes, Senator Scar. Honourable Senators, there being 14 ayes and 25, 29 correction, 14 ayes and 29 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Cash, uh, thank you. And uh, I rise to move opposition amendments one to thirty-three on sheet one seven six two by leave together. Um, given the time, and obviously we'd like to see this bill passed. I did. Senator refer to Cash, we just need to see. Uh, leave has been sought. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cash. I did refer to all of these amendments uh, in my second reading speech, and I have questioned the minister uh, this morning in relation to the rationale behind the government uh, not supporting them. Uh, so, on that basis, I move them. So, the question is, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, we won't be supporting. Senator these Shoebridge, could I just ask you to hold for a moment? Could I ask senators to leave the chamber if they are going to engage in? vital discussions that serve the interests of the nation. And uh, those of you who remain to, to keep um, your peace so that we may hear the contributions in debate. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. So to be clear, opposition have now obtained leave to move clauses 4, 7 to 9, 12, 14, 14, 45, 73, 81, 82, 95, 98, 113 to 115, 154 and 78 together. Is, are you moving them all? Yes. Um, well, I won't respond to each and every one of the, um, those amendments, but what I'll say is this. The, the Greens' approach to this package of opposition amendments is that we don't support them because, by and large, they put in place a whole lot of tripwires for the Commission's jurisdiction, which would allow empowered and wealthy individuals and empowered and wealthy corporations to bring a series of unmeritorious legal challenges, which would ultimately delay the NAC's work by sometimes months or, as we've seen in Victoria, sometimes years through legal challenge after legal challenge. We want to ensure that the National Anti-Corruption Commission can get on and do its job. And If these amendments together were accepted, um, that would absolutely prejudice the capacity of the NAC to do its work. 
We note as well that there are some other amendments here seeking to um, overtly rope in um, uh, uh, registered industrial officials by definition. We're firmly of the view that if any member of a union um, is exercising any federal power and acts in a potentially corrupt way, that that conduct would already be the subject of review by the NAC, and we don't see any merit in the proposed amendments being put forward by the NAC. And I, when I say that, I know that the unions collectively are also perfectly comfortable with that position. Um, this, NAC, this bill will provide the appropriate level of accountability, and we won't be supporting these kind of amendments that I think would, in, by and large, uh, tie the Commission down in endless legal challenges and prevent it from reviewing, amongst other things, what's happened in the last nine years in this place. Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. The government will also be opposing uh, each of the opposition amendments. Uh, we've sort of traversed why in the earlier discussion, so I won't go over it in great detail. Um, I do want to just reinforce the point that uh, one amendment that the opposition is moving, um, in our view, seeks to limit the past conduct that the anti-corruption commissioner could investigate. Um, we, and it was an important difference between the model that the government is putting, putting forward and what the opposition put forward when they were in government was the ability to investigate past conduct. Uh, we don't think that we should be limiting the, the commission's powers to investigate past conduct. We think we should leave it to the commission to determine that rather than putting restrictions around that. But we will be opposing these amendments for reasons I've gone into previously and for reasons the Attorney-General detailed in the House. The question is that amendments 1 to 30 32 and 34 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Prost. Honourable Senators, I put the question as moved by Senator Cash that amendments 1 to 30, 32 and 34 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the aye, Senator Scar, and teller for the no, Senator Pratt. Honourable Senators, there being 28 ayes and 36 noes, it's passed in the negative. I now have a second question to put, following on from the motion moved by Senator Cash, and that is that clause 115 stand as printed. If you wish that clause to remain, you vote in the affirmative. If you wish it to be removed, you vote no. I now we'll put the question that clause 115 stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. That completes the vote for uh, that series of amendments. We now come to amendments two and three on sheet 1730 in the name of the Australian Greens. 
Standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge. Thanks. Um, Senator Deputy Shoebridge, if you just give us a moment and we'll wait for the. The Senator is not intending to engage in the debate. I'd ask you to leave as soon as possible. Senator Shoebridge, you have the call. Thanks, Deputy President. Um, at this stage, I'm going to move Green's Amendment Number Two on Sheet 1730. Um, but I'll, I'll speak to Green's Amendments Numbers Two and Three at the same time because that might be convenient. But I'm only moving Number Two. Thank you. Um, <laughs> amendment Number Two seeks to reinsert a provision that was stripped out by the House by the other place um, in relation to the definition of corruption uh, found in Clause Eight of the Bill. There was um, some discussion about this at a committee during the, uh, the the committee hearing in relation to the bill, and there were a minority of, of participants in that committee inquiry. New South, the, the Queensland Bar Association and the New, and the South Australian Bar Association, um, who were who were anxious about what was then 81E of the bill, which which had a, an extended definition of corruption for the purposes of the jurisdiction of the NAC, which included any conduct of a, of a public official in that capacity that constitutes, involves or is engaged in for the purpose of corruption of any other kind. And the concern that was raised by a minority of participants in the inquiry was that was somehow too broad. Um, well, the Greens simply don't accept that, and I know a number of other crossbench Members of both the other place and uh, of the other place in particular oppose the stripping out of that for the very good reason that the argument that it's too broad fails to engage with um, how this provision fits within the bill. So first of all, for 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 this provision to be engaged, the the knack has to be satisfied that what they're looking at is corruption. And, um, and, and corruption has a well understood definition and meaning. And as we've seen from just the last week in, in federal politics, uh, politicians can keep coming up with new and novel ways to betray the public, the public trust. We've seen in the report that was released on Friday by um, Her Honour former Justice Bell in relation to the former Prime Minister, we've seen an example of what I would say is corrupt conduct that no one would have thought would have been possible 12 months ago. The, form, the now former Prime Minister seeking to have multiple ministerial appointments um, and, and, and keep that secret from the public, the parliament and even his own colleagues. Who would have thought that that kind of corruption could have been cooked up um, 12 months ago? And, and, and we've seen as well in the last week another member of the other place, his conduct being exposed as basically an agent for sale, uh, seeking to lobby in, in his role as a backbencher, seeking to be a lobbyist for whoever was willing to put um, cash in his tin and being exposed for doing that. Now, now maybe that was more predictable, that kind of appalling misbehaviour. Um, but, but you can see just in the last week how politicians keep coming up with new and novel ways to corrupt this parliament and to engage in corrupt conduct. So of course we need a broad definition going forward, because heaven knows what they'll come up with next to try and corrupt the public interest. But also, for this clause to be engaged, the NAC also has to be satisfied that it's not just corruption but it is also serious or repeated corruption. So the question we ask to both the government and the opposition, what kind of serious or repeated corruption do you not want the NAC to be looking at? Because that's the ultimate test here. If you oppose reinserting this uh, subsection 81E, you're saying that there's some serious or repeated corruption that you don't want the National Anti-Corruption Commission to have jurisdiction in relation? And if so, tell us what it is. Tell us what that corruption is. 
because we don't think we should be shutting the gate, closing the categories of corruption, because we know just how, uh, um, how in the past politicians have kept coming up with new and novel ways to corrupt parliament, corrupt government and betray the public interest. Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, well, as I say, I think we're all becoming accustomed to Senator Shoebridge's style of argument, which is to say that if you don't agree to what he's saying, then you are in some way a terrible person. Um, we've heard that loud and clear. Um, but we are confident that the legislation that we have uh, put forward to the parliament um, is, strikes the right balance uh, and, for the very first time, sees an Australian government taking seriously issues of corruption at the federal level. Um, in relation to Senator Shoebridge's first amendment, item two, uh, which seeks to reinsert a paragraph in the bill um, uh, as to the definition of cor corrupt conduct, I'm sure Senator Shoebridge is aware that what we've done in omitting that paragraph is accept the recommendation of the Joint Select Committee that looked at this bill, and that was a Joint Select Committee that included representatives of the Australian Greens. So that committee, that committee recommended that this clause be omitted from the bill. That committee included members of the Greens, and that's what we're doing. And I might also point out that Senator Shoebridge has tried to characterise the people who support the government's position as being some kind of minority. Well, that's a minority that includes the Law Council of Australia and the Australian Human Rights Commission, who also uh, agree with the government and, for that matter, the Joint Select Committee that this clause should be omitted from the bill. Uh, paragraphs 81A to 81D of the bill, which are retained here, would provide the Commission with broad jurisdiction to investigate corrupt conduct that is consistent with most state and territory models. The government is confident that the amended definition of corrupt conduct will enable the Commission to effectively investigate any form of serious or systemic corrupt conduct that is referred to it or that it may identify itself. And for that reason, we won't be supporting that amendment. In relation to the second amendment, item three, um, uh, uh, again, as the uh, Attorney General has noted, there's a point at which the making of discretionary grants can cross the line into corruption, referred to as pork barrelling, where public money is being given away for private purposes. The bill would enable the Commission to investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct in relation to a discretionary grants program where that conduct may involve a breach of public trust or dishonest or partial conduct. These are well-established conduct concepts which have been considered by the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption it's in its operation jersey. If there are circumstances where grants are allocated dishonestly or for an improper purpose, the Commission has the power to decide to investigate if it is of the opinion that this could invest, uh, involve serious or systemic corruption. Uh, there's a range of other activity that's going on within the Albanese government on, in this space, including the Minister for Finance considering opportunities to strengthen the Commonwealth grant and rules and guidelines. So, for these reasons, the government does not support this amendment. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I note that uh, the Australian Grooms have moved uh, amendment number two uh, as opposed to two and three, but I will put on the record the, coal, uh, the coalition's uh, comments in relation to both two and three. Um, as we have throughout the entire process, and I know that I have Senator Paul Scar in the chamber with me, um, we approach this legislation in the spirit of bipartisanship, uh, and in particular, uh, as the minister has outlined and as Senator Scar knows, uh, we accept the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee. Uh, they were consensus recommendations. Uh, the committee investigated these matters in detail. They worked through these matters. They listened to the evidence. Uh, and as I've said, they made consensus recommendations, which we support. The amendment, in particular, amendment number two, contradicts the consensus recommendations uh, of the Joint Select Committee. Uh, even the Law Council, the Queensland Law Society and the Australian Human Rights Commission all expressed the view that the provision was both circular and unclear. To that extent, it will make it difficult, if not impossible, for public officials to know what conduct is actually captured, uh, captured within the provision. Uh, there is also no clear or compelling case, in particular given the recommendations uh, coming out of 
the Joint Select Committee. Uh, there is no clear or compelling case for including this provision. Uh, I do note that even the Attorney General's Department, responding for the drafting of the bill and the preparation of the explanatory materials, they themselves were unable to identify a single example of conduct uh, which would be captured by the clause. Just in relation to amendment number three, uh, we would say it is a legislative note, but the amendment is actually unnecessary. Uh, again, we have approached this bill in the spirit of bipartisanship, and I do thank Senator Paul Scar again for the work uh, that he undertook on behalf of the coalition. But when you look at the Joint Select Committee, uh, it considered the definition of corrupt conduct in detail. And again, when you look at the recommendations of the Joint Select Committee, uh, this is not a provision that was recommended. Uh, but in addition to not being recommended by the committee, when you actually look at the drafting uh, that we have, it is problematic in that it leaves the scope of the Commission's jurisdiction unclear. We would say that the better approach is to make clear that the Commission's role is to investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct as the legislation currently does. Uh, and again, I would just reiterate, uh, as we have throughout, we approach this legislation in the spirit of bipartisanship, uh, and we will support the consensus recommendations of the committee in that regard, uh, and the opposition will not be lending its support to either of these amendments. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, it might be convenient if I briefly speak to amendment number three on that sheet as well now. Um, can I say, first of all, it, in relation to both amendments numbers two and three, I note that the, the minister and Senator Cash have referred to the committee's review of this. Of course, these were not by consensus, these recommendations. In relation to the absence of an express definition of pork barrelling, um, uh, both um, the member for Indy, Dr Haynes, and myself, on behalf of the Greens, indicated and said, said unambiguously that given the level of public concern regarding the alleged misuse of billions of dollars of public grants funds, there is real merit, merit in expressly addressing this in the definition of corruption. I don't know how clear you can be that that wasn't the, the failure to include an express roping in of pork barrelling was not by consensus. Um, and, and of course, we've seen in this parliament billions of dollars of public money being rotted by way of pork barrel in. And I know from my experience in the New South Wales Parliament, um, billions of dollars were rorted too by way of pork barrel in. And there is real public revulsion about it. And we want to be clear, unambiguously clear, that the NAC has the jurisdiction to look at pork barrel in. And in that regard, our amendment number three is simply putting a notation to the definition of corruption that provides, by way of guidance, that corrupt conduct may include conduct that constitutes pork barrelling or political do donations for the purpose of influencing a decision or policy made by a public official. Well, of course that should be in. And of course the NAC should be able to look at that. And I can't understand the resistance of both major parties from expressly including a reference to the corrupting power of both pork barrelling and political donations. And of course that would be consistent with the position that was adopted by the crossbench members um, in the parliamentary oversight. And, and when it comes to the the removal of Clause 81 e again, it's wrong to state that that was by consensus. On behalf of the Greens, I made it abundantly clear, including in the report, that the definition of corrupt conduct in 81 e um, should be retained and, 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 and made the arguments that you can hear today that it's not an open-end definition. It has to be serious or systemic, and it has to be corruption. So what I failed to hear from either the government or the opposition is, again, the obvious, uh, the obvious question that's asked when you oppose this definition. What kind of serious or systemic corruption do you think the NAC should be, should, should be able to investigate? What's the serious or systemic corruption that you think should not be able to darken the door of the National Anti-Corruption Commission? Um, so I, I commend both amendments to and three to the House for those reasons. Uh, Senator Shubridge, can I ask you to move three, and are you happy for me to put the question for both of them at the same time? Otherwise, I'll split them. Yeah, well, I, I think for, for efficiency of the House, I might seek leave to move them together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. And, and I, I, I do so. I move them. Move them. Thank you. Is there any further 
debate on the, this amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the amendments two and three on sheet 1730, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division is required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The, the question before the chair is that the amendments two and three on sheet 1730, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint teller for the ayes, Senator McKim, and teller for the noes, Senator Scar.
Honourable Senators, there being 15 ayes and 28 noes, it is passed in the negative. We now come to sheet 1769. In the standing, in the name of Senator Pocock. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendments no. one to four on sheet 1769, circulated in my name. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Chair. I move the amendments. These amendments were moved by the member for Indi in Helen Haynes in the lower house. And, and again, I would like to thank her for her work on this issue over many years. These amendments make clear that pork barrelling is corruption. We've seen concerns in communities across the country with the way that public funds have been allocated for political gain. This makes it clear that that can be investigated. I'm also concerned that this bill falls short when it comes to conduct by third parties that could impair public confidence in public administration. In particular, practices of collusive tendering, dishonestly obtaining benefit from public funding decisions and defrauding public revenue. This makes it clear that those are included. It's clear that to restore public trust, we need the very best model of a national anti-corruption commission we can possibly have. We should be aiming for world leading. That's what the Australian people have, have called for and expect. I believe these amendments go some way to ensuring that we make explicit what uh, we are hearing is, is implied by this legislation. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, for your amendments. Uh, the Commission will be a specialist body focused on preventing, detecting and investigating corruption involving public officials. The Commissioner will be able to fully investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct and transactions between public officials and third parties, as well as attempts by third parties to corrupt public officials. This includes the conduct referred to in Senator Prococke's proposed amendment where there is some involvement of a public official. Extending the Commission's jurisdiction beyond matters involving corruption of a public official to include external frauds against the Commonwealth that do not involve a public official would divert the Commission from its core purpose. And for that reason, the government does not support uh, that amendment, and that's items 2, 3 and 4 on sheet 169. In relation to the amendment items 5 and 6 on sheet, five, one six, sorry, sheet 1769, again, I thank Senator Pocock for these amendments. The government has committed substantial funding of $262 million over four years for the establishment and ongoing operation of the Commission. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Commission will have the function of, revi of reviewing the Commission's budget and finances and reporting to the Parliament on whether the Commission's resources are sufficient to effectively perform its functions and whether its budget should be increased. The Committee would be able to review the Commission's budget at any time. Uh, we, we, we think, therefore, that the Commission's budget and uh, the certainty around its budget is sufficiently preserved, uh, and we do not consider that further amendments would meaningfully enhance the, committee's, uh, the Commission's role, and for that reason we don't support this amendment either. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I note that uh, Senator Pocock has uh, moved amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1769, but there are also amendments uh, 5 and 6 on sheet 1769, which he has not moved, but I will speak uh, to both. Uh, the opposition will, be, will not be supporting uh, the amendments put forward by Senator Pocock. Uh, as I have already referred to in relation to the previous amendments that were before the Senate, uh, these amendments in part would expand the definition of corruption. Uh, they would require that the committee review the National Anti-Corruption Commission budget annu annually and require the minister to provide a statement of reasons in the event that they did not act in accordance with the recommendations on the committee of the Committee on the Finance and Resources. Just in terms of the latter part, uh, the Coalition believes budgetary decisions in relation to any government agency uh, should be left to the government of the day. 
Uh, in terms of the other amendments, uh, we believe that the government has got the balance right in relation to the definition of corruption. I would also refer to the comments I made in relation to addressing uh, amendments uh, put forward by the Australian Greens, particularly following the government amendment in the House, following again uh, the consensus recommendation of the Joint Select Committee. And as such, again, the Coalition will not be supporting those amendments. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Th thank you, Senator Cash, and, and thank you, Minister. Minister, if I can just get you to, to clarify and confirm that the NAC will be able to investigate corruption that involves uh, when a public official is involved but is not actually aware that they're involved in corruption. For example, if, if there's collusion to provide a public official with a certain um, uh, to, to, I guess, withhold information that leads to a certain decision. The public official is involved but doesn't necessarily know that they're involved. Can that still be investigated as part of the NAC? Minister. Uh, the short answer is no, Senator Pocock. If a public official is unaware that they have been involved in some corrupt activity, they would not be subject to investigation. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Deputy President, I can indicate the, the Greens will be supporting amendments numbers one to four as moved by Senator Pocock. And I don't think amendments numbers five and six have been moved yet. Um, we'll speak to them. Um, and, and one of the reasons is for the answer just given by the minister. Um, we can think of many instances where there may be an attempt to mislead um, or provide false information to a public official. Um, which may have a deeply corrupting impact, and where, in the opinion of the NAC, it may be appropriate to undertake an investigation to determine whether or not substantial amounts of public finances or some public policy has been corrupted by that reason and mis, um, misapplied for that reason, and that the NAC can investigate it, expose it, and then come up with some corruption fighting mechanisms and recommendations to prevent it happening again. Uh, the, the, we, we have faith in the common sense of the commissioner, whoever will be chosen, to exercise this jurisdiction wisely. And if it may be more appropriate in some instances for the Australian Federal Police or some external agency to undertake the investigation, well then we have faith that the NAC would allow that to happen. But we see the opposition to this amendment coming from the government as, as troubling because we know it happens and we know that we need systemic fixes and the best way of exposing it and fixing it is through an empowered NAC. Are there any more contributions? Senator Pocock, I have the option, but you don't need to take it up, to ask you to move five and six on 1769 or we can leave that till later. So that matter is entirely in your hands. This is the um, your I'm, I'm, in relation I'm, to budget. I do know. That I'm happy to do that, Chair. If you, if you, it's up to you. Guide me on the process. So I just, I would just uh, you seek can leave again. Seek leave. That okay. five, you I move five and six together on sheet one seven. Thank you, Chair. Nine. I seek leave to move amendments five and six on sheet one seven six nine circulated in my name. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. And I'll ask you just to move it. And if you wish to speak to it, you can. I notice the, the issue has been articulated. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Yeah. One of the, the common issues that emerged during the committee inquiry uh, into this bill was that integrity bodies in other Australian jurisdictions are often not provided the resources that they need. And I commend the government for allocating 260 odd million to the NAC in the most recent budget. But once the NAC is up and running and will be potentially uh, politically inconvenient to people in this place, there is always the risk that the government of the day will seek to reduce funding and to reduce the effectiveness of the NAC. Transparency is, is key here. This amendment will require the minister to table a statement of reasons if they deviate from the recommendations of the, of the NAC um, Joint Select Oversight Committee in relation to the budget. This does not bind the government to giving them that money, it simply provides an extra 
piece of transparency so that Australians know uh, if we are shortchanging the body that is going to be tasked with holding people in these, in these places, public servants and others, who are using uh, valuable Australian resources that should be spent uh, in the best interests of Australians. I really believe that for the NAC to be independent and powerful, it has to have the funding it needs, and I would really like more transparency around that process. Senator Shoebridge, you have a few seconds remaining before we hit the hard marker. Yeah. In fact, we've actually hit the hard marker. So I'm going to have to report progress. My apologies. We'll, we'll, we'll wait in anticipation for your contribution. Uh, can I just, um, for the benefit of Hansard and members, when we resume in committee, we will be putting the question after uh, further debate all the amendments on sheet 1769. As it is 1.30 p.m., the committee will report to the Senate. The committee reports progress. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the routine of business. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move the motion as circulated. Yes, yes, and that people have agreed with. Yes. I thank the Senate for their cooperation. Does anyone wish to speak to the, to the, to the motion? Senator Hanson Young. <coughs> thank you, um, Mr. Deputy President. Greens will be supporting this. Uh, we want to facilitate the NAC at the IR and the Territory Rights Bills to be passed this week. That is our preference. We know we're still negotiating over some amendments, but we want these pieces of legislation passed this year. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed with two-minute statements. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. West Australians are wondering why is it that this new Labor government has deserted them? Why is it that this new Labor government has deserted them? During the course of this week, we will be debating a number of bills. One critical bill will be reforms to workplace relations, which will cost jobs which will undermine West Australian businesses, make it harder for the West Australian resources sector, and people in Western Australia are wondering what have they done to deserve this from the new Labor government. As we've heard from coalition senators over the last few weeks, this is legislation that is radical, this is legislation that is rushed, this is legislation that will cost jobs, undermine business confidence in my home state of Western Australia. And you don't have to believe me or my warnings or the warnings of coalition senators about this rushed and radical industrial relations bill. You only need to think about the comments that the Reserve Bank governor himself has made just last week, drawing a very, very important contrast between the need for flexibility in our workplace relations as opposed to rigid rigidity. The rigidity that this industrial relations reforms being prosecuted by Labor will bring to the workplace relations system in my home state of Western Australia. The Governor of the Reserve Bank said we will be better off if there is flexibility in our labour and product markets so that we can respond quickly and effectively. Not my words, but the Reserve Bank Governor saying that Australia's prosperity is built on the back of flexible workplace relations systems and not a rigid system that this radical and rushed legislation will do. And don't just believe me, here we are, the Financial Order. Review your says time has Albanese— expired. Senator Smith, resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson, you have the call. Resorting to props now, <clears throat> Acting Deputy President. Exactly three years ago to this week, I stood in this Senate and gave an emotional and angry speech about the sad and devastating decline of the Great Barrier Reef. And senators laughed at me when I reflected my concerns 
about the grave danger facing the future of the world's greatest natural wonder. Well, three years later, we get another report from the UNESCO Scientific Committee recommending that the World Heritage Committee, the UNESCO Committee, list the Great Barrier Reef as in danger because its outstanding universal values are threatened by climate change, warming oceans caused by the burning of fossil fuels. This morning, the Environment Minister gave a press conference and said we need to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. Mr Bowen at COP two weeks ago said, what are we doing here if it's not to keep global warming at 1.5 degrees? Yet this government has legislated a two-degree global warming emissions reduction target. Two degrees. The science tells us that is the death of the Great Barrier Reef as we have known it. So what is it going to be, Mr Anthony Albanese? On one hand, you can have 1.5 degrees, do everything you can to keep warming at that level and give the reef a fighting chance. On the other hand, we have the death of the Great Barrier Reef as we have known it. I think Australians can see the duplicity. They can see the cognitive dissonance coming from the Labor Party and they expect more. So this is an opportunity for the Labor government to now explain what they're going to do to act on climate change, to act on the UNESCO recommendations and well, save uh, the your barrier time has expired, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to congratulate the Chidlow Progress Association on their 125th anniversary. Chidlow is a small, beautiful Perth Hills community with a population of less than 2,000 in the federal electorate of Hasluck, which is about 45 kilometres east of Perth. The Chidlow Hall was opened on Australia Day in 1905, and I commend the, uh, all of the locals who banded together to save this historic hall from demolition. And for any local community, particularly in Western Australia, to reach such a milestone is impressive. But the voluntary nature of the Chidlow Progress Association makes their 125th anniversary even more noteworthy. The Chidlow Hall has a really important local history. It was used for elections, for church services, for choir practice, and was also where their young men took their medicals before departing for World War II. Now restored, the community is once again running community events such as the Chidlow Hall Market Day and their local film club. One of the association's latest projects is the Chidlow Community Garden, which builds on the vision for a shared community open space. Without the Chidlow Progress Association, the community would not be what it is today. Congratulations to everyone involved in your 125th anniversary. And can I say I'm also proud to be part of a government that committed $11,000 to fund the maintenance and the upgrades of the hall. So, as I said, congratulations to all involved. Together, you have ensured that Chidlow remains a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Congratulations, Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Well. What a day for historic wins it was on Saturday. Not only did the Andrews Labor government uh, secure a third term in Victoria, but of course our Socceroos made World Cup history. For the first time in 12 years, the Socceroos won a game at the FIFA World Cup. And 12 years, uh, it's been 12 long years between victories, and it was incredible to watch. It was our first clean sheet in, at a World Cup since 1974. It was an exciting game, attested to the scenes that we saw in Fed Square as supporters looked on, putting on amazing display of joy and national pride. It was a game that allowed some of our very best talent to shine from all across the country. But I want to make special mention to Maddie Ryan, our captain, Milo Jen Denijic, Danny Vukovic and Aaron Moy, fellow Westfield Sports High alumni. Um, I ended up in the Senate. They ended up at the World Cup, so I think <laughs> they got the better deal. But I also want to acknowledge Big Harry's 86th minute save against Tunisia, which cements his place as a legend in our game with that split-second decision. All of this was on his only, only his third senior match since he ruptured his ACL late last year. It was good to see him back on the field. And congratulations, of course, to Mitchell 
Daniel Duke for scoring the winning goal that put Australia in the box seat for our game against Denmark this week. Uh, to the Socceroos, you united a nation from across the other side of the world. As for what is next, well, I know that I will be up at 2 a.m. this Thursday to watch our Socceroos play Denmark. If my colleagues could take that into account um, while we are sitting, I would appreciate it greatly. Thank you so much to the Football Australia, to the PFA and to the Socceroos, can I say, for inspiring us not only with what you did on the pitch the other night, but for everything that you do off the pitch as well. We are 100 per cent with you. Go get them. Senator Terrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You tip up the container and there's nothing there. Your medication is empty. You urgently need more. The local medical clinic has been closed for months and the closest ones are too full to take you. Your only option is an hour's drive away. You'll wait ages just for a two-minute conversation for your script, then pay through the nose for your appointment. That's the reality for people in parts of Tassie right now. But you don't need me to tell you that. You're living it. We know that we don't have enough GPs. Small towns like Ooz and Campbelltown are losing their clinics. People need to access medication and they're struggling to get it. That's why I was pleased to hear that the Tasmanian State Government is looking at whether we should expand the powers of pharmacists. If allowing pharmacists to do scripts for things like asthma, migraines, oral contraceptives and chronic illnesses means people get the medicine that they need when they need it, then this is a step in the right direction. I don't think pharmacists should be able to prescribe everything. It should only be lower level stuff. Maybe it could only be something a doctor had initially prescribed, and you could only get so many repeats before you need to go back to the doctor. Pharmacists will also need extra training to do this. I think there should be clear boundaries and a line in the sand between pharmacists and doctors. It's not a substitute for seeing a GP, and I'm not saying it should be one. But it's pretty clear that we need to look at outside-the-box solutions when it comes to health in Tasmania. People are dying because they can't get the care they need. Look, I, love, I look forward to seeing the outcome of the state government's review. Thank you. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I would like to thank everyone in this chamber for the enormous support and colleagues in the other place for the, across the political divide for acknowledging the devastating floods across all the eastern states, but more so in my home state of New South Wales. To the people that live on the catchments of the Namoi, Macquarie, Bogan, Lachlan, Murrumbidgee, Tumut, Murray, Edward, Kalgoa, Birri, Narran, Warrigo, Peru, Barwon, Darling, Snowy Rivers and Maroole Creek. I know nothing said here can replace the lost family photos and heirlooms, the lost crops and stock, the lost homes and businesses and the mental anguish many people are going through. I want to pay tribute to the community effort those who got out to help their neighbours and their friends, all those that travelled to assist, and the many, many volunteers from the SES, police, fire and rescue, and also defence, who rolled up their sleeves and did everything to help flood rescue, to filling sandbags, talking, lo <coughs> talking local residents. I've heard of the mental and emotional strain at the vast amount of damage to homes, businesses and farms. Our regional communities have been through hell, and as the floodwaters subside, we are just starting to see the true state of all the clean-up that is required. People have built tough in the regions, Mr Acting Deputy President, but this flood has really tested many and has even pushed some right to the very edge. They appreciate knowing that all in this place are here for them when they need them, and together, with that support, that will help them get through this disaster together. Senator White. Today I want to amplify the words and hopes of one young Victorian who I represent. The Raise Our Voice campaign helps turn up the volume of the voices of our young people and put on the record what matters to them. It's a wonderful initiative that brings the passionate views of young Australians straight to this parliament. I reckon that Sarah, a 19-year-old university student from the electorate of Goldstein, has a pretty good take on what she wants to see change in Australia. Society. Sarah says, Australia has continued to grapple with growing inequality in recent years to the extent that 10 per cent 
uh, of the nation's people now possess 46 per cent of its wealth. Furthermore, the cost of living crisis persists in, dis in disproportionately impacting lower-income households. Coming from the electorate of Goldstein, my life has been characterised by privilege. In particular, like the other 64 per cent of Goldstein kids who went to an independent school, my education has provided me with skills and experiences that have equipped me to have the fair go that embodies the Australian experience. As inequality worsens, I'm horrified to witness the cycle of privilege be cemented through our education system, where, where in a compounding of disadvantaged uh, families privileged enough to fork out tens of thousands of dollars on their children's education are awarded the school better supported by the government than those who cannot. I hope this parliament sees equality as an objective worth pursuing and prioritises education at a primary, secondary and tertiary level and use it as a tool to uh, empower all of Australia in getting a fair go. Sarah, I urge you to continue speaking up and raising your voice into the future. We could well or I'll listen to you further. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, Australians are living through a rental crisis. And today, yet again, we have confirmation that Hobart, in my home, home state of Tasmania, is the most unaffordable city in the country for renters. But this is not just a policy failure. This is actually a policy design, and it's a policy design endorsed by both of the major parties in this place, the political duopoly. And both of the major parties in this place regard landlords as a protected species, and the political duopoly in this place will stop at nothing to make sure that landlords are, are able to make as much money from rents as possible, because they, the Coles and Woolworths, of politics have decided that the only constituency they want to win are the people that own homes, especially those who own multiple homes. The Liberals don't care about tenants, and the Labor Party arrogantly assumes that tenants will just vote for them anyway. So together they hand over billions of dollars a year in subsidies to landlords in the form of negative gearing and the capital gains tax discount, and they refuse to build the public housing necessary to address the crisis. It is absolutely perverse. Tenants get bled dry with unaffordable rents, and then when they pay tax, the major parties get together to hand that tax over to the landlords. Then the RBA jacks up interest rates, and any increase in the cost of borrowing is passed on by the landlords to the tenants in the form of even higher rents. It's a rigged system. We're on our way to neo-feudalism in Australia. The tenants always lose. That's why we need a national freeze on rents in this country, and we need it now. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, today I want to again highlight housing affordability across Australia. Today, National Shelter and SGS Economics released uh, what is the 11th uh, National Rental Affordability Index, and as we all know, uh, it, it would be—it's ve very sobering reading. We are in a housing crisis across the country, and it's very easy to talk about it in terms of statistics, but we need to remember that these are people in our communities who, due to the cost of housing, are struggling to put food on the table. Uh, Canberra is at the forefront of this housing crisis. We currently have a shortfall of over 3,100 social houses under the, the very welcome um, housing um, half. We stand to get 540 or so houses. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done on this. I would really like to thank the work that National Shelter, ACT Shelter and others are doing on continuing to highlight the depth and breadth of this issue. And I would implore uh, senators to work together to ensure that we um, can have a conversation in Australia about what housing is for. My sense, talking to people 
across the ACT is that, that people want housing to be more viewed as a human right, as something that people in our communities can afford, uh, rather than as uh, an investment vehicle that seems to forever just be, put, be putting it more and more out of reach for younger generations and those in our most, the most vulnerable in our communities. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Australian cities are becoming digital surveillance precincts, with so-called smart city programs being rolled out across the country. Invasive technology such as facial recognition cameras, licence plate readers, smart lights, smart poles, smart cars, smart neighbourhoods, smart homes and smart appliances all connected to wireless networks and communicating with each other. So what's wrong with that? Technology is good, isn't it? All this is for your safety, security and convenience, isn't it? Well, let me tell you, your streets are spying on you, your mobile phone is spying on you, your cities are spying on you, and the infrastructure for future lockdowns is being put into place right now. Don't be fooled. You're being set up to be tracked through your movements and through the future of your digital wallets. By handing over your data, you're handing over the ability to monitor your behaviour, which will soon be turned into a social credit score. And once the central bank digital currencies are in place, you won't get to spend your money without approval. Digital ID will soon become a reality in Australia. Many other countries are already rolling these systems out, countries like Canada, Scotland and many others. Eventually, you won't be able to access any government or public services and you won't be able to travel across borders or access health care or the internet without a digital ID. Think you won't comply? I think you will. The last two years were the dress rehearsal and we fell for it hook, line and sinker. Australians are sleepwalking into this technocratic future. And while we're sitting around, scratching our chins, trying to work out whether this is really happening, Australia is drifting towards a dystopian digital future. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Unreliable, weather-dependent solar and wind power has put a price tag on our oceans. The phrase, blue economy, is used to soften the ugly truth that to achieve Australia's transition to net zero, the world's oceans must be strip-mined for bare, rare earths. Batteries, solar panels and wind turbines are produced in China, in part using materials companies, mostly Chinese, mined from the sea floor. Polymetallic nodules needed for solar panels, wind turbines and batteries lay along active volcanic rifts, mostly found along the seabed, on the seabed. Giant vacuums suck up the seabed ecosystem to bury and choke the surrounding area in a thick layer of silt. Animals, eggs, sediment, plants, everything is taken off the seabed. A Greenpeace research fellow, distressed at what was being done, said, quote, in all cases, seabed mining will, by its very nature, destroy species and habitats within the mining zones. There is no justification for a gold rush to mine the seabed, end of quote. International waters, particularly in the Pacific, contain more value than the combined mineral wealth of Earth's continents. The Pacific is ground zero for this green rush, with China holding the majority of licenses that the United Nations International Seabed Authority handed out. The UN International Seabed Authority supports undersea mining because it aligns with the UN's 2030 so-called and bogus sustainable development goals. Former head of the Office of Environmental Management and Mineral Resources at the UN's International Seabed Authority are on record saying that the UN's International Seabed Authority is not, quote, fit to regulate any activity in international waters, in part due to a perceived conflict of interest with mining giants. Corporations in control, and on behalf of those corporations, climate warriors are destroying everything they touch. Explain that to our children. We are one community, we are one nation, and we want our oceans protected from crazy climate warriors. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I couldn't have segued into this conversation and thank Senator Roberts for doing that so eloquently for me. Today I want to talk about the importance of science, most more notably the importance of ensuring that parliamentarians have access to scientific advice that they can use to inform their speeches, their policies and our bills. The Greens played a pivotal and, um, role in advocating for the Parliamentary Budget Office, which offers independent advice to parliamentarians about their budget implications of their policies. A Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, commonly nicknamed POST, would work in a similar way but would provide impartial scientific advice. The UK Parliament has a post that provides impartial, non-partisan and peer-reviewed briefings designed to make science research accessible to the UK Parliament. Areas such as biology and health, energy and environment, physical sciences, computing and social sciences are all covered. 
Beyond this, the UK Post offers a range of services to select committees. It trains the next generations of policy shapers through the Post Fellowships and other schemes. It holds seminars and events for the UK Parliament and also for the public. It develops pre best practice with its legislators across the globe and provides foreign, policy, uh, foreign research uh, advisory bodies. It facilitates knowledge exchange between the UK Parliament and research communities. The establishment of a post in the Australian Parliament is supported by our stakeholders, including Science and Technology Australia and the Australian Academy of Science. Facts actually matter, and ensuring our parliamentarians are making statements that are actually factually correct also matters. Facts should be at the centre of the debates in this place, a place where these laws are made and are the impact of our, uh, to the future of our country. But unfortunately, in some cases, as we've seen today, shockingly, this is often not the case. It is a clear example that this is why we need a post. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the, important, the importance of an independent reserve bank. Speaking at the annual CEDA dinner just last Tuesday night, Dr Lowe argued that lifting wages to match inflation would risk a painful 1970s or 80s-like recession. This is an uncontroversial statement. With inflation currently sitting somewhere between 7.5 and 8.5 per cent, wage rises around that level would risk a cost price spiral and would risk a significant recession. Yet, what is the response we get from a senior government minister, in fact, the former leader of the Labor Party? He attacks Dr Lowe's comments, calling them rubbish arguing it depended on how significant the wage increase was. But that's the whole point. The wage increase Dr Lowe was talking about was a wage in increase in line with inflation. And I find it very odd that while Minister Shorten is willing to attack Dr Lowe, he didn't attack the finance minister who said exactly the same thing in this place just a few days ago, that of course a wage rise at the level of inflation would be damaging and is not something the government is seeking. The importance of an independent reserve bank cannot be understated. The role of the reserve bank in keeping inflation under control is a key role in our economic settings. If you politicise the board, then you risk the extraordinary history of consistent economic growth and the ability of Australia to weather the storm better than most comparable economies over the last 30 years. An independent reserve bank Order. is central. Time has expired. Senator Billick. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Acting Deputy President, recently I was approached by a constituent who had had to change flights for a family overseas holiday. He made the changes through Flight Centre, the same travel agency through which he'd booked the tickets. In addition to the fare difference, he was charged $1,350 administration fee for the two flights for his family of three—that's $225 per flight per passenger. My, const my constituent had no objection to paying the fare difference, but an additional fee of over $1,000 for changing flights seems excessive to me. When my constituent contacted Flight Centre and the airline, Emirates, to complain about the excessive fee, both claimed that the, the other was responsible for levying it. My office tried to query the fee on his behalf with both companies. Flight Centre told my office, with my constituent's permission, that they passed on the fare and tax difference calculated by Emirates, but did not impose any fees of their own to make changes to the tickets. Emirates claim that they do not make changes to travel agency issued tickets and recommend taking the matter up with, guess who, Flight Centre. I made further inquiries to Emirates to clarify their answer, but then they said they were restricted from discussing the matter with anyone other than the passenger whom they had actually dismissed previously. This was despite my office having already checked their requirements for being given the authority to make inquiries on my constituents' behalf. Now, I'm sure you've heard the quote, success have many fathers, but failure is an orphan. And that certainly seems to be the case when it comes to charging excessive fees for flight changes. Whether it's Emirates or flight centres, 
One of these companies lacks the competence to honestly and openly reveal to my constituent and my office that they were responsible for charging this exorbitant fee. Not good enough. Thank you, Senator Abilic. Senator Pratt. Thank you, President. This Thursday is World AIDS Day, a time to reflect on the devastating loss of over 40 million lives over the course of this 40-year epidemic. A time to review our progress and renew our bipartisan commitment to end HIV in Australia. The title of the UN AIDS 2022 report is In Danger. In Australia, we've seen a steady decline in new affections over the past decade, but UN AIDS data shows new infections are rising now where they had been falling. We've seen such crises as COVID, monkeypox, climate change, having stretched resources, access to treatment, as well as to testing and prevention. Thank you, Senator uh, Pratt. The time for this debate has now expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday in this chamber, the Minister said, and I quote, we are a government that delivers on our commitments. <coughs> Every single one of them. End quote. Minister, if your government is one that delivers on its commitments, why have you scrapped your promise to reduce electricity prices for Australian families by $275? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister. Uh, thank you, and thank you to Senator Scar for giving me the opportunity to talk about how we're delivering on our commitments to the Australian people. Uh, this is a government that, over the last six months, over the last six months has got to work day one delivering on all our commitments, including in relation to our Renew uh, Powering Australia plan, which has significant, which has significant investments to fix the energy mess that we inherited after 10 years of denial, delay and dysfunction. And I'm not going to stop explaining to the people of Australia the situation that we inherited. Rising inflation, rising interest rates, a budget riddled with debt and deficit and pork barrelling and, and um, all the dodgy deals that have gone on and we have started unwinding all of that and responding to that. And in the budget we had significant commitments into getting uh, our Powering Australia plan on the ground. Because let's not forget, nine years, 22 failed energy policies, none of them worked. We saw a three gigawatt decline in dispatchable power. That is under your record. We've got Snowy 2.0 running late. Uh, we had no, not one energy policy landed. And in the six months that we've been in charge, we have been investing in our Powering Australia plan. We've had um, Minister King deliver the supply that we need. We've had Ministers Bowen, the Treasurer, and others to uh, deal with the, the gas crisis or the energy increases we've got. And we stand by the fact that renewables are the cheapest form of energy, they are the cheapest form of power, and that increasing our investment in renewables will decrease energy prices. Uh, Senator, <coughs> Senator Scar, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, yesterday you also said we are not a government that breaks promises. End quote. If that's the case, will electricity prices be $275 lower for Australian house households by the time of the next election? Thank you, Senator Scar, Minister. Thank you. Well, we will deliver our Powering Australia plan, which is the promise we took to the Australian people. It was supported by modelling done in 2020 about energy prices in 2025. Our commitment is to deliver the plan we took to the election. That is exactly what we are doing with our investments that we've made in the budget, in Marinus Link, in renewable energy zones, in offshore wind, in pumped hydro, in community batteries, in solar banks. All of that progressed in our first opportunity through our first budget. That is what a responsible, mature government does, delivering on our promises, responding to the economic circumstances of the time, delivering a sustainable and responsible budget and delivering on those election uh, commitments. Uh, <coughs> Minister, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, on the matter of direct relevance, 
Uh, Senator Scar has asked directly about an element of the Powering Australia plan being the government's commitment to reduce power prices by $275. The minister may be being broadly relevant talking about the plan, but he was asking about a specific element of it, and I ask you to draw the uh, minister to you. be directly relevant. <laughs> thank to you, the Senator Birmingham. Um, I do uh, advise the Senate that uh, at the start of this question there was a, a broader statement about promises generally, and I do believe that the minister is being relevant. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. <coughs> minister. Uh, thank you. We will deliver on our Powering Australia plan, which uh, sets out all of our commitments as an overarching document, and we've made a cracking start of that in the first budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. I note the Minister has not referred to the magic $275 number. Why won't you just admit that your government does break its promises and within just a few months has abandoned, has abandoned its election promise? to deliver a $275 electricity price reduction for Australian households? Minister. Well, the question and the proposition outlined in the question is simply wrong. We are delivering on our Powering Australia plan and, and the uncomfortable Order. truth, Order. The uncomfortable truth Ma President, Order. that Senator Scar is refusing to acknowledge is the chaos, dysfunction that we inherited from you. So we are not only delivering on our Powering Australia plan, we are also fixing the mess that they left, fixing the mess in the energy markets that you left, where the lights were going to go out, where there wasn't enough supply, and the, and the energy increases that you hid before the election—20 per cent increases. So we are fixing supply. We are working on how we can manage downward pressure on energy prices. Order. And we've been up front with the community about the situation we are facing, and at the same time, whilst fixing up all your mess, we're delivering on our commitments. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, uh, Senator Watt. The Liberals and Nationals said that low wages were a deliberate design feature of their economic strategy, and sadly it was the only strategy that they delivered. Um, now that Australians are feeling the crunch of cost of living um, rises and stagnant wages, can you outline the government's workplace relations policies, how they will actually help Australians deal with the cost of living and why this is actually important? Minister. Uh President, and thank you, Senator Bro Grogan. I would love nothing more than to explain how the government's workplace relations policies will help working people get ahead in life. Because I think one thing most Australians can agree on is that the workplace relations system in our country is not working for workers or for employers. It's not delivering the fairness, the gender equality, the productivity gains, or the economic growth that Australia needs. But the Albanese government's workplace bargaining policies will get wages moving again. That's something Australian workers desperately need after nearly 10 years of low wages under those who sit opposite and still haven't changed their ways. The fact that this was, in their own words, a deliberate design feature of the previous government's management of the economy will uh, be reminded of for many years to come. This shows how little those opposite think of workers in this country, and their contributions to the public debate on our policies have shown that nothing has changed. It's the same old, same old from the Liberal and National parties in this country. The Albanese government's package has been designed to lift the wages of Australian workers by putting job security and gender equality as objects of the Fair Work Act, by creating a pay equity expert panel and a care and community sector expert panel to particularly assist women uh, and those working in the care economy. Uh, we'll also make flexible work arrangements much more accessible and prohibit pay secrecy clauses so people, in particular women, are free to talk about their pay at work. We'll place limits on the use of fixed-term employment contracts so people don't get stuck on endless probation. 
will sunset substandard work choices era zombie agreements, will ensure the agreement termination process is fit for purpose and fair, will ban job ads that pay less than the minimum wage, will make the better off overall test simple, flexible and fair, and will improve access to single and multi-employer agreements because bargaining delivers for workers and businesses. If you're serious about fixing the cost of living, you need to get wages moving Thank for all you, Australians, Minister, and that's exactly what we'll do. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline how the government workplace relations policies will support businesses to avoid a race to the bottom on wages? Minister. I can, Senator Grogan, because we want to make more agreements that benefit both employers and workers. I understand that the concept of workers and, and businesses coming to agreements is something that the opposition just cannot get its head across, but actually it can be done. And importantly, we want to stop the race to the bottom by those who undercut businesses who are genuinely trying to do the right thing by their workers. Let me give you one great example of businesses who are embracing this new era of workplace relations that will benefit workers and employers. As, as reported this morning in the Financial Review, the Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Manufacturing and Installation Association has wasted no time starting their multi-employer bargaining. And we hear the laughter and the scoffs from those on the other side that there might be employers who actually want to come to agreements. Well, this, this, this group met the AMWU on Monday to discuss ways to use the new laws to deliver higher pay and standards for staff. This is what the Albanese Labor government wants to see more of, employers, unions and workers coming together to deliver a win-win. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline why it is urgent that the government acts on this workplace relations policies as a priority? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister. I can, Senator Grogan, because it is urgent that we get wages moving again. And we understand from all the public debate we've seen over the last few months, backing in the last 10 years of inaction and deliberate design features of economy being low wages, uh, that for the opposition it's never the right time for workers to get a pay rise. It was never the right time during the 10 years they were in office. It's not been the right time now that they're in opposition. Well, we've had enough. Workers have had enough. It's time to get wages moving again. The best way to do this is by encouraging more agreements to be made and stop a race to the bottom on wages. It's good to see that Senator Colbeck has got a little bit of fight left in him because no one else on the other side does. <laughs> Australian workers have waited long enough, and while waiting they have turned up every day and done their job. Order. See, Richard, I knew, Senator Colbeck, Order. I knew you could be an example for your colleagues. It's now, workers have been waiting. They've been turning up every day and done their job. It's now time we did ours and legislated for secure jobs and better pay. Labor cares about working people. We care about giving them Thank a pay you, rise Minister, so they can keep up with the rising. Uh, Senator Dean Smith. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer to comments by the Assistant Treasurer reported in the Sydney Morning Herald on negotiations between the government and the Greens on the Financial Accountability Regime Bill. Mr Jones, the Assistant Treasurer, said there had been no sign-off on anything. Yet last week in the chamber, Senator McKim stated, there is absolutely no doubt that Minister Jones and I had an agreement and any, and, and any claim that there was no agreement is false. Minister, can you clarify for the Senate, was there an agreement between Mr Jones and Senator McKim? And if so, why did the Assistant Treasurer renege on this deal? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator S Smith uh, for the question. Uh, and I don't think it's any secret in this place that we work um, across the chamber negotiating uh, legislation, possible amendments. Uh, we work collegiately where we can. Uh, that is our preference. We want, we want to Order. get legislation through. We've got a government um, for the first time in— um, Minister, oh. please resume your seat. Senator Smith. In of order, President, the question was very specific. Was there an agreement? Uh, and there was also a preamble <coughs> at Senator Smith, so I will listen carefully to the minister, and if she's uh, not getting to the point of the question, I will draw her to it. But at the moment, uh, she is being relevant, Minister. Thank you. There were discussions, um, as you know, during through the week around a whole range of uh, pieces of legislation, including with the Greens, on a number of pieces of legislation. 
on a number of pieces of legislation. In respect to one element of those, there is more work. There is more work uh, to be done before we could finalise a position. We have explained that to the Greens. Order. We have explained that to the Greens about the work that needs to be done from from the government's point of view before we can reach agreement on one of those bills, uh, and we appreciate the engagement uh, of the Greens in assisting us with our legislation this week and with all colleagues in the chamber. Oh, sorry. Minister Gallagher. Senator Smith. President, with 45 seconds to go, I remind Senator Gallagher hmm? that the question was specific. Yeah, what's was your point of order? Was there an agreement? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. The minister is, has gone to the question of an agreement, Minister. Thank you. We weren't able to reach a final agreement on that bill, and there have been discussions amongst the parties about how best to proceed uh, where there isn't agreement um, that could be finally reached to progress the bill in this chamber. There had been discussions, and I accept that there is more work to be done. And I, I um, thank Senator McKim for his. I thank Senator McKim for his engagement. I would also point out. Order. I would Order. also point out. This is cleaning up again Order. the legislation we are working on. Remember when you voted how many? 26 times against a royal commission into the banking and financial sector. Uh, this is actually progressing the outcomes Thank of you, that. Thank you, Minister. Your work. time has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, President. The Assistant Treasurer had a subsequent blunder yesterday when the government moved an amendment to a government bill being managed by the Assistant Treasurer that was identical to an opposition amendment the government had opposed in the House of Representatives. Has the Treasurer or his office met? with the assistant treasurer to counsel him on parliamentary process, uh, legislative uh, management. Smith, please resume your seat. Um, Minister Wong. Uh, I submit that that question <laughs> is not a supplementary question. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 I'm waiting. Uh, really Senator Wong, I've called. Senator, Senator Wong, I've called. Senator Wong, I've called. Senator Birmingham. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President. Uh, on the point of order, uh, wide latitude was granted to the minister in answering the primary question. Correct. Wide latitude to talk generally about yes. deals and about conduct. Uh, this goes very clearly to the conduct and capability of the assistant treasurer, who seems to be an ongoing embarrassment for the government. Uh, Senator Birmingham, I. Um listened carefully to the points that were made, and uh, I am advised that it is not a supplementary question. Um, so well, uh, Senator Wong, if I, if I can finish, order, order. As Senator Birmingham, I'm going to finish my point of order. Um, as Senator Birmingham said, uh, often latitude is given, and latitude can be given on this occasion, but it is up to the minister whether she answers the question or not. And I'm going to invite uh, Senator Smith to finish asking the question. Shall I start again, President? Uh, order. Minister Wong. I just suggest that we're happy to give leave for him to rephrase the question. In your hands, Senator Smith. Has the Treasurer or his office met with the Assistant Treasurer to counsel him on parliamentary process, legislative management, or how to conduct negotiations with par parliamentary colleagues in good faith? I think that I. In, thank you. I'll give the Minister the opportunity to answer it. Particular piece of legislation. Can I just say that uh, Minister Jones is an absolutely fine minister and an outstanding person and a good friend of mine. And I have known him since I was 25 years old. And Five he, years ago. <laughs> yeah, just just a couple of summers ago, just a couple of turns Order. around the clock. Order. He he has hit the ground running again, cleaning up nine years of waste. 
of wasted Order. time, of work that was left undone, of recommendations that weren't followed through, and he is putting through a legislative agenda that we are working through, including Order, probably Senator each June. sitting week in this place. Um, now, I have no doubt uh, that um, Minister Jones, in his work with stakeholders, in the work that he will do to finalise the position, to consult further, will include consultations with the Greens and with others to look uh, at how we you, can Minister. get Your legislation progressed. Senator Smith, second supplementary. It's hit the ground running and fallen over. Given it is clear. Given it is clear that the Assistant Treasurer is not capable of managing Treasury Order. legislation, conducting negotiations, managing stakeholders or administering his portfolio, does the Treasurer retain confidence in the abilities of his Assistant Treasurer? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith, Minister. It's the first half of that question, but I answered it in the second uh, question, which is Minister Jones is an outstanding minister and a fine colleague who works day and night in his portfolio. There are a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of different views in this sector. I've had the shadow portfolio. It is not an easy portfolio to manage. There are stakeholders. There are different points of view. It's got a heavy legislative focus. It involves lots of engagements um, across the financial services sector, from the big banks to the consumer representatives and everything in between. Um, and he is doing an outstanding job in, deli in delivering on the government's agenda the reforms that we want to see done. And in the case of the legislation that Senator Smith's original question related to before he veered off track, there is more work to be done to reach agreement about how to progress that through the Senate, including talking with stakeholders. And that was the decision uh, that the Thank government you, took this Your week. Your time has expired, Senator Wish Wilson. President, before I start, or before you start the clock ticking over, and I'm sorry if I've missed it, I just wonder if we could acknowledge the visiting New Zealand delegation of parliamentarians in the chamber today. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, and I do acknowledge the our visiting um, delegation from New Zealand and welcome to the Senate. They are missing the Greens, but they're still very welcome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> now, your question, thanks. Now, um, Senator I, my question is to uh, Senator Wong, representing the uh, Climate Minister. Minister, another UNESCO scientific report has recommended that the Great Barrier Reef be put on the World Heritage in Danger list because its outstanding universal values are threatened by climate change. In responding to the report this morning, the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, publicly acknowledged we need to keep warming below 1.5 degrees to save the Great Barrier Reef. Minister, your government's legislated 43 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030 is consistent with two degrees of global warming, and the science tells us this is a death sentence to the reef as we have known it. Yep. Millions of Australians who love the reef won't be fooled by this apparent cognitive dissonance. Minister, what is it going to be? A climate plan that limits global warming to 1.5 degrees and gives the reef a chance, or two degrees and a death sentence for the reef as we have been lucky enough to have known it? In our lifetimes. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Uh, the, uh, th this government was elected uh, with a plan to take strong action on climate, and that is what we will do. This party, over many decades, uh, many years, over a decade, uh, has had a very clear, ambitious, and strong position on climate. And, and we have not just talked about it. We, we won government, uh, and we delivered. We delivered. Uh, action on climate. Regrettably, we lost government, uh, and we were, we, it, it, it has been a number of years, nearly 10 years, not only of inaction but of denial and delay and dysfunction on that side of the parliament. And Australia is poorer for it. Australia is the poorer for it. Uh, uh, I, I am asked about the 43 per cent target. We were clear with the Australian people before the election. Uh, and I would make the point uh, that that is, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, consistent with a net zero by 2050 position that we also uh, have been committed to. We've been committed to. Now it is the case uh, that this we have. Uh, uh, I'll make two points about the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the first is uh, that 
the first <laughs> Senator Canavan. I, I've been having to present this Canavan to me. I'd make two points about the Great Barrier Reef. Firstly, obviously climate is, is, is a risk to all of our, of, of our natural environment. We know that. Uh, we, we've been told that. That is why we need to take the action we are taking. That is why we need to work as we did at the previous conference of the parties. I know those opposite don't like to hear this, as to Minister Bowen did at the conference of the parties to ensure there is no backsliding on the Glasgow commitments, and we, we maintain the ambitious position uh, and continue to build Senator on Rennie. the position uh, that was agreed in Glasgow. Uh, we also have a lot of work to do in our domestic economy, and the government is committed to doing Thank so. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, first supplementary. There are 114 new fossil fuel projects awaiting approval in Australia. Minister, do you agree that every new fossil fuel project approved is a nail in the coffin of the Great Barrier Reef? How can we save the reef and keep warming to 1.5 degrees if we are actively and deliberately making climate change worse? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. I don't accept the premise at the end of that question, which suggests that a government that is willing to work with the Australian people to, to shift this economy from being one of the most emissions intensive economies in the world to a 43 per cent reduction by 2030 uh, and a 2050 reduction. Uh, a, a, net zero, a net zero by 2050. And it might be. You see, the thing about the Greens is they think you can say a target and will be delivered. Order. You say a target and will be delivered. You see, we actually understand there are workers and industries and communities and people who have to be part of this journey. We all Order. have to change. We all have to change, and I am Order. grateful, as I've said previously, that the, that the Australian people have elected a parliament and a government that is willing to act on climate, and we will, and we will. And no amount of coming in here and, and asking questions like that, which suggests that we also don't care, will, will, derive, will detract from the fact that we are serious Thank about you, Minister, taking your action, time and has we expired. will. Senator Wish Wilson, yes, second supplementary. We will find out how serious you are very soon, Senator Wong. Minister, the previous Morrison government went to extraordinary and shameful lengths to lobby, deny, dodge and deceive the international community and prevent an endangered listing of the Great Barrier Reef by the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. Will your government do the same, or do you now accept the reef's outstanding universal values are in danger in line with this morning's released report? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister Wong. Well, order. Uh, yeah, well, as the Environment Minister made clear Senator today— Canavan. Senator Canavan. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. We'll just... Senator Wish Wilson, you've asked your question to Minister Wong. She was on her feet with an answer, but there was so much interjection across the chamber. She could not... Senator Canavan, you were one of the people I just called. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, well... Mr. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, look, the, we understand uh, the position in relation to the uh, Great Barrier Reef. I'll just make a, the point that I understand the report is not an endangered listing. It's advice to the World Heritage Committee, and obviously the mission report is one source of information that will inform UNESCO's advice to the committee about the state of conservation of the reef. Uh, as you know, uh, Ms. Plibersek said this morning. Uh, you know, we understand, and those opposite might like to deny it. We, wow. Senator, uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. President, I asked whether. Uh, Senator, what is your point, point of relevance? I asked the minister, minister, the senator, whether they were going to back the previous government's stance on denying the uh, UNESCO report and the advice thank you, on Senator the Barrier Reef Wilson. being in danger. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. There was. An enormous preamble also to that question, and, and the minister is being relevant. Minister, I, I was directly responding that the mission report is one source of information that will inform UNESCO's advice to the World Heritage Committee about the state, state of conservation of the reef. Uh, I was also referencing the Environment Minister's statement this morning that, unlike those opposite, we don't deny that climate change has an effect on the reef and on all of our natural Thank environment. Thank you, Minister. And on Your our time has expired. Senator Green. Um, Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. 
Minister, how will an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice help close the gap in life outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians? Minister. Thank you. Uh, uh, and I thank Senator Green for her question. I thank the many senators across this place, uh, on, on this side of the chamber but not only, who have sought to engage with this important reform respectfully uh, and in a non-partisan way. Uh, President, we know that the gap in life expectancy between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians is unacceptably wide—7.8 years for women, 8.6 years for men, and no, no, none of us should accept this. I think all of us should recognise that decades of failed government policies have failed First Nations peoples and failed to close the gap. And this is precisely the point about the proposed voice to the parliament. It came about because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wanted a greater say in the matters that affect them. Matters that affect them. They wanted to be, want to be empowered to take control of their own lives, not have policies and laws dictated to, the, dictated to them by politicians and bureaucrats in Canberra. Uh, the Voice is about enabling a better future that will improve the lives of Indigenous Australians on the ground, in communities, in practical ways better outcomes in health, education, housing. Because we know from experience that you cannot create better policy and close the gap without listening to and hearing the voices of our First Nations people. The solutions to so many challenges are to be found in those communities, not in Canberra. And The Voice will make sure those solutions are heard by policy makers here in the parliament. I note the decision of some opposite to oppose the voice before they have even seen the legislation. And the argument seems to be, we need change, so let's keep doing more of the same. Well, Australians know that does not make sense. And it is ultimately the Australian people, not the politicians, who will decide this referendum. And I believe Australians want to see a better future Thank for you, all Minister, Australians. Your time has expired. Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. How will the voice ensure the views of First Nations peoples in remote and regional Australia are heard? Minister. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Green for her supplementary uh, question. Uh, let's remember this. The Uluru, Uluru Statement from the Heart was the outcome of 12 regional dialogues. 12 regional dialogues in places like Dubbo, Broome, Ross River, Cairns with representatives from right across remote and regional Australia. So the arguments that some make, somewhat mischievously, that this is all about what people in the cities want isn't correct. They aren't correct. The, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was an historic Order. First Nations consensus. Order. Uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was an historic First Nations consensus on the way forward. And as part Order. of that, the voice to the parliament Minister, the voice. please resume your seat. The interjections across the chamber are disorderly. I have the minister on her feet answering her question. Order. Order. Please continue, Minister. Um, oh, you are here. Minister, Senator. Yes, motion to language sure. used by a senator. It's not acceptable to swear across the chamber. Uh, senator, order, order. Thank you. Um, I did not hear that interjection. I am going to ask the senator to withdraw, but I'm also going to ask senators to listen with respect. Senator Chisholm. Withdraw. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. The Uluru Statement from the Heart was an historic First Nations consensus on the way forward, and as part of that, the voice to the parliament will make sure voices in rural and regional communities are heard on policies Thank you, and Your on laws. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, what are the next steps on the road to a referendum on an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? Minister. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Green. A, a bill to update the Referendum Machinery Act will shortly be introduced to the Parliament. This will take into account advice from the Referendum Working Group, which has set out key principles for the voice 
voice which Senator Dodson has spoken about in this place, including that it provides independent advice to the parliament and the government, it is chosen by and representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, it is, it is empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful, culturally informed and gender balanced and includes youth, is accountable and transparent and works alongside existing structures. Let us remember what was said in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This is what was said to the nation. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and to take a rightful place in our country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister of Immigration, Minister Watt. Many would have seen the hundreds of people uh, gathered out the front of Parliament House rallying against the government's failure to take action so far to address the truly heartbreaking plight of people languishing on bridging visas. In the gallery is Zahara, who I sat down with this morning to hear her story. Zahara is a refugee from Iran who was part of the first family sent to Nauru last time Labor was in government. Last year, Zahara's eldest daughter, Saha, finished school and won a scholarship to study at the Newcastle University. She started studying this year, but after seven weeks, <coughs> the government took her study rights away and she had to leave because she turned 18 and was on a bridging visa. Minister, why won't the government let Saha follow her dream to become a human rights lawyer and complete her studies? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Um, thank you. Senator Pocock for your question. And, uh, Zahara and Saha, welcome to uh, the Senate. Um, it's terrific that you've been able to join uh, everyone here today. Um, the, the, our government has obviously put forward a range of policies uh, for how we intend uh, to deal with people who are on bridging visas, in addition to people who continue to be in offshore processing, uh, particularly in Nauru. Um, these are very difficult issues, and I understand the difficulties that it causes, no doubt, to Zahara and to Saha and the rest of their family. Um, but these are issues that we are trying to balance uh, with a range of other factors um, to make sure that the policies that we do ultimately bring in uh, are, are enduring uh, and can remain in place into the longer term. So this does take some time. Uh, and I understand that that does leave some individuals in difficult circumstances. And again, uh, I, I understand uh, that that is not an easy situation. Uh, Senator Pocock, as you may know, um, in my work career before I came here, I did quite a lot of legal work with refugees. And I know, I know there are other members in this chamber who have done the same thing. So um, we do, I can assure you, understand the personal difficulties that these situations cause. Uh, but we are weighing up a range of factors, uh, and I do hope that we can come to a resolution of these issues as quickly as possible um, so that people like Zahara and Saha uh, are relieved of the burden that they're currently under. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Minister. Given these families have been living with so much uncertainty for so long, uh, are you able to inform uh, the Senate and, and Zahara when people like her who have been living in our community, working and paying taxes, will have their migration status finally resolved. What, what is the timeline? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Again, I obviously can't give a particular time frame for particular individuals, but one of the issues that we have had to deal with since taking office is the outrageous backlog in visa applications that existed under the former government. Uh, I, was, I, was shocked. I was shocked when we came to office uh, that the backlog in visa applications had blown out to nearly a million in this country. And that compares when we lost office in 2013, there was a backlog of about 200 odd thousand. It had blown out under the former government to nearly a million. Uh, and this is, affecting, this is affecting a range of people in our community. It is no Order. doubt affecting Zahara and Saha and her family. It is affecting a large number of other people on bridging visas. It's also impacting employers, in including in industries like agriculture, in manufacturing, and many other industries who cannot get the workers that they need because the backlog is 
so long. We have applied increased resources to the Immigration Department to clear that backlog, and it's now down be well below 900,000. It's something thank we you, intend Minister to pursue. Minister your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President, and, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, apart from pointing to the backlog, what is the reason that the government has taken six months to put forward some clarity on an election commitment? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Um, again, Senator Pocock, I do understand that people who are waiting for visa applications uh, to be processed, um, that is a really difficult situation for people to be in. Uh, and, and as I say, uh, as well as impacting on those people who are waiting for those applications to be uh, processed, it's, it's impacting on employers all around the country who are desperate to get workers who have been waiting for their visas to be processed for a very long time. Uh, and for all the complaints we hear from people on the other side about what needs to be done to assist regional employers get the workers they need, they did nothing about the visa backlog. And it's also, of course, impacting on the very people that you're asking about. Uh, we, at the Jobs and Skills Summit, we committed to uh, put on about, I think it was 500 extra immigration staff to help clear that backlog, in addition to the work that had already, already been done. And it's because of that we've now been able to bring that backlog down to 800 odd thousand from the nearly 1 million we inherited. It's still too long. We're still putting in more resources, and hopefully that will make a difference to the people that you're asking questions about. Thank you, Minister. Senator Davy. Thank you very much, and I'm glad the Minister has been talking about um, workers in the regions because my question is to the same minister but with his emergency management hat on, Senator Watt. Um, minister, in estimates, I asked you whether the regional small business support program was to be continued after the um, end of the current round of funding on December 31st. Your answer at the time was that you were considering your options. Uh, minister, what are those options? Uh, thank you, Senator Davies. Minister Davies, sorry, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Davies. I presume the program you're talking about is the Regional Small Business Support Program pilot, uh, which was a form of uh, financial counselling uh, that was offered. Um, I think originally after the bushfires is when it actually started, but certainly it's been going for a couple of years. Um, as I indicated to you at estimates, that was a matter that we were giving consideration to because the former government. Uh, despite saying that they thought this was a really important program, only decided to put money in the budget through to the 31st of December this year. Um, so I don't quite understand why the former government that you were part of uh, decided to have a funding cliff for this service, given that you thought it was so important. But be that as it may, again, that's something that we've inherited. Uh, and I recently, I recently approved an extension of that service to the 30th of, to the, sorry, to the 31st of March 2023, so that these uh, uh, services had funding certainty to carry them through the high-risk weather season. Uh, now, as I'm not sure, Senator Davey, whether you're aware, but uh, your, your, the former government, of which you were a part, actually commissioned a review of this service which found uh, that rather than the service primarily being used by businesses who were suffering from the impacts of natural disasters, uh, in fact it was mainly being used uh, to deal with issues arising from COVID-19 and the impact on businesses from that and also uh, from uh, other matters as well and certainly not the kind of uh, floods that we're seeing at the moment. But we decided, regardless of the findings of the review, that it was important to give those services certainty. It was important to give their clients certainty, and that's why we extended it until the 31st of March next year to carry them through this disaster season. Uh, those services that have funding remaining at that point in time will be able to continue it beyond the 31st of uh, March till the 30th of June next year. And in the meantime, we are giving thought uh, to what other services and funding could be provided to provide the kind of financial counselling that you're talking about. But it would have really helped if the funding didn't come Thank out you, up the 31st of December Senator in the first place. Senator Davey, first up. Uh, thank you very much, and, and I would say, you know, we were expecting to be able to do a MyEFO, which could have addressed that. Um, we appreciate hearing that it's extended to the 31st of March. Um, I, I am amazed to hear that you don't consider COVID-19 a disaster for small businesses, um, Minister. You have. Uh, in your possession, a letter written to you by the New South Wales Rural Financial Counselling Service uh, Director. Senator Davey, your time has expired. Minister Watt. Um, I don't think I got a question there, President, but I'm, I think I know generally where it was heading. Yeah. Minister. 
to finish the question. Uh, leaves being granted for you to finish the question. I really appreciate that. How will hundreds and possibly thousands of farmers and rural small businesses be assisted if these financial counsellors are not funded to continue their work post what you've now confirmed 31st of March 2023? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister. You played it in your last budget. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Davey. And as I say, this program was initially uh, created to assist small businesses who were uh, suffering financial impacts of drought or uh, natural disasters. And as I say, the review that was commissioned by the government of which you were a part found that, in actual fact, most people were using it for the business impacts of COVID-19, which is not what the service was provided for. Um, but I had the option of pursuing what your government had put in place, which was to cut the funding out at the 31st of December. But my view was that it was important that those services and their clients had certainty to carry them through the disaster season, which is why we have made extra funding available to carry them through that season. That's not what your government did. Your government, in all of its budgets, didn't extend the funding beyond the 31st of December. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so we are continuing that service. And you mentioned farmers, Senator Davey. Um, there's actually a separate funding program available for rural uh, counselling for farmers, and that remains in place. There is no risk of that funding at all, uh, and Thank you shouldn't you, be Minister, mixing up those time programs. Has expired. Senator Davey, second supplementary. Uh, so, what does the Rural Financial Counselling Service say to the current 130 small business clients that they are going to be unable to assist post maybe 31st of March 2023, which was not in the budget, and who will provide advice to? Um, these businesses in West Wyalong local government area and others like that. Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister. Thank you, President. Senator Davey, it's obviously a matter for each of those services to decide what they want to say to their clients. But one thing they might say is that isn't it good that we had a government that extended our funding beyond the 31st of December this year? Because, of course, that was the situation that your government left them in, that the funding was going to cut out at the 31st of December this year. You might have forgotten about it, but your government had a budget back in, I think it was March or April this year, and decided to not extend the funding. And now you want to come in here and say why, we're, why we haven't provided funding funding any more long term than what you did. We've actually extended this funding beyond what your government had agreed to to the 31st of March this year because we do recognise that these people need some certainty. Your government decided that it was going to cut out the funding right in the middle of the disaster season. That's how much you cared about those services. We've actually taken a different view, provided that certainty, and as I say, there is an ongoing program for rural financial counselling for farmers. There is no risk to that whatsoever. And in the meantime, we are considering other options for financial counselling for businesses to go with the uh, grants that have already Thank been approved you, for those Your small time businesses. Has expired, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister of Defence, Minister Wong. Last week it was revealed that the Chief of Defence Force, General Angus Campbell, has given officers of Special Operations Task Group 28 days to provide reasons for why they should not have to return any honours they received throughout service in Afghanistan. This order applies to officers of the ranks of captain and brigadier. It excludes officers of the rank of major general. How convenient. One officer of the rank of major general who was in the headquarters responsible for the special operations task group, who received a distinguished service cross for his service, was now General Angus Campbell. Does the minister support there being one rule for the higher ups and one rule for the rest? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, uh, this, is obviously, this obviously goes to the implementation of the Brereton Report, which contained uh, 143 recommendations, many of which were resolved by the previous government. The Deputy Prime Minister has instructed Defence to detail a pathway for closing out the remaining 42 recommendations. One of the outstanding recommendations is the one referenced in Senator Lambie's question, which is, deals with the review of the award of decorations to those in command positions. At uh, positions at troop, squadron, and task group level during particular special operations task group rotations. Um, uh, I am advised uh, that the Chief of Defence Force has written to a small number of people. Obviously, I don't propose to comment on the outcome of each of those particular uh, considerations. Uh, uh, I would make the point um, that uh, the um, 
the government's focus is on implementing the Brereton recommendations. The Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence, in relation to the last part of your question, uh, Senator Lambie, uh, Mr Miles has stated that there is no cause to extend the parameters of the recommendation. Uh, and where the government or where the CDF has acted, it is because there is an evidence base reason to do so. Uh, the government remains committed uh, to uh, uh, ensure that the outstanding recommendations of the Brereton report are appropriately acted upon. Uh, I'm advised the CDF is seeking to do that uh, where there has been a detectable pattern of behaviour underpinned by credible reports of misconduct by ADF personnel in Afghanistan. I'm also advised this applies to a very small number of people. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The officer of Special Investigator is investigating soldiers while the, whole com while the high commanders are protected by what the Afghanistan Inquiry Oversight Panel calls a blanket exemption from liability. Given the extent of findings that have led to this punitive action, does the minister believe this blanket exemption remains appropriate? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, President. Thank you to Senator Labby. And I, I do acknowledge her ongoing you know, focus on not only these issues but the issues of uh, the welfare of serving and um, previously serving personnel. Uh, the focus the government uh, and, as I'm advised, the CDF are taking are um, to implement the uh, Brereton report recommendation. Uh, the uh, parameters of those recommendations were obviously a matter for, for, the, uh, uh, the, for, for the Brereton uh, report, uh, and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister has, as I said, stated that the government does not believe there is cause to extend the parameters of uh, the recommendations. Uh, you know, we, we are committed uh, to implementing the report to the fullest extent possible. We understand this is a difficult issue, uh, but one that uh, DPM has made clear uh, our commitment Thank you, to Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. The blanket exemption has been criticised on both its grounds and its effects by, by a number of well-credentialed experts in this space. If the Chief of Defence Force can decide to demand the return of medals, who has the authority to decide whether to demand the return of his? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Um, uh, the advice I have is um, a defence honour may only be cancelled by the Governor-General, uh, um, that uh, the process would be that uh, in relation to any, uh, any such cancellation that the relevant minister would make a recommendation to the Governor General for to cancel such an honour. Uh, but I again make this point, uh, uh, and I don't intend to get into uh, personal um, reflections on anybody, uh, that the government's view uh, and the CDF's actions are, cons are consistent with this is that the uh, recommendations of the Brereton report uh, uh, should be acted upon. Uh, CDF's actions are consistent with uh, the government's policy position. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on some of the challenges facing the country and how the government is responding with responsible economic management. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator O'Neill and I acknowledge her um, length of service in the economic portfolio um, and uh, all the achievements she's made there. Um, this is an important question and the opportunity to update the Senate on global conditions impacting Australian households. Last week, the OECD released its updated outlook, which outlined some of those tough challenges ahead. The report showed that the global economy is experiencing the most profound energy crisis since the 1970s, while also dealing with the continued impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Russia's war in Ukraine is driving significantly higher energy prices all around the world. In the report, the OECD is predicting global growth to slow from 3.1 per cent to 2.2 per cent next year.
We know that the economic pressures coming at us from around the world are felt most acutely around the kitchen table. Australian households are more exposed to those, these global conditions than they should be due to the wasted decade of the Liberals and Nationals government's policy failures. While the government cannot control many of the global pressures that will impact on Australian households, we are working to clean up the mess left behind by those opposite and take control of what we can. We are responding to the legacy of a wasted decade in energy, in skills, in pr productivity and in real wages growth. But we're taking a responsible approach. That's why our budget was the most responsible budget in years, returning 99 per cent of the tax revenue upgrades over the next two years to the budget, in comparison with the Liberal and Nationals average of around 40 per cent. This is responsible budget management that prevents no extra pressure on inflation, and we are absolutely determined to get wages moving again because we know a strong economy has to mean strong wages for workers, otherwise the economy is not delivering for the working people like it needs to. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister, for your kind words and for your excellent response about responsible economic management. Uh, can the minister, uh, responsible economic management, can the minister outline what assessment the International Monetary Fund recently made of the government's economic management? Thank you, Senator O'Neill, Minister. Um, President, I thank Senator O'Neill for the supplementary. And yes, I can. The IMF's recent statement confirms that the Albanese Labor government's budget was responsible, right for the time, and readies Australia for the future. This is a ringing endorsement of the government's approach to responsible economic management. The IMF states that the government's near-term fiscal restraint will support mon monetary policy in addressing demand pressures. This is an endorsement of our fiscal strategy, which puts a premium on restraint. As a result of our spending discipline, payments it will fall in real terms over the next two years, and real spending growth averages just 0.3 per cent over the forward estimates. The October budget introduced responsible spending measures to provide cost of living relief, alleviate skill shortages, promote productivity growth and facilitate the climate transition. The IMF notes that the budget streamlining of spending should help to avoid adding to aggregate demand pressures in the economy. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. And can you also detail what the IMF had to say about the government's plan to boost inclusion, to encourage female workforce participation, and to tackle skill shortages? Thank you, Senator O'Neill, Minister. Thank you, President. I thank again Senator O'Neill for that excellent question. Under those opposite, our economy wasn't delivering like Australians needed it to. The IMF praised the government's policy that tackles skill shortages and boosts workforce participation, including key outcomes of the Jobs and Skills Summit. Our budget delivered quality investments in the capacity of the Australian economy and the capabilities of the Australian people. This includes our fee-free TAFE and more university places, delivering cheaper childcare for 1.26 million families, expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks for working parents. And the, IMF, uh, the IMF's independent assessment confirms that despite a difficult international outlook and significant economic and budget challenges here at home, Australians should be optimistic about the longer-term future of our economy and our country. Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. So, President, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, yeah. Senator Wong. Yeah. I refer to the proposed parliamentary sitting schedule for 2023 yeah. that has been widely distributed by the Government no. and which shows that the Government wants to scrap additional budget estimates for early next year, a departure, a departure from practice in place since the 1990s. Minister, when Labor was elected, the Prime Minister said the Australian people deserve accountability and transparency. Why then is this government scrapping additional estimates and reducing Senate estimates scrutiny from the conventional four weeks in a normal year to just three weeks? Uh, order, order, order. I have not yet called the minister. We are fortunate that Senator Birmingham has a loud and clear voice because it was very hard to hear the question from the interjections. Minister Wong. Were you I didn't say much. Senator Mackenzie, I've just brought the chamber to order. Minister. Well, I, I do love a question on accountability and transparency from the coalition. 
and I particularly love it on a day that we know that the House is, is, going, is, is, going to, is preparing this week uh, to debate a censure of your former leader for the, 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 you know, the, the double-up ministers that he's Order. invented. Uh, and I'm asked a question by a man who probably knew about Mr Taylor. Right. Mr Taylor covering up the price increase ahead Order. of the election. Where was your interest? Order. Where was your interest then, Senator Birmingham? Where was your interest then, Order. Senator Birmingham? Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order. Order on my right and left. I have a senator on her feet. Order. Senator O'Neill, Senator Billick, Senator Billick, and Senator Ayres. Order. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. On relevancy, point of order, uh, the minister has gone thank nowhere you. near accountability and transparency. Thank you, Senator from McDonald. From from thank you. Order. I haven't finished. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Oh. Please, thank uh, Senator McKenzie. Senator McKenzie, it is not a debating point. You raised your point. Senator McKenzie, you're not in a debate with me. You raised a point of order. I asked you to resume your seat. That is what I expect you to do. I will draw uh, Minister Wong to uh, the substantive nature of Senator Birmingham's well, question. Well, thank you. Thanks. I was responding to the request to talk about transparency and accountability, and uh, you know, de de oh, well, isn't it interesting? You know, he's all of a sudden now he's on the other side of the table. He was happy uh, to to protect Senator Mackenzie. He was happy. Uh, he's happy not to condemn. Uh, the uh, former not. Prime Minister. He's happy to defend Mr Taylor uh, hiding a price increase in electricity before the election. All of Order. those things he's happy to Order. do, but now he cares about Senator Estimates. If the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the Leader of the Opposition uh, would like to have a look at what is actually happening, you're still, you've still got Senator, Senator Estimates Hume. going. We've still got Senator Estimates going. We've still got Last night, last night, Senator Gallagher uh, was again uh, there answering Senator Hume's question. There was an air of great repetition to them, but we're very happy to keep answering the oh, same no. questions over and over Senator again. Wong. Senator Wong, Senator McGrath. A point of order on relevance. Uh, the question went to the, the sitting schedule in relation to uh, estimates being reduced by 25 per cent. And Minister Wong has gone nowhere near uh, the estimates schedule. I don't think she's uh, mentioned you, the minister's Senator mentioned McGrath, the question, estimates at all. Thank you, Senator McGrath. The question also contained other elements, which uh, the minister has gone to. Um, I'll remind her of the question, and she has 14 seconds left. Thank S you, Minister Thank you. Wong. The, the Senate, Senate would, will be aware that we have just delivered a budget. Estimates hearing have followed that. Spillover hearings are continuing this week. There will obviously not be a MIEFO, so there will not be estimates after that. Uh, but we are very happy to keep Thank doing you, endless Wong. estimates Your if those has opposite expired. wish. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Senator Wong. Please resume your seat. <laughs> <laughs> Order. I have called your leader to ask his first supplementary. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Will the government drop its outrageous proposal to cut Senate estimates in 2023 by a full week and instead commit to programming additional estimates hearings early next year? as has been the practice on both sides of this parliament for decades? Or is the government's assurances of transparency and accountability just another broken promise? Another Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 Uh, Minister. As I've said, uh, I understand uh, that uh, the uh, proposal involves a recognition that we have just had a budget, therefore we are, there is not intended to be a MIEFO. Uh, it is usual that additional estimates would follow MIEFO. So, so, so uh, I, I, I understand that uh, you know, I would anticipate that the usual pattern 
of Budget My EFO with additional and supplementary and budget estimates would be returned to uh, when, when uh, the, uh, the you know, post and the election we said it'll into uh, the normal My EFO and budget uh, uh, process. But again, I say, no one, on, uh, uh, no one in this place, I suspect even on that side, Order. believes it when you talk about transparency, Senator Birmingham, because we lived through nine years. Nine years of your government, uh, your government refusing to legislate you, an anti-corruption commission. Minister Wong, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. The government's proposed sitting schedule for 2023 also proposes four additional Senate-only sitting days on a Friday. However, the Senate standing orders provide for no established routine of business on a Friday. In the interests of accountability and transparency, Senator Wong, will the government commit to having a question time on any scheduled Friday sittings? Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, we, we will work with the Senate. We will, we will work with the Order. 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 Senator Birmingham has just completed a question. The minister was on her feet answering it, and I've had to immediately call you to order, Minister. Uh, of course, we will work with the Senate on how Fridays would be arranged, just as we have worked with the opposition uh, and the crossbench on how we would deal with this sitting week and as we dealt with last six a week. No, so, uh, well, Senator, Senator Birmingham, uh, you know, Senator Gallagher has been very consultative, including with your colleague, uh, on Friday sittings this week. I would anticipate Order. the same degree of consultation would be engaged in Order. by the government, which of course is very different to what we saw from those opposite when in government. And on that basis, President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you, Minister. Can I ask senators if, they, if they're wishing to leave the chamber to do so expeditiously? Order. It's not a social occasion. Senator Smith, do you seek the call? Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Gallagher in response to my question on the performance of the Assistant Treasurer. But before I do that, I think it's very, very important to recognise this very, very important and momentous occasion. The government has surrendered on its commitment to transparency and scrutiny. What we just heard in the final question asked by Senator Birmingham was the revelation that many of us caught a glimpse of this morning, that the government has decided that it will not put itself to the normal test of scrutiny that other governments have put themselves to for two to three decades. What we're talking about here is the decision of the government to take out of the parliamentary program four days of budget estimates. That is almost 60 hours of scrutiny, 60 hours of scrutiny that the opposition and other senators, other non-government senators, can put the government through. The first time in almost 30 years that the government has consciously decided to remove itself from scrutiny. 
This is perhaps the most remarkable re re revelation in the six-month history of the government so far. Now, of course, there is a get out of clause. There is a get out of jail clause for the government, Senator, and that is, point of order. and that is that it's a draft program. Thank you, Deputy President. My understanding was that Senator Smith rose to take note of the question that he asked Senator Gallagher. He's now floating off into the question that Senator Birmingham asked Senator Wong. So I would draw you back to whatever he's going to talk about. Senator Smith, I do have to draw you back to uh, your original motion, which was in relation to the answer given by Senator Gallagher. Senator Urquhart is 100 per cent correct, but it was such an important revelation that I thought I should that I, should, I, that I thought I should to indulge. You, Smith, but not necessarily important to Thank the Deputy President. Much. So then, so then, so then, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, today, today, sorry, Senator Lambie. I, of course, the other significant matter in question time today was a question that I asked. An issue that was actually canvassed yesterday in the Senate by coalition senators, and that is the appalling performance, the appalling performance thus far of the assistant treasurer, Mr. Stephen Jones. Now, normally, normally in government, if you made one mistake, that would be serious enough for a reprimand from the prime minister, reprimand from the treasurer, but no, the assistant treasurer has not made one mistake, has not made two mistakes, has made three mistakes. And all we got from Senator Gallagher, who represents both the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer in the Senate, was a statement, a reflection on her personal relationship with Mr Jones. And I don't doubt, I don't doubt that there's a long history there. But the critical point that we were examining in question time today is whether or not the assistant treasurer has the character, has the integrity, has the professional skill to be responsible for, to have management and oversight over the financial services portfolio. And I think it's clear the revelation that Senator McKim had given to this chamber last week makes it very, very clear, very, very clear that the assistant treasurer does not have the character or the integrity in order to manage what is a very, very significant portfolio. It's worth reminding the Chamber that a newspaper report in the Sydney Morning Herald noted, when talking about the Financial Accountability Regime Bill, noted that Mr Jones had said that there had been no sign-off on anything, had been no sign-off on anything. There had been no deal, Mr Jones is quoted as saying in the Sydney Morning Herald. But last week, Senator McKim, again in the chamber, made it very clear. He said, there is absolutely no doubt that Minister Jones and I had an agreement and any claim that there was no agreement is false. That is a significant revelation in this place by Senator McKim about his dealings, his negotiations with Stephen Jones. That is an unacceptable, unacceptable way in which the Assistant Treasurer, dealing with some very, very important legislation, and I would go to so far as to say that the greatest bulk of bills that have passed through the Senate since we came back after the election have been Treasury and financial bills. Have been Treasury and financial bills. Their careful management, careful negotiation is central to the well-being of Australians and their families. And we have Senator McKim calling out the fact that the Assistant Treasurer cannot be trusted with his word on important Thank you, matters. Smith. Senator Smith. Well, this is a really disappointing decline into a pretty horrific personal attack on a member of the government who I think is doing a tremendous job. And the idea that we have in this chamber uh, an attack on the basis of accountability, on the basis of transparency, and indeed, Senator Smith, an attack on the basis of acting in good faith, I think is pretty appalling. Uh, 
this assistant treasurer, our assistant treasurer, Stephen Jones, has been fighting day and night for the same things we are all fighting for on this side of the chamber, the same things which keep us up at night, how to deal with the cost of living crisis in Australia, fighting to do things like deliver cheaper childcare, to deliver cheaper medicines, to deliver real action to increase wages, including through our secure jobs bill. That is what our government is focused on. That is the work which keeps us up at night, and I know that is the work that our assistant treasurer is working on day in, day out. And from a government, from a government who had a history over nine years of dodging transparency, of dodging accountability, from the Prime Minister, whose most famous legacy quote is, I don't hold a hose, mate. That's the government Senator Smith served in. That is their record on accountability and transparency. That is their record. So pretty outrageous to come in here, not only to smear and attack a member of the other place, but to do so on the basis of accountability, on the basis of transparency, on the basis of acting in good faith. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how you keep a straight face through that one. Honestly, honestly, and you can't, you can't. How do you keep a straight face through that one? You can't. The government is not focused, is, is not focused on these ridiculous smears. We're focused on getting on with the job of action on cost of living. Cheaper childcare, January 1. We will see childcare get cheaper in this country to make sure more mums and dads can get back to work. Cheaper medicines. Real measures which will take the cost of living burden off Australian families. This is what people in our communities are talking about. These are the kind of measures that Australians want to see. Most importantly, they want to see action on their wages. They want to see after, after a, a, when the previous government designed our economic architecture to have wages deliberately low, well, they want to see a shift in that. They want to see us move away from that. And fair enough. And that's what we're doing as a government. That's what we are getting on with. So to come in here and, and make some kind of artificial argument about transparency and accountability, I think it's pretty hard to do that and keep a straight face. And to keep a straight face. Um, we have just seen the government deliver a budget which not only fulfills our election commitments but contains key, key measures to address and tackle cost of living, in addition to what I've already spoken about, about cheaper childcare and about cheaper medicines. We are progressively expanding paid parental leave to six months by, by 2026, another measure which will make a real difference to Australian families. More affordable housing, including a new national housing accord to build more affordable and well-located homes for Australians, and of course getting wages moving again. And I know Assistant Minister Jones. I know he, like every member of our government, every member of the Albanese Labor government cabinet, is working day in and day out to achieve these objectives. Because when we came to government, we did so on a promise to the Australian people that we would take real action to, to address the cost of living crisis, that we would be, yes, a government which was more transparent, which was more accountable. I mean, let's not forget that in the other place this week, we expect the Prime Minister will be the subject of a motion regarding his, his decision to swear himself into multiple other ministries. And I note Senator Smith said that, um, that the Assistant Treasurer should be reprimanded by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. I mean, ridiculous, but I guess at least if he was a member of the former government, that person would be the same person. I mean, it's, it's just outrageous that you had a Prime Minister take these decisions, do these things, you all sat elderly by, by that, and then you come in here months later on this accountability and transparency uh, attack, which I just don't know how you do with a straight face. You don't believe you, in it. Senator you don't Smith. believe the words Senator, you are saying. Senator Bragg. Uh, Deputy President, and it's a real pleasure to be able to make a contribution uh, in relation to the government for vested interests and its latest uh, foray uh, into financial regulation. Uh, if you are a class action law firm or you are a union or you are a super fund, uh, you are at the top of the list on 
the government for vested interests priority list. Uh, if you're a punter, uh, you go to the back of the queue uh, because this government is only interested in feathering the nests of vested interests. And that is the log of claims that this minister, Mr Jones, has been working through since he assumed his role over six months ago. And we saw uh, over the last few days Mr Swan, who is the president of the Labor Party but also the head of the CBUS Super Fund, uh, say that he was going to commit $500 million of the members' money to a housing accord which Senator Gallagher said a Senate estimate she didn't even know the detail of. So you've got a housing and court policy uh, with no detail, uh, no assurance to the trustees about how their money uh, would be protected, and you've got the person wearing two hats in Mr Swan falling over himself to promise the members money. Uh, and that is, of course, the best example that I can think of of the howling conflicts which sit, which sit uh, at the very heart of this government for vested interests. But of course, Senator Smith's contribution here is about Mr Jones. And Mr Jones has already had a, uh, a quadrilla of failures in his attempt to regulate the financial markets or fail, fail to attempt to regulate the financial markets. And uh, last Friday, we heard from Senator McKim, who had been done over by Mr Jones. He goes over to the other ministerial wing and uh, does a deal which falls over pretty quickly. And of course, Mr Jones has, as a result of the deal falling over, has killed his own financial regulation uh, agenda, uh, which is designed to improve the penalties which are applied to members of the financial sector who breach our laws. So that's fallen over. So is the compensation scheme of last resort. Uh, which Mr Jones promised at the last election. Uh, and so that is now on the never-never, that we might not see that again. Uh, and then, of course, yesterday in this chamber, his uh, critical policy, Mr Jones's key policy that he took to the election, the religious carve-out for super funds, massive issue, huge issue out there in the community, and uh, that was the centrepiece of his policies. And yesterday uh, that was excised by the government, removed from the bill before the, House, before the Senate. Uh, and of course, we've also been able to canvass Mr Jones's failure to regulate the crypto sector. Uh, back on the 22nd of August, Mr Jones said in a Treasury media release that he was about to release a public consultation on token mapping. Quote unquote, will be released soon. That was on the 22nd of August. Meanwhile, you've had the FTX collapse uh, and you've had other consumers exposed, 30,000 Australian consumers exposed to FTX. And what do you hear from Jones? Nothing. Nothing from Mr Jones. So he's failed to protect consumers, of course, there because there are probably no vested interests going into his office asking him to do things. Which takes me to uh, the last point about Mr Jones's tremendous record here as the minister. Of course, his first act as minister was to remove transparency arrangements which would require the funds to show how much money they've sent off to a related party, be it a union or a bank or an insurance company or any related party. And he's taken that away. That was his first priority. He comes into the job and he says, OK, I've got a great plan here. I'm going to take away the transparency that has been put in place because I don't want workers to see where their money is going. And so that is, that, is, that is his priority. That tells you all you need to know about this minister. And in terms of that particular regulation. I mean, tomorrow I know that Senator Lambie has a disallowance and the chamber will be able to make its own judgment about whether or not it thinks that Mr Jones's judgment that the Australian people and Australian workers and members of super funds should not be allowed to see when their funds are sending their money off to the CPMEU and to the Australian uh, Workers' Union and all the other unions which benefit greatly from the superannuation funds. So it is a shocking tenure already for Mr Jones. He's fluffed the, the FAR bill. Uh, the religious carve-out is already dead. And tomorrow he might, in fact, complete his trifecta and he might lose his super regs. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I thank Senator Dean Smith uh, for his question to Senator Gallagher to the minister um, about uh, our very important financial accountability uh, regime 
uh, package, uh, and this indeed is a, a package of reforms that uh, I am very proud uh, to support, uh, and it's a package of reforms uh, that the government remains uh, committed to passing. Uh, and we make absolutely no apologies uh, for being a government uh, that is willing to uh, consult with the, the sector uh, about this package of reforms. Uh, this is uh, an incredibly important uh, part of our financial architecture, uh, and it's a part of our financial architecture uh, that the previous government, the uh, now opposition, completely walked away from. Uh, this package of reforms includes uh, reforms to the accountability for banks uh, and financial services providers uh, and includes um, strong penalties. Uh, it includes a compensation scheme of last resort for victims of uh, financial companies who refuse or can't pay determinations for compensation for victims of, of wrongdoing. Uh, and critically, it includes reforms to payday lending laws, laws and consumer lease laws uh, to get rid of predatory lending uh, in our country uh, that just heaps debt onto vulnerable people. Uh, so again, we remain committed to passing uh, this legislation. Uh, and when it comes to financial architecture in this country that protects uh, consumers, uh, it is quite uh, extraordinary that the opposition would come in here uh, and try to claim any moral high ground whatsoever when it comes to this issue. Uh, this is an opposition that voted, I think it was 26 times, against the Hain Royal Commission uh, into the banking sector. Uh, and these reforms that we are continuing to consult about actually come out of that Royal Commission. Uh, they also come out of the Small Amount Credit Contracts Review. Um, which highlighted uh, the absolutely tragic consequences of predatory lending. Uh, but of course, those opposite chose not to pass this package of reforms. Uh, they chose not to try to protect consumers. Uh, they chose uh, not to fully implement the Hain Royal Commission uh, recommendations or the SAC recommendations. Uh, and instead, They've come in here uh, and attempted to heap uh, criticism on us for introducing this incredibly important legislation uh, and also for consulting widely on it. Uh, what we are doing is getting on with reforms that protect consumers in this country. Uh, what we are doing is getting on with implementing the Hain Royal Commission uh, in full. Uh, and uh, what we are doing uh, is getting on with being a government that is restoring uh, integrity um, to our uh, political system uh, and to our government. Uh, and I do want to note uh, the comments of Senator Dean Smith uh, in his take note speech, uh, who directly called into doubt the integrity of the minister uh, with his words. Uh, and that was uh, a completely unwarranted attack, uh, and I think it was an attack uh, that was, quite frankly, um, beneath the standards of Senator Dean Smith, um, who I work with on the Senate Economics Committee uh, and who I've generally found to be a very collegiate um, and reasonable person uh, as we do our work, um, work like considering this particular package of reforms. Um, so I do have to say that I'm incredibly uh, disappointed with the approach of Senator Smith uh, in this chamber today. Uh, and uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with introducing a package of reforms that go to the heart of protecting consumers in our country from financial wrongdoing. Uh, and there is absolutely nothing wrong um, with consulting widely on those reforms and taking feedback as feedback arises. Uh, nothing wrong with talking to the crossbenchers um, about the reforms and making sure that they're fit for a purpose uh, and they do the job. Uh, Minister Jones is getting on with doing the job, delivering the financial architecture that our country needs, uh, and he will continue to do that work. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Cadell. Mr Deputy President, Australian businesses make billions of dollars worth of investment decisions every day. And to do this, they need certainty. To do this, they need consistency. 
and to do this they need reliability in the economy and the hands that steer them. That's why Senator Dean Smith's questions today are so important for the Australian economy. Today in the question by Senator Smith, we heard the challenge the Assistant Treasurer's actions have caused to this. I don't think it was assessing his merits or his integrity. It is just the potential damage that inconsistency can cause to the economy. I note that the Assistant Treasurer is the Minister for Whitlam, and we've noted that just in three days some of those opposites will be celebrating 50 years since Mr Whitlam took office. Well, in 72 it was potentially time, and in 22 potentially the Minister's time is up. We've had the three strikes, we've had the problems with all the areas they've spoken at earlier, and business needs better. The economy needs better. Australian households need better. I noted in the response by Minister Gallagher that the Assistant Minister was an outstanding person. There is no question of that. We're not questioning his uh, personality. We're not testing his character. He may be no doubt. He may be the Keanu Reeves of this parliament, for all I know. I don't meet him. He may pet dogs and work at a pound and look after cats. No one is questioning his personality, merely his competency and his ability to see things through. But we get back to the point. Business needs an economy with confidence and that when the government shakes a hand, when the government nods ahead, when the government says yes, they get a deal that sticks. When we go into a business case, when we've sat in a boardroom, I've sat there trying to diversify a business to make it more resilient to look to the future. When we're looking at billions of dollars worth of investment, you look at millions of dollars of consultants, millions of dollars of man hours, you look at tens and tens of, of people looking to make this investment. Now what have we got? We've got uncertain. We've got a, an assistant treasurer that can change his mind on regulation, that can say stuff that you may rely on that is incorrect. We have interest rates going up. We have cost of living going through the roof. The economy is not stable at the moment, and inconsistencies in messaging from the government heard it. We heard from Senator Bragg some of the areas that came up uh, where there's been a flip-flop or a change. Talk about cryptocurrency, getting involved in there, regulation around that. There are people, there was an article today where a couple are losing $50,000 in superannuation for a lack of regulation in the cryptocurrency space. You know, that lack of certainty is going to hurt them personally. It's going to hit budgets all across Australia when they do that. We heard about the super disclosure laws being wound back. And people deserve to know Every time they do this, they think a union does that and they think the Labor Party does that. People need consistency. They need to know that is not the case. And we talked about bank penalties, bank penalties being wound back for things. Now, what is that about? It's like an episode of rake. Was the shadow minister scared the banks were going to close his bank accounts and he was going to have to go to parliamentary friends of breakfast to get a meal around here? But we flicked back on the bank episode here. All of these things are not good, they are not consistent, and they do not give confidence to the economy. And that's before we even get to mums and dads looking at their consistency, their certainty. They went into an election hearing $275 worth of savings, and that has evaporated. They are doing their budgets, and we have had nine, eight or nine interest rate rises since this government has been elected. The cash rate is now more than eight times higher than when this government got elected. There is no consistency. There is no steady hand. We deserve better. The Australian people deserve better. And the assistant treasurer just needs to get it right. If he doesn't need to go, he needs to get it right because the people deserve that. Thank you, Mr. I put the question. Those for the question say aye against uh, you. Senator Lambie, you're seeking the call. Yeah. In relation to. Well, I rise to take note of answers. Thank you. Uh, to the to the to the one moved by Senator Dean Smith, or have you got other answers you wish to make it? Wish to move. No, to my question. Okay. So I just need to put the motion, and Sorry. then I'll give you the call. I put the question to, to the motion moved by Senator Dean Smith. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Lambie.
Thank you. Thank you. I, did, I missed that step. I do apologise. At the start of this month, the Chief of Defence Force, Angus Campbell, gave a group of Special Forces officers 28 days to explain why their service should still be considered distinguished and worthy of the medal they were awarded for their achievements within the Special Operations Task Group in Afghanistan. The majority of these officers received their awards for their leadership in action on foreign ground, facing the enemy and leading their men in combat. We have only heard about this because many of these officers have reached out, needing help to bring this to the public's attention. The CDF himself has apparently asked some of these men to voluntarily, to voluntarily hand back their awards, and if they don't, he said he will seek a mechanism to do so through the Governor-General, through the force of threat. This is the same Chief of Defence Force who, two years ago, off the back of the Brereton report, called to remove the meritorious unit citation from every single Special Forces person, including their support staff. The Chief of Defence Force is making these decisions and taking actions while, happily while he happily continue to wear his own Distinguished Service Cross. His citation reads, and I quote, awarded for his command and leadership in action, in unquote. While the commander of Joint Task Force 633, when he was the general responsible for all Australian troops deployed to the Middle East, including Afghanistan, sitting comfortably in his office outside Dubai for the majority of those two years, mind you. Well, I tell you what, mate, it's time to cough up your own award first, buddy. How about you start showing some leadership? I could just see some out of you, just a little bit just a little bit before you're just about gone and disposed, I reckon, and stop passing the buck down here. Stop passing it down to the diggers, mate. Show some leadership. Pass yours in first. Let's see what you've got. I can tell you this was explained to me by one of the Special Forces officer friends as the exact command responsibility the Chief of Defence Force is citing as a reason why the other lower-ranking Special Forces officers should hand back their awards. The Chief of Defence Force has lost the support of the majority of the military, perhaps not so much his little group of senior officers that still surround him waiting for their day of promotion and all the brass up in his headquarters, but he has lost the support of most of the military. That is where we're at today. No support from junior ranks whatsoever. These are the ones that are doing the hard yards on the ground and who are the ones who actually and the ones actually out on missions winning their awards in action in combat. That's who they are. The discharge rates from the ADF are at an all-time high and don't even talk to me about retention rates, they're finished. Recruitment is struggling at the best. Why would people, why would anybody want to join any organisation where this type, type of treatment can go unchecked against those who are subordinate in rank and restricted through strict policies of being unable to reach out of the system otherwise? Well, I say enough is enough. We are in Australia where we abide by the rule of law and give people a fair go. We saw a spike in veteran suicide and damage to our strategic reputation through the same man, the same man that has been given a tenure, an extended tenure for two years from Minister Richard Miles. What planet is he living on? That's your first and last mistake, I reckon, Minister. I sincerely do. Any respect you hope to get out of this has already gone, Minister Miles. You're finished. Gone. So I can tell you the CDF has proven that these decisions should not be left to him and I am calling for his actions to be immediately brought before the Senate Committee into Defence and Foreign Affairs in order to appropriately ensure the sensitive and strategic na nature of these issues are properly and publicly met. I can tell you now one of the reasons we are at a Royal Commission these suicides going on is because of that leadership. He has been part of that leadership for many, many, many years. Yet none of you in here, neither side of the majors, have had the guts to dispose of him. We have some serious issues going on in our military. Watch the Royal Commission because it's in front of our face. And when we have troops out there, where most of them, where their morale is down and out, that puts a strain on our national security. And that should be a red hot alert for all of us in here. It is time for leadership change in the military. 
Before the Royal Commission tells you, I will. Angus Campbell has to go. Put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator, Senator Wish Wilson, there's 30 seconds remaining. Do you wish to take note? Oh, I won't pass up 30 seconds. Just, I'd like to put on. I wish to take note in response to my questions. How disappointed I was that I didn't get a response from Senator Wong on whether the government will actually oppose a UNESCO World Heritage in Danger listing and the process that would lead to that. I, I sincerely hope that the government ac accepts the recommendation and that we put the politics behind us, 10 years of shameful politics, and that we work together to secure the future of the reef, for not just for future Australian generations, but for all generations. And I note uh, Senator Green, the envoy, is in the room, the Senate chamber today, and I hope she pays attention to what I've just said. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I'll move on. Uh, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. President, uh, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business of the Senate notice number one postponed to the 1st of December 2022 and general business notice number 101 postponed till the next day of sitting. Uh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I, I, sorry, I seek leave to. <laughs> to um, what am I seeking leave for? I'm seeking I leave to um, ask for leave for a senator. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. <laughs> I uh, seek leave for Senator um, McCarthy for today for personal reasons. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Carried. No, no one's seeking anything here? Okay. So I'm going to move to formal motions, uh, proceed to the discovery for formal business, and I um, am going to start with business. Oh, Senator Hanson young um, Madam Acting Deputy President, I just want to make a correction. Well, I'm not Madam Acting um, no, Deputy President. No, Madam President. I, thank Madam you. President, well, actually, the no, just, President, just the President. President. Thank you. The President. Um, uh, President, I would just like to correct something. There was a postponement motion to, uh, being lodged in the name of um, uh, Senator Shoebridge, and it was postponed till Thursday, but actually it should be postponed till tomorrow. And I'd like that corrected. Um, Senator Hanson Young, I'm advised that that is what we did. Great. Thank awesome you. Work. So I'm now going to move to business of the Senate, uh, number, motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Green. Senator Green. Thank you, President. Uh, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, proposing a reference to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee relating to sexual consent laws in Australia, be taken as formal. And I acknowledge the presence of Chanel Contos in the chamber today. Uh, thank you, Senator Green. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Green. I move the motion. To the uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave, grant leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thanks, Waters. President. The Greens strongly support this inquiry, which will complement the work plan to strengthen criminal justice responses to sexual assault, which was recently endorsed by the meetings of Attorney General. This is critical work, and I too would like to acknowledge and thank Chanel Contos, who's in uh, back of the chamber right now, but also the work and presence of Saxon Mullins, Bri Lee, Nina Fennell, and Grace Tame, and so many others who have pushed for strong, clear and harmonised laws on consent and consent education for so long. These courageous women have consistently pushed for laws and consent education to be informed by the lived experience of sexual assault victim survivors. This inquiry provides an important opportunity to achieve that. With so many states and territories legislating different types of consent, it is important that we harmonise upwards. And I was pleased to see that the Queensland Labor government belatedly committed to an affirmative consent model after two years uh, missing that opportunity. I hope that all other states will follow suit. And I thank uh, Senator Green for proposing this inquiry. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Green be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 105, standing in the name of Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I ask that general business notice motion 105, um, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson. I move that the following bill be introduced. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson. Um, it's a bill for an act to prevent discrimination in relation to COVID-19 vaccination status and for related purposes. Um, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities be now read a first time. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to prevent discrimination in relation to COVID-19 vaccination status and for related purposes. Senator Hanson. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson. I table an, explan an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 106, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie. On behalf of Senator Mackenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number 106 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew to uh, the motion standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, <clears throat> We now move to general business notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Oh, that's been postponed. Beg your pardon. Yes, business of the Senate number one. Thank you. Till tomorrow. Thank you. That's uh, as agreed, Senator Hanson Young. We now move to government business. Item number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Is that postponed as well? Right. I'm in the hands of the Senate. I will go to 103. So uh, we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 103, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 103, relating to uh, attacking plastic pollution, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 103, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 104, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 104, relating to holding big businesses to account, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 104, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yes, I can't even read properly. Yeah. Senator McKim has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It's shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I believe that is supported. Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly and I'll call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. Well, Australia led the world in letting women vote, and now our country should lead the world in letting young people aged 16 and 17 vote. Yeah. Last week, the New Zealand Supreme Court found that it was discriminatory and a breach of human rights to deny 16 and 17-year-olds the right and the opportunity to vote. 
Now, Australia doesn't have a national bill of rights, something that the Greens would like us to have, but the argument is the same. People should have a say on decisions that affect them. Young people are more politically aware than ever before, and they will be directly disadvantaged by, amongst other things, climate change, cost of living pressures, the cost of getting an education, responses to sexual assault, gender inequality and growing housing unaffordability. 16- and 17-year-olds make a significant contribution to Australian society. They can work, they can drive, they can pay taxes, they are carers, they are students, they are renters. At 17, they can fight in wars, and yet currently they are denied a say in who represents them and how their tax dollars are spent. Young people inherit a planet and an economy impacted by decisions that they have no say in. Now, detractors often say kids don't even understand politics, but young people have found ways to work outside the electoral system to call for the changes needed to protect their futures. From the school strikes for climate and legal action on whether the environment minister owes kids a duty of care, to young women signing petitions and meeting with politicians, crying out for decent consent education to drive down the rates of sexual assault amongst their peers. To the young man I met last weekend, Ned Heaton, who at age 11 started a campaign to end plastic toothbrushes and replace them with bamboo toothbrushes. He's now 15 and has written a book, a great Christmas gift for kids who love oceans and, and nature. Um, to globally, young women and young women of colour in particular, leading the debate about climate action. Young people are already shaping the future in so many ways, and they deserve the right to vote from age 16. Young people deserve more of a say in politics, so it's going to take more than just lowering the voting age. We need more young people elected to parliament to directly represent their interests and concerns. And until that happens, we here have a lot of work to do to meaningfully listen to and represent the voices of young people. We need to ensure that there's meaningful consultation with young people, and we welcome future contributions from the new Youth Steering Committee. We need to make Parliament a safe and respectful place that young people actually aspire to work. Earlier this year, Plan International Australia found that 72 per cent of young women did not feel that politics is an equal or inclusive space for them. Now, we know from experiences in other countries that lowering the voting age actually increases political engagement amongst young people, and that increased commitment stays with them throughout their life. It is good for democracy. Other countries allow people under the age of 18 to vote—Brazil, Cuba, Austria, Malta, Scotland. And in the wake of last week's court decision, New Zealand will introduce laws to lower the voting age. Australia should follow their lead. Young people get it. They just don't get a say. Let's change that. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McGrath. Uh, th thank you, President. To begin with, I want to pay tribute to, to the many members of the young Liberals, the young Nationals, and in my home state, the young Liberal Nationals, for the work that they do across Australia, but in Queensland, across Queensland, in standing up uh, for freedom and for standing up against some of the errant nonsense that you hear on, on the left side of politics. And I'll comm commend those young people from the centre-right uh, who, in the recent student union elections, took the fight and, and went down in a ball of flames, but took the fight to, to the broad left on campuses across Queensland and had to put up with just buckets of bile and buckets of nastiness from, from those supporting the Greens and from those supporting the Socialist Alliance and those supporting the left-wing tickets across, across Queensland. And, and so, what they put up with on a daily basis is to be commended, and I speak as, as someone who reached the dizzying heights of, of chairman of the Sunshine Coast Young Liberals and president of the Griffith University Liberal Club. And notwithstanding the strong advocacy uh, for the issues impacting across Queensland, it is the view of, of the youth movements of, of political parties across Australia who are on the centre-right of politics, on the freedom side of politics, that the voting age should stay as it is at, at 18. And that is the position of, of the coalition and the opposition um, in, in, in this chamber. Uh, we believe that 18 is the appropriate age at, at which the line should be drawn as to whether people can vote or should vote. 
uh, and, and that has been long accepted practice, and we don't see the need to, to change that. But if we are talking about how we can enhance and uh, protect our, our democracy, there are certain things we should be looking at and we should draw attention to, and that is Labor's plans to, to introduce a financial gerrymander at a federal level at a federal level. Labor's plans to bring in a financial gerrymander to try and lock themselves into power. So what Labor are up to, uh, President, Madam President, is Labor want to bring in the Queensland model. And, and for those who, who are listening at home and don't know what the Queensland model is, it's very simple. It's, it's limiting the Liberal National Party under a spending cap to $15 million. And the Labor Party is $15 million. And you think, oh, that's pretty fair. But under Labor's model, every union in Queensland also can spend up to $10 million. So on one side of the ledger, on the centre right, the Liberal National Party, led by, by David Christofilli, the next Premier of Queensland, notwithstanding the financial gerrymander, we, ha we are capped at, at $15 million. But on, on the left side, you've got the Labor Party, $15 million, and then I think there are 26 um, registered trade unions in, in Queensland, and um, I'm happy to, to be correct on that number, so they can spend up to $260 million on, on a state election. So effectively, you've got $15 million against $275 million. So there is no spending cap in Queensland. It is a financial gerrymander, gerrymander designed to keep the Liberal National Party out of power. And what Labor are proposing at a federal level is to bring in in a similar cap on expenditure. So the political parties will all be capped, but the unions won't be. The unions who are the, the campaign wing of the Labor Party, because we know the Labor Party is defunct as, as an organisational level on the ground, and it is run by the unions. There's nothing wrong, wrong with that. The Labor Party uh, was formed out of the union movement. But if we're talking about fairness in politics, and if we're talking about ensuring that we have a, a, a democracy that allows all voices to be heard, then we should ensure that all voices have the same means and the same ability in which to prosecute the arguments before the voters at, at, at each election. And unfortunately, that is not the case in Queensland, and unfortunately, that is not what Labor are proposing at a federal level. They are proposing to bring in this financial gerrymander that will lock out lock out so many people from participating in the democratic process so they can entrench themselves into power. And, and part of this plan, we can see this, is uh, the IR bills that are, are before Parliament uh, this week and, and, and last week, in terms of the Labor Party ensuring that their, their, union, their union bosses are paid back, and they'll make sure that then the union bosses will put money into the Labor Party re-election when it comes. But we will win because you, we are on the right Your side of politics. Thank you, President. The Labor government supports uh, the inclusion of young people in government decision making, and we support the enfranchisement of all Australian, Australians. But we're not here today to rush into changing the fundamentals of our voting system without proper consultation. But I have to say, just last week uh, we saw the first minister, uh, advisory council of some 15 young Australians and invited them to Canberra to engage with government to have a say on issues that matter to them. That was via the Youth Steering Committee, uh, which was um, under the last government. Uh, I had seen much defunding and uh, neglect of that, of that uh, inclusion. But this week uh, and last week, uh, Dr Anne Ali uh, has been working with these young people to drive the development of our government's new youth engagement model. This is about creating meaningful opportunities for young Australians to have a say on government policies and programs. This is a model being developed by young people for young people. It brings together a diverse range of life experiences uh, to uh, this role. It brings together young people from a really diverse uh, variety of backgrounds to have a say on a very wide variety of issues. When it comes to the issues confronting young people in Australia today, 
We know that young Australians are uniquely placed to tell us about the problems they face to shape the solutions that actually work for them. Young people in Australia are more than 15 per cent of our population, and we're not here to paint them with one brush of being young or being disengaged or only uh, caring about one issue. <coughs> uh, Labor uh, is committed to engaging with young people and learning about their issues and stories and their ideas for our nation. As a government, we want to not only work for Australia's young people, but also work with them. This is a far more effective model uh, from our point of view. So the committee sees some 15 young people, including from regional, rural and remote areas. We had a massive uh, uh, commitment from young people around Australia expressing their interest in, uh, in participating. Uh, we've, we now have participating young people from LGBTIQ plus communities, First Nations, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, diverse religious backgrounds, along with young Australians with lived experience of disability, caring responsibilities, mental health issues, uh, and they all have a place on this advisory committee. Uh, this means, uh, you, you can de see from this, our commitment uh, uh, to Australia's young people. We, in we had more than 1,200 applications from people aged 12 to 25 years old. So we know that young Australians are interested in our nation's political affairs and are interested in engaging in the decisions that impact them. And in, the, in this context, I certainly recognise that for many it, it includes a desire uh, to pursue electoral enfranchisement. So via this committee, we do hope that we will be able to engage with young people about their expectations for electoral enfranchisement. The Labor Party has led key electoral reforms in Australia. Uh, in order to consult with Australians very widely about how we uh, gain better inclusion uh, and participation from across our political spectrum. Electoral reform needs to be carefully considered and it needs to be addressed through multi-partisan forums such as Parliament's Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. And I uh, am also committed to seeing the Youth Advisory Committee as well as uh, young people from right around Australia participating in these processes. In this context, we can see uh, that the Labor Party uh, is committed to meaningful electoral reforms. We were, for example, the first party to introduce funding and disclosure schemes in the early 1980s. Labor is absolutely committed to supporting oh, young sorry. people in our political sorry, system. Um, Senator, your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. This is my message to our 16 and 17 year old Australians. You can OK boomer me as much as you want. I'll happily cop it. Yet as someone who's 67 and grey haired, I want to let you in on a little life secret. The Greens over here want you to think voting makes you an adult. It's a trap. It's something that no one here has really mentioned. Remembering when I was your age, you really don't want to be an adult yet. Trust me, it kind of sucks, and it's hard. The Greens are adults. Listening to their speeches, do they seem like happy people? <laughs> adults have lots of bills. Car rego bills, electricity bills, water bills, gas bills, car insurance bills, private health bills, dental bills, phone bills, and more. You might even have to start paying for your own Netflix. Then you have to go to work every day, on repeat daily, for 40 years until you retire or die. 9am to 5pm at least in an office, up early before the sun rises if you're a tradie. And don't forget to do all your laundry in between as well. Then if you work really hard and get a good job, the government will start stealing 33 cents out of every dollar you earn and waste it on something. There are just some of the, these are just some of the responsibilities that come with being an adult. As fun as I'm sure all this sounds, 
there's much more. These are just some of the responsibilities that come with voting. They will all come more quickly than you think, and you'll be voting sooner than you realise. Until then, just focus on finishing school or choosing a trade. Don't listen to the people saying that you need to protest or the world will end. It won't. For decades we've been told the lie that the world will end in five years or maybe ten years. Hang out with your friends. Just have fun and practice to get your pee plates. You'll soon have plenty of time to protest and vote and do all the boring stuff that comes with being an adult. Sooner than you think. Much sooner than you think. Thank you, Senator. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, that's one way to look at it, Senator Roberts, but thank you for your contribution. As a 27-year-old and as the youngest member of the 47th Parliament, my commitment to empowering the voices of young Australians is unquestionable. It is important that young people understand the power of their democratic right to vote in a country like Australia, when there are so many examples around the world where this right has been diminished. The assurance that the value of one person's vote is no different to that of another is something we cannot take for granted. Speaking to fellow young people in Western Australia, I am always inspired by their passion for a better world. At the election in May this year, they knew there had to be a change to safeguard their future, and a change is what they got. Their voices are being heard by this government, Acting Deputy President. Since being elected, we took immediate action on climate change, something young people are so passionate about and have been calling for years. Restored our reputation on the world stage, we've made TAFE more accessible, campaigned for wage increases and job security so young people in our country can confidently support themselves whilst they're studying, saving for their first home or to go and travel the globe. These are real challenges that young people need and we are delivering. The Albanese Labor government is a government that young people can be certain has their back now and always, unlike what they had known for most of their lives under those on the other side. We have an incredible minister uh, for youth in Dr Anne Ali who is working tirelessly to engage with young people for young people. I will always work in this place to increase enfranchisement, education and information about electoral matters so that young people understand the importance of our democracy. With this in mind, now is not the time to lower the voting age without the proper consideration of Australia's electoral landscape. But it is time to consider practical ways of engaging with our youth um, and young people to educate, empower and promote the democratic rights and freedoms we have as Australians. Now, Some of these ideas are already in place and practised, while others are less frequent but as important. I would like to see more educational school visits discussing with students their curriculum of humanities and social sciences and how the theory they learn has practical implications on parliamentary uh, operations and processes and procedures. I'd like to see more young people invited to roundtables about matters of importance to them. This will enable us to listen, truly listen, to the challenges that are unique to our nation's youth and constructively brainstorm solutions but also allow them to contribute towards the decision-making processes of legislation that will impact their lives in the years to come. I would like to see more invitations extended to young people to visit parliament houses um, across our states and territories or to, show, sorry, or to shadow the member of parliament for a day or a week to understand and witness the hectic schedules of parliamentarians and appreciate the behind-the-scenes work that we put. I would also like to see uh, more young people involved in youth organisations, university clubs and young labour for the people in my home state of Western Australia, which welcome young people of all ages and ensure they understand the political system before a ballot paper is shoved in their face and they're asked to vote. I believe in making informed decisions and being well versed when casting my vote to elect a government that shares my values and will implement policies for the greater good of all Australians. A government that is inclusive, progressive, responsible and compassionate. 
Labor has always been the party of meaningful electoral reform that creates a transparent and accessible electoral system. Future discussions about this issue in the context of Australia's democracy is something we are open to. But as our electoral system exists today, young Australians are being represented in this parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Steele John. Thank you. Well, what we've heard uh, in the debate so far uh, is opposition to 16 and 17 year olds getting the right to vote from the Liberal Party and lukewarm non commitment from the ALP. And I would ask all MPs who have contributed to this, to this debate that have decided to give their view on this issue to engage in a bit of a thought experiment. Imagine uh, if you were being asked a really important question about your life and you were not allowed to actually answer. In fact, imagine that you were legally prevented from answering such a question, while other people in another place uh, have a say and are encouraged to use that to make a decision for you in order to make a choice on your behalf. And all of this being done with the assumption uh, that you uh, cannot make a decision for yourself, are not fit to give your view, to speak your opinion. Doesn't this sound awful? Doesn't this sound even discriminatory? I think people in this room would absolutely hate it. Well, this is the reality. This is the reality for every person who has yet to turn 18 when it comes to government. Don't you think it's unfair that if you are looking as a young person at 114 new coal and gas projects when people uh, and communities are facing the destruction of climate events uh, and you want to protest about it, you want to oppose it, and yet you are not allowed to have a say in whether or not those projects go ahead, whether or not those governments are re-elected? Don't you think it's unfair that 16- and 17-year-olds who are planning their futures and choosing universities with the weight of tens of thousands of dollars in debt on their shoulders, in education fees, uh, when they should and could have the ability to have a say at the last election about whether or not those policies should continue or whether or not university should once again be made free. Well, the Greens believe in empowering everyone to be involved in decisions that impact them, increasing the voting age, uh, decreasing the voting age uh, to 16 and 17 uh, will, have an enormous, uh, will have an enormous impact and be a profound step towards a more inclusive, uh, proactive, working democracy. And I'm proud to be part of a team that will push for this and see it done. It is not fair to exclude 16 and 17 year olds from the democratic system, not at all. It is time to begin fixing the disparities in the system by lowering the voting age to 16. Thank you, Senator. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I welcome this motion moved by my colleague Senator McKim and support the lowering of the voting age to 16. The law of this land is our law. It's the oldest law on the planet. First Nations people in this country are the oldest continuing living culture on earth. Our society ensured that we have equality. Equality meaning that our young people were just as important as our old people. The age of 16, we have many, many responsibilities as First Nations people. We have responsibilities of our siblings. We have responsibilities to our old people. We have responsibilities to our cousins our brothers, our sisters, and a lot of our people are having babies at 16. I was 17. A lot of our young people are paying taxes. A lot of our young people don't get a say at all. Victoria has already acknowledged the cultural authority of our young people in its treaty process by including all First Nations people over the age of 16 on the roll. This sets a precedent 
for the inclusion of our young people in the decisions that impact our people. Young First Nations people are the key to our survival. It's not our future, it's their future. And we must do the right thing by giving them a voice on their journey towards their Thank you, future. Senator. Senator Cox. At citizenship requires rights, identity and participation. And all of these have been eroded over time in this country by a partisan politicking. We know that membership of the major parties is on the decline and the trend is evident in many liberal democracies. Well, here's an opportunity for them. Get on board with lowering the voting age and start listening to young people and taking them seriously. And you never know, they might just join one of your parties. The Greens have long advocated for lowering the voting age to 16 and have introduced legislation at federal, state and territory levels to make this a reality. The simple act of lowering the voting age would demonstrate a strong commitment to young people of this country, our next generation. It is their future that is at stake, after all. Young people across this country have been taking action for years now, telling politicians that we are in a climate emergency. The least the parliament can do, if it's not going to listen and take swift, meaningful action to transition this country to net zero, is to actually give those young people the right to vote and vote you out of here. The core principle of representative democracy is that, through democratic participation, representatives who can draw on their expertise, knowledge and opinions of their constituents when forming policy and making decisions. Young constituents have very valuable knowledge, interests and experience that should actually be recognised. Those who argue against lowering the voting age uh, claim that 16 and 17 year olds are closer to uh, children than adults in terms of their ability to reason and make sound decisions, and I've certainly seen that in my time here. Young people do not lack political knowledge, cognitive cap uh, capacity, good judgment and maturity that's needed to engage in their democracy. In fact, they have all of those things. Many people, uh, our young people, um, need the right to vote, and we should be giving it to Thank them. You, Thank you, Senator. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. More countries around the world are recognising the importance of providing young people with the right to vote. A few days ago, the New Zealand Supreme Court ruled that the voting age being set to 18 was discriminatory. I hope that the conversations that are now happening in New Zealand will also renew debate in this country regarding our voting rules. Young people are informed, thoughtful and increasingly politically engaged. Our national curriculum includes comprehensive civics and citizenship education, which all of our young people have completed by year 10. They should also have the right to participate actively in our electoral process. Instead, they are being actively excluded from participating in decisions about their own futures, the outcome of which may not even be seen by some older Australians, only those young Australians who didn't make them. The Greens have supported lowering the voting age for many years, with my Senator, Senate colleague Jordan Steele-John introducing a bill in 2018. At 16, young people can work, pay taxes, have children and make medical decisions about their bodies. The ability for young people to be charged as adults and be subject to imprisonment in adult facilities demonstrates the disconnect between their responsibilities and the lack of opportunity to vote. Ignoring this suite of responsibilities whilst refusing to allow young people the opportunity to contribute to participate in the electoral process actively undermines the rights of young people in this country. Young people are currently facing a cost of living crisis, a rental market that's unaffordable, and they're going to be the ones most impacted by the climate crisis. Young people are more than capable of voting on issues that matter to them, care deeply about these issues, and need to be involved in decisions relating to their futures. Thank you, Senator. The Senate will now. Oh, sorry. The time for this discussion has expired. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Cash, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported?
Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Cash. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And as we all know, life is full of great ironies, and I have to say, one of the ironies that will soon become apparent later today is in the same week that the Australian Parliament is setting up a national anti-corruption commission, the Albanese government will formally hand over to the most militant union in Australia the construction industry with the formal abolition mm. of the ABCC. That is right. Okay. One of life's great ironies. Over this hand, stand up today. There will be a press conference tonight. Mr Albanese will say, my government has put in place a national anti-corruption commission. But at the same time, what he'll conveniently forget to tell Australians is, within about 48 hours, his government will also abolish the building industry watchdog and again officially hand the building sector in Australia over to John Setka. He's rubbing his hands. Got a bit to say about him shortly. The most militant union in Australia. But it's not really ironic. I say that tongue in cheek. And why is it not ironic? Because one only has to look at the amount of money that the Australian Labor Party has received from the most militant union in Australia and the MUA over the past 20 years. Now, one might ask, well, how much money is that? Well, let's have a look. $16.3 million has gone directly from the most militant union in Australia and the MUA into the Australian Labor Party's coffers. So it should not come as a surprise, colleagues, when I say that the CFMMEU was one of Labor's biggest financial donors in 2020-2021, providing them with almost $1 million in payments. So total union funds to the Australian Labor Party, headed up at this point in time by Prime Minister Albanese, financial year 18 through to 20, 19 million three hundred and five thousand eight hundred and six dollars. So again, it is a little ironic that with a vote this afternoon, the Labor Party establishes a National Anti-Corruption Commission. We won't talk about the fact that officials from registered organisations are exempt from certain parts, because that would be union officials. But at the same time, the irony is they will shortly abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission and hand the building and construction industry over to the most militant union in Australia. Now, why is this actually an issue? Well, let's have a look at what CFMMEU Victorian Secretary John Setka said recently, as reported. He said he was actually, colleagues, you'll be unsurprised, mm -hmm. impressed by Tony Burke's move oh. to scrap the ABCC and the building code. Right. And I quote, in a letter to members as reported on the 28th of October 2022, he said this, without going the early crow, I'm hoping that this government is going to be different from the Rudd-Gillard governments. And from what I've seen so far, I'm quietly confident. Our next EBA negotiations are now not going to be restricted to shit clauses, and we'll have the power to go after non-union sites. And I give credit to Mr Setka, and it's not often I do, because at least Mr Setka has called out the blindingly obvious thank you very much from John Setka of the CFMMEU to Mr Albanese, Mr Burke, and those that give money directly into the Labor Party's coffers. But what's of more concern is this. When it comes to handing the building industry over to the most militant union in Australia, let's just remind ourselves of why it is so dangerous for women. Because those on the other side will stand up and say they have the best interests of women in Australia at heart with all of their policies. Well, I have to say, again, one of life's ironies, given the following. The lawless activities of John Secker's CFMMEU include alleged threats to kill, rape and sexually assault women. CFMEU official jailed for assault once told a female inspector she was an effing SLUT, asking her if she had brought knee pads as, and I quote, you are going to be sucking on these effing dogs all day. A second CFMEU official made three phone calls late night to a female inspector's mobile phone 
The last call logged at 11.23 p.m. One caller said, you are an effing rat. Another caller said, me and my seven mates are going to come and eff you. But guess what? None of that actually matters because the money has flowed from the most militant union into the ALP's coffers, tune of millions and millions of dollars. It's time now to pay the paymaster, and that is exactly what Mr Albanese is doing. Shame. Senator Sheldon. Well, isn't it interesting? You know, here we have the Liberal Party and the LMP talk about, Liberal, talk about donations. Of course, what they don't talk about is Jerry Hansen, who has given at least $175,000 to the Liberal Party in donations since 2014. And this is a great person who's standing by women's rights. Because Marinika Human, a 27-year-old German backpacker, fell to her death on a Hansen work site in October 2016. Hansen was fined $60,000 for health and safety violations. Now, there have been multiple media reports about allegations of Hansen Proprietary Limited being involved in sham contracting and underpayments to workers. But where was the ABCC? Nowhere to be found, because that would have meant that you had to go after one of the Liberal Party donors. Heaven forbid if that had happened. Now let's go actually look at what's been happening with regards to the ABCC. And don't worry about what I've got to say. Let's start, talk about, let's start talking about what a number of judges have to say, because it's very enlightening. Because they've said, they've said the ABCC and Justice North in 2017-18 blasted the ABCC for prosecuting two CFM MEU officials for having a cup of tea with a mate. Get that? Teagate. They had to start spending tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of dollars on someone having a cup of, a cup of tea. And the judge went on to say this is a minuscule insignificant affair. Went on to say this is all external forces that are beating up what's just really an ordinary situation that amounts to virtually nothing. And went on to say further, for goodness sake, I don't know what the ins inspectorate is doing. When the ABCC used public resources, it went on to say, to bring the bar down to this level, it really calls into question the exercise of discretion to proceed. The fact is there are organisations, and they say there should be organisations, to hold employers to account and everybody else to account on what happens on building sites, workplaces, companies, corporations and this parliament. Because that's one of the things that's really important. Because what we didn't see is the positive duty of care support to prevent sexual harassment for respected work from the opposition. Of course, they didn't want to, the coalition didn't want to support that. They didn't want to support that, of course they didn't want to support it. Because it's not about supporting people, it's about supporting people like Jerry Hansen. They don't want to support industrial manslaughter laws, where 154 construction workers died between 2016 and 2020. Because that would be holding people like Jerry Hansen, those sorts of people, to account. They don't want to do that. That's just too difficult. Because what they want to do, as Justice Kerr said, slamming the ABCC in 2021, described a case for the ABCC over-egging, its case and being a battleship in full steam, which are difficult in turning, conducting proceedings as a, as a blood sport. That's what they described, a judge described in 2021, Justice Kerr, of the ABCC's approach. But don't worry, it's some even more recent cases. In 2022, Justice Katzman discussed to criticise the ABCC for misrepresentation of evidence and filing court proceedings that were unnecessarily inflammatory. And of course, then you go to the ABCC, $488,000 pursuing Lend-Lease over Eureka Flags. Then you go to $495,000 unsuccessfully pursuing a union because they demanded a woman's toilet on the work site. So you've got the cup of tea, you've got the toilet gate, you've got tea gate, and you've got flag gate. And they're spending a pile of money which judge after judge has said is inappropriate and immaterial. This does not actually turn around, but don't worry. They want to tell us that this is all about productivity. The opposition tells us this is about productivity. Well, let's look at what the productivity has actually been in the construction industry. And you won't be surprised that the productivity during the period the ABC has been in existence is labour productivity down 2.4 per cent 
in 2017-18. Or maybe they might get their act together and it will improve. Labor productivity down 2.6 per cent in 2018-19. Maybe you think the productivity might even you know, they might have got a crescendo of good productivity, because for 2019-20 it went down another 2.6 per cent. Of course, outside the time when the ABCC has been there, productivity has been improving because companies are about improving their arrangements, improving their skills, improving their performance, rather than just turning around and beating the, beating the drum on behalf of the government. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Henderson. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, there are giants in politics, and one of those giants was former Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke. If he was alive today, he would be disgusted. Disgust, disgusted that this Labor government, led by the most extreme left-wing Prime Minister in living memory, is pushing through some of the most extreme IR laws, which will set our country backwards, cost thousands of jobs and put our small and medium-sized businesses at the mercy of unscrupulous unions. He would be disgusted that this nation is now run by the unions, because that is exactly what is happening here. He would be disgusted that this Labor government was not putting the interests of Australians first. In 1983, he forged the historic accord between Labor and the ACTU in collaboration with business. He kept the unions at bay, in stark contrast to this Labor government, which, despite the gravest of concerns being raised by every employer group in the country, is determined to serve their paymasters at any cost. If Labor's extreme changes would force pa pattern bargaining onto a large part of the economy, we're in the best inch of us, Australia. Anthony Senator Albanese Henderson. would not have Senator kept Henderson. this dirty, rotten Senator plan. Senator Henderson, would you mind taking your seat for a moment? I would just like to remind senators that uh, senators should be heard in silence, and it is disorderly to keep interjecting. Senator Henderson, you have the call. If Labor's extreme changes, which force pattern bargaining onto a large part of the economy, were in the best interests of Australia, Mr Albanese would not have kept this dirty, rotten plan a secret before the election. The abolition of the ABCC is another step into the dark ages, demonstrating that the unions are running the show. And, and in the case of the abolition of the ABCC, it's all about propping up the CFMMEU. Bob Hawke had the guts to deregister the rogue BLF, and in 2016 he said the unions need to clean up their act and get their house in order. It is just appalling. He said, I would not tolerate it. You know what I did with the BLF? I would throw out the CFMEU. And as we've heard from Senator Cash, things have just got worse. The ALP is receiving, on average, nearly a million dollars a year of donations from the CFMEU and the MUA, and that's been the case over the past two decades. The abolition of the ABCC is nothing more than payback. Total union funds to the ALP since 18 to 20 financial year 18 to 20 are almost 20 million dollars. The fact of the matter is that Mr Albanese is too weak to stand up to John Setka and the CFMMEU, and he's already given in to this demand. What else is next? Labor is turning a blind eye to the findings from royal commissions and countless rulings from the courts, which have highlighted the lawlessness and intimidation of the union and the need for strong workplace regulations. Labor is happy to hand the keys to the front gate and lunchrooms at building sites back to the CFMU. It is an absolute disgrace. It is a scandal. It is a scandal that officials from registered organisations, of course, including union officials, are exempt from the National Anti-Corruption Commission. It is a scandal that, despite the appalling treatment of women on building sites, that the, uh, that the uh, Labor government is working hand in glove with this union. And let me remind all senators here today that the High Court has found that the CFMEU was a serial offender which engages in whatever action and makes whatever threats it wishes without regard to the law. 
It has contravened the laws on approximately 150 occasions. It was well resourced, and these fines are just the cost of doing business. The lawlessness on building sites when the CFMEU was in charge are frightening. The ABCC did so much important work to make sure that the interests of all Australians came first. It is an absolute disgrace that this Labor government hasn't got the guts to stand up to the lawlessness of the likes of the CFMEU, unlike the, one of the giants of the Labor Party, Bob Hawke. And as I say, he would be rolling in his grave if he could see how this Labor government has diminished the best interests of all Australians. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Grogan. Well, I stand here proudly to reaffirm our intention to abolish the ineffective and the highly politicised ABCC. It has promoted the coalition's objective of maintaining an adversarial industrial relations system with low wage rises as a deliberate design feature. The Labor government believes agreements can be reached on work sites and that we can obtain a balance. We know that there are employers out there who are raring to take advantage of Labor's industrial relations policies. They don't want this ideological mud wrestling that we've got going on here, all of this yelling and shouting and carrying on and highlighting small parts of particular areas rather than looking overall at what these changes will do. They don't have any respect for workers, but not all employers want to crush workers. That is just not true, but it is what those opposite would have us believe. The ABCC is intentionally adversarial, with no real traction or outcomes to speak of. Only a handful of the current Australian Building and Construction Commission legal cases actually involve some of the core things they were set up for. They don't involve underpayment to a worker. They don't involve delayed payments to a subcontractor. What they involve, in the main, is the prosecution of union officials and delegates. Or should I say the persecution? Because the ideological manner in which they roll is unforgivable. Did the ABCC recover wages for workers? No. Totaled 5.9 million in seven years. We compare this 5.9. Let's just compare this 5.9 million in seven years to the 530 million that the Fair Work Ombudsman recovered in one year alone, or even the 17 million that the CFMMEU recovered in just six months. I think we can see quite clearly where their priorities are. The ABCC is an ineffective and a waste of taxpayer money. It's been a disaster for productivity in the sector and it's done little to, to, to deal with any of the exploitation of workers that we have seen. The productivity data, which uh, Senator Sheldon went through before, let's just have a little revisit there, shall we? Declined every single year while the ABCC was the regulator pre-pandemic. Every year, a decline. Every year, a decline of over 2 per cent. 2.4 in 2017-18, 2.6 in 2018-19, and 2.6 again in 2019-20. So we have productivity fail. We have wage theft recovery fail. So how did they go on the prosecution? Now, my colleague went through some of those cases. Let me just tell you how much those cases that Senator Sheldon referred to cost. The Eureka flags. So basically, having a flag or a few stickers on a work site is such a major drama for the ABCC that they, that they spent over 488,000 pursuing Lend-Lease over it. And then we had the issue of the women's toilet on a work site, which was pursued at a total cost of $495,000. 
And as for the tea cup of tea, well, that's, that's just ridiculous. And I will just point to the, uh, the judge said, I hold the clear view that this case where the ABC should publicly be publicly exposed as having wasted public money without any proper basis for doing so. So the ABC see, is a waste of time and a waste of money. And the hostility against the rank and file workers in the CFMMEU is deplorable. The CFMMEU is an amalgamation of a great many unions, many with their own very proud histories. And I do not stand here for one moment and defend any illegal activities, but I will tell you that those workers, those union members, are out there. They represent the solidarity of thousands of hard-working Australians across a vast range of industries that Australians order, rely on. Order, senators. And those opposite undermine the thousands of hard-working unionists, hard-working people in Australia working in industries that our country thank relies you, on. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I've got no issue with unions. My father was a member of a union, a proud member of a union. My mother was. My sister is. I've got no issue with unions whatsoever. But this, pro this country has a problem with the construction division, the construction division of the CFMEU. The construction division. So there's been a lot of talk about judges, etc. I just want the people listening to this debate to listen what our highest court said. So the highest court in the land is the High Court of Australia. Our seven most preeminent judges. This is what they said about the construction division of the CFMEU. These aren't the words of a politician from either government or opposition. This is our highest court in the land about the construction division of the CFMEU, and it tells you everything you need to know about why we need the Australian Building and Construction Commission as the cop on the beat in terms of construction sites in this country. And this is what the High Court said, and I quote from paragraph 43 of their judgment in the Patterson case. The CFMEU's continuing defiance of the law indicates that it regards the penalties previously imposed as an acceptable cost of doing business. End quote. Those aren't my words. They aren't the member, words of a member of the Senate government benches in the Senate. They're the words of our highest court in the land. And in those circumstances, in those circumstances, why would you possibly think it's a good idea to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission? There was talk about the success rate of the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Everyone listening to this debate, you can look up their latest annual report and it provides all the details you need to see. In terms of the court proceedings they initiated during the 12 months ending 30 June 2022, they had a 100 per cent success rate. 100 per cent. They won every single case. So in every single case where they brought proceedings, the independent court found that in particular the CFMEU construction division had broken the law. Had broken the law. So in those circumstances, why would you possibly think it would be a good idea to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission? Well, I will tell you why. I will tell you why. Because if you go to page 44 of the annual report of the Australian Building and Construction Commission, you'll see a reference there to a Mr. Michael Rabbar. Mr Michael Rapper. He's a he was a senior official of the CFMEU construction division and he sat, I'm not sure if he still does, but he, he certainly did sit on the national executive of the Australian Labor Party. Exactly. Yes. He was sitting on their national executive, Mr Michael Rapper. What did he do? And let's let's read about Mr Michael Rapper. And I'll go to the footnote. But senators in this place know I like to go to the footnotes. In September 2021, Mr Rabbar abandoned his application with the Fair Work Commission to renew his federal right of entry permit, which gives him the right to go into construction sites, and he's no longer authorised to exercise any such entry rights. In accordance with the Fair Work Act, the Australian Building and Construction Commissioner intervened in the proceeding, arguing Mr Rabbar was not a fit and proper person to hold such a permit. Not a fit and proper person to hold a right of entry permit to go into construction sites. Why? Because, and again I quote, 
In opposing the application for the permit, the commissioner submitted that under Mr Rabbar's watch, so this is a, a senior official of the CFMEU and also either a previous or current member of the ALP National Executive, under Mr Rabbar's watch, the Queensland Division and its officials had contravened industrial law on 175 occasions. 175 occasions. And this fellow was sitting on the national executive of the Australian Labor Party. It's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. Do you know the situation got so bad in Queensland that workplace health and safety inspectors, who had the statutory obligation to go on the construction sites and make sure those construction sites were adhering to workplace health and safety laws, it got so bad in Queensland the workplace health and safety inspectors went on strike yep. Because they were concerned about their own personal safety from the CFMEU. That's how bad it is. That is how bad it is. And yet, in the face of all that objective evidence, in the face of that judgment from the highest court in the land, the Australian Labor Party wants to abolish the ABCC. It's shameful. Thank you very much, Senator Scar. The time for discussion has expired. I'll now proceed to the consideration of documents. Documents are listed on page three of today's order of business. There being no contributions, I will now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Pratt. Acting President, pursuant to order and at the request, or request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present two reports from legislation committees as listed at item 14 on today's order of business with respect to the 2022-23 budget estimates together with accompanying documents. I also a table also table additional information concerning earlier estimates hearings. Thank you Senator Pratt. <laughs> One more. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's fifth report of 2022. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, is there a report from the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards, I present the final report of the committee together with accompanying documents. And I move that the Senate take note of the report. Mr Acting Deputy President, this week marks one year since the release of Set the Standard, the report of the, on the independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces by the Australian Human Rights Council's Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Commissioner Kate Jenkins. I again acknowledge the work of Commissioner Jenkins uh, in that report. The Set the Standard report made 28 recommendations to ensure that our parliament is a workplace that is safe and respectful. The former government committed to implementing all 28 of those recommendations, as did the then opposition. A multi-party parliamentary leadership task force chaired by Kerry Hartland was established by the former government to oversee implementation of the recommendations, and I was honoured to be a member of that task force in the last parliament. The first recommendation of Set the Standard was to deliver a joint statement of acknowledgement one which was delivered to this parliament on the first sitting day of this year. It was a key outcome from the first meeting of the task force. The former government also oversaw the passing of legislation to provide additional protections to staff of parliamentarians and established this very select committee on parliamentary standards pursuant to further recommendations. We also commissioned a comprehensive review of the Members of Parliament Staff Act 1984 and that review has since reported. Implementation of these recommendations, built on the changes already introduced following the Foster Review of the Parliamentary Workplace, which the former government commissioned. The former government also extended funding for the important Parliamentary Workplace Support Service and provided extra funding for the Parliamentary Support Line. This was constructive work with colleagues across Parliament to make the changes needed to ensure our workplace is safe, supportive and respectful. This report, I hope, demonstrates that such constructive work is continuing, with our response to the Set the Standard recommendation to enact codes of conduct for appropriate behaviour in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces that would be underpinned by an independent investigation and enforcement mechanism. As we know, 
our own Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces have not been safe and respectful places for all. Our overarching principles as members of the committee in our committee deliberations and recommendations in this report have been that everyone who visits or works in a CPW or a Commonwealth parliamentary workplace should be safe and respected. Through our report, we say to all the people who contributed to set the standard report, thank you. We heard you. We believe you. We are responding to you. And those generous, brave disclosures have meant something because they will help to protect others. Mr Acting Deputy President, this committee heard unanimous support for codes of conduct to establish safe and respectful workplaces. Our evidence came from a broad range of contributors with varied experiences and perspectives, and I thank them for their contributions. In this report, we have drafted three codes. Firstly, behaviour standards for all CPWs that set standards that any or everyone entering those workplaces should meet and remind everyone that the purpose of the parliament is for the free exchange of ideas in a respectful and professional manner. A behaviour code for staff that sets the standards by which all employees contribute to a safe and respectful workplace and outlines prohibited behaviours but also goes further to outline the need for a more diverse and inclusive workplace. A behaviour code for parliamentarians that largely mirrors the staff code but also outlines the employer obligations for safe and respectful workplaces as well as the, expo expect hmm, as well as the expectations for how parliamentarians interact with each other in the course of fulfilling their elected role. It was clearly enunciated to us that without a confidential, independent and serious investigative body with an effective sanctions regime, these codes will not be able to drive the long-term cultural change that is needed. In our report, the committee strongly supports the recommendation to establish an independent parliamentary standards commission as proposed in the Set the Standard report, along with a range of sanctions. The committee has also put forward recommendations that guidance material and training accompany these new codes. This is crucial to ensuring that the codes become part of everyday practice, setting clear standards of behaviour in all Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces. As the chair of the Joint Select Committee, Sharon Clayton, the member for Newcastle, said in the other place today, I note that this parliament is not alone in finding this a difficult task. Several past Australian parliaments have tried to address this issue, and despite forming an agreement that codes of conduct or a code of conduct was necessary, they failed to develop one. Indeed, the parliament has been considering codes for almost half a century. In 1975, a report on declaration of interests noted that a meaningful code of conduct should exist in the Australian parliament. In 1993, 2008, 2011 and 2012, the Australian Parliament again tried and again failed to introduce codes of conduct. So we know that we're not alone in this parliament in finding these issues uh, sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes challenging. And it is difficult uh, in, a, uh, in a place of this nature occasionally to try to bring those many disparate views together, but we have endeavoured to rise to the challenge. Through these proposed behaviour codes, uh, we have responded to the message of the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Ms Jenkins, in relation to setting the standard. This committee has worked very hard in the last few months to deliver this report. I want to thank the Secretariat particularly for their hard work, particularly in a very compressed time frame. I want to thank the Chair, the Member for Newcastle, Sharon Clayton, for her leadership of this important process and for her collegiate and constructive approach. It's not possible to produce a report of this nature and deliver the outcomes with which we were charged without that chairing approach, and I am particularly grateful. I also acknowledge my friends and colleagues, Senator Claire Chandler and the Member for Forest, Ms Nola Marino both the coalition members of the Joint Select Committee. Can I say that uh, COVID-19 
brought us many things, Mr Acting Deputy President, including online committee meetings. But for a Western Australian member, and you may appreciate this, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, for a Western Australian member in daylight saving, <laughs> I don't think they were ever meant to start an online meeting at 4.30 a.m., which is what has happened to the member for Forrest in the last uh, short time. So thank you, Nola, for your patience with we eastern seaboarders. Mr Acting Deputy President, this report is a very important report for this parliament. Uh, it's a place in which I have worked, both as a staff member uh, and a senator, for a long time. That doesn't bear repeating. But I do think that, as a parliament, what we have seen and had to address in the last year has had a very significant impact, no question, on the perceptions of the parliament itself. And I find that profoundly disappointing. I was very pleased to be asked to take on the role of deputy chair of this committee, a joint select committee on parliamentary standards, because if in some way I can contribute to setting that to rights, then I am honoured to have had that responsibility. I commend the report to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator Fariki. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As a member of the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards, I rise to speak to the final report of the committee, which was tasked with the job of developing codes of conduct for parliamentary precincts, parliamentarians and staff. Between these three codes, all parliamentarians, staff, people who work and visit Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces are covered. The recommendation to develop codes of conduct came out of the review of parliamentary workplaces undertaken by Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins. Set the standard was the report, which revealed the toxic culture of our workplace, where so many did not feel safe. It's one year ago that this report was released. I want to pay tribute to and acknowledge the people who work in this place, current and former for their exceptional courage in speaking up about the broken culture in here, which has allowed bullying, harassment, sexual assault, racism, and discrimination to go on in our workplace. The highest office in this country should have been leading the way on safe and respectful workplaces. Instead, people have been harmed and hurt here. I particularly want to thank the many staff, and especially those from marginalized and targeted communities who spoke frankly and bravely about their experiences and what needs to change in here. That can't have been easy, but their bravery is now paving the way for much needed change. This report with its accompanying behavior codes is the culmination of a great deal of hard work, time and effort, not just by those on the committee, and the committee secretariat, who of course do some incredible work, but so many others through the years who have highlighted the toxic culture of this workplace and provided feedback on how this can and should be changed. The behavior codes represent a big part of what was missing in order to set a high standard of respect and safety, and clearly naming behavior which is unacceptable and which will not be tolerated in here under any circumstances. The Jenkins report was a devastating indictment of the culture in this place and revealed just how unsafe parliamentary workplaces have been for so long. A staggering 51% of people working in parliamentary workplaces have experienced at least one incident of bullying, sexual harassment, or actual or attempted sexual assault. One in three parliamentary staffers who participated in the review said they had been sexually harassed. A quarter of those who said they were sexually harassed by a single harasser said that the perpetrator was a parliamentarian. And nearly two-thirds of female politicians reported having been sexually harassed. The Set the Standard report referenced multiple examples of discrimination experienced by First Nations people, people of color, people with disability, and LGBTQI plus people. 
These experiences included daily exclusion and microaggressions, bullying, role segregation, and a lack of psychological safety. Participants shared that identifying as different from the norm in these workplaces is inherently unsafe. The report also found that the underrepresentation in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces of First Nations people, people of color, LGBTQI plus people, and people with disability as parliamentarians and in other roles across the workplace is linked to systemic inequality and lack of power and creates a conducive environment for bullying, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. And I must say, as a member of one of these groups, with the lived experience of the seer of intersexing, intersecting sexism and racism, and someone who has had a lifelong mission of eliminating discrimination based not only on gender, but also discrimination against marginalized minority groups. Developing behavior standards and codes that explicitly addressed this was quite personal. The work of the last few months has been some of the hardest and most emotional, as well as rewarding for me. And I will admit that it does take its toll. I know that there are many like me in our community whose workplaces have been fundamentally unsafe for them. We heard from witnesses, witness after witness about the need to name and, and the power of naming unacceptable behavior over and above basic references to bullying and harassment. Professor Tim Supermasan noted that there was particular power in naming things in instruments like codes of conduct and that any code, if it is going to be fit for purpose in a contemporary workplace or institution, pays attention to the different forms of harassment, bullying and discrimination. Professor Tim Subhamasan also stated that having a robust code of conduct that pays serious attention to diversity, equality and inclusion may help in ensuring that the parliament over time will be more representative and reflective of the Australian society that it serves. Democracy in Colour agreed that it was incredibly important that other forms of discrimination are listed explicitly alongside gender-based discrimination within the code. Fair Agenda stated Intersectionality is really core to having a proper and robust code that would reflect the expectations of the public. The Human Rights Law Center spoke of the importance of Parliament setting a higher standard of behavior for the whole country, not just with respect to gender-based violence, but with regard to other forms of discrimination and abuse, including racism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia. The Australian Muslim Advocacy Network raised similar issues noting how racist political speech impacted not only on the parliamentary workplace and the accessibility of a parliamentary career to diverse candidates, but on public discourse and the rise of hate crime and violent ideological extremism. I am really glad that in response to these findings, the report has acknowledged the intersections of discrimination that further marginalize First Nations people, people of color, disabled people, and LGBTQI plus communities, and each of the three codes explicitly prohibit discrimination on these grounds. The report also recommends that parliamentarians should have mandatory training in safe and respectful workplaces, people management and inclusive leadership, including anti-racism, disability discrimination and First Nations cultural awareness training. This training will be crucial in creating a culture that respects and values diverse people as well as challenging entrenched power and privilege. The effectiveness of the codes will be very much determined by the enforcement structures that support them. Those who breach the codes must be held accountable with proportionate sanctions. This is absolutely necessary to drive behavioral change, to encourage complainants to come forward and to instill greater public confidence in the codes. The advisory and enforcement regime to support the codes has yet to be established, but I strongly recommend the sanctions as recommended by the Jenkins report. These codes, unanimously agreed by the committee, show that we are serious about stopping misconduct and unacceptable behavior, and that they will make it easier for people to report such behavior. I urge the Parliament to swiftly endorse these behavior codes and to then adopt them as soon as the investigative and enforcement mechanisms have been established. I also urge the government to commence work on developing codes of conduct which address issues of integrity and democracy. 
While this work fell outside our committee's remit of preparing codes to make this a safer and more respectful place for those who work and visit here, it is clear that Parliament needs stronger standards when it comes to integrity and ethics. I sincerely hope these behaviour codes also help in our Parliament becoming more representative of the community that we serve. Parliament is one of the most protected, secure buildings in this country, and yet so many people have not been safe here. Women, First Nations people, people of colour, people with disability, and LGBTQI plus people. High behaviour standards will make Parliament safer and more welcoming to these cohorts. We should be leaders in creating a decent workplace, one where everyone feels safe, respected and valued. These behaviour codes take us one step closer to becoming such a workplace. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Ayres, did you want to make a contribution? I only wanted to indicate um, the government's uh, support for, uh, for the uh, report, uh, but also just wanted to, to thank uh, Senator Payne for her comments uh, and, uh, and uh, thank the members of the committee, including uh, Senator Payne and the Chair, uh, Sharon Clayton, MP, uh, member for Newcastle. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Payman. On the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards report? No. Okay. There being no other reports, we'll turn to delegation reports. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to present a delegation report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move that Senate take note. Oh, sorry, I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the 145th Interparliamentary Union Assembly at Kigali, Rwanda, which took place from the 11th to the 15th of October uh, this year. And I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the document. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, I move that the Senate take note of the document. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Today I, I speak about the report uh, that I'm tabling for the 145th Interparliamentary Union Assembly which, as I said, was held on the 11th to the 15th of October this year. I was greatly honoured to be selected um, as an IPU delegate for the Australian Parliament and to be uh, part of the delegation which did travel to Kigali, Rwanda, to participate in the 145th IPU Assembly. The delegation was led by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Hon. Milton Dick, MP, and uh, I joined the delegation and was accompanied by the Hon. Warren Ench MP, Senator Fatima Payman, who I see here in the chamber, and Dr Gordon Reid MP. Firstly, I'd like to most sincerely thank both Jane Thompson and Tony Amatulik uh, from the Senate Department for all of their work organising the delegation visit and also for the preparation of this outstanding report. The IPU itself brings together uh, parliamentarians from around the globe to promote peace, democracy and sustainable development. And it also provides an important forum for Australian parliamentary representatives to contribute to contemporaneous global discussions. The IPU itself was founded in 1889 and there are currently 178 parliaments who are members of the IPU and an additional 14 associate members. It really does offer an, a unique opportunity for delegates to meet with their international counterparts. And the Australian delegation this time met with delegations from New Zealand, Fiji, Timor-Leste, Canada and Britain, and also held bilateral meetings with delegations from Afghanistan, Georgia and Serbia. The topic of this year's general debate was absolutely uh, spot on in terms of its relevance. It was about gender equality and gender sensitive parliaments as drivers for a more resilient and peaceful world. It was both interesting and very practical. We also engaged in very fruitful discussions, uh, considering a rights-based gender response approach to migration, uh, as well as methods to address the root causes of human trafficking and also to ensure survivor-centric anti-trafficking legislation, something that I am particularly um, passionate about uh, throughout my uh, time here in the Australian Senate. 
The Senate also, the Assembly, sorry, also adopted a very strong resolution condemning Russia's military occupation uh, of the sovereign Ukraine territory and human rights violations perpetrated in the Ukraine territory following the Ru Russian invasion. And I'm also very proud to say that when the Russian uh, delegates spoke, the Australian uh, representatives walked out uh, with the Ukrainian delegations in a very visible show of support. It was a privilege to address the 34th session of the Forum of Female Parliamentarians and also the Standing, Democracy, Standing Committee on Democracy and Human Rights. And on behalf of Australia, I put forward a proposal to combat the global issue of orphanage trafficking, which was accepted for consideration by the Standing Committee. Uh, the response of other parliamentarians from around the world was immediate and was incredibly positive. The proposal, my proposal will be put forward as a formal resolution to the 146th IPU Assembly in Bahrain next year and then will be formally adopted at the 147th IPU in October next year. And I'm greatly honoured now to have been selected or appointed as a co-rapporteur for the resolution and I'm now working alongside colleagues from other parliaments to raise awareness of this issue, to prepare a package of material for parliamentarians so that they can start tackling this insidious form of trafficking. Uh, for those in this chamber who have not heard me speak about orphanage trafficking previously, it is a particularly insidious form of 21st century trafficking that we have created through our naivety but also through our compassion to assist orphans and children who are less well off. That has created uh, a multi-billion dollar criminal enterprise, a scam, uh, which is now trafficking up to eight million children uh, into orphanages so Australians and others can have an orphanage experience. So, in conclusion, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I would like to thank everybody um, on the delegation and particularly to Senator Payman, who very ably uh, took forward this motion. And I thank her for her enthusiasm and for her very persuasive words at the conference. And thank again, you, Senator Reynolds, your time has expired. Thank you very much. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, I'm pleased to speak on the report of the Australian Excuse Parliamentary— me, Senator, Senator Payman, uh, are you seeking oh. leave to speak to the report? To uh, present the report. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Yep. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, um, I'm, I'm pleased to speak on the report of the Australian Parliamentary delegation that participated in the 145th Interparliamentary Union Assembly which took place in Kigali, Rwanda, from 11 to 15 October 2022, as my colleague Senator Reynolds has already um, outlined. It was an absolute privilege to be representing Australia on the world stage, um, along with the Speaker, Mr Milton Dick, MP, Dr Gordon Reid, MP, uh, Mr Warren Ench and Senator, L uh, Senator Linda Reynolds. Delegates from various countries were quite impressed by Australia demonstrating its multiculturalism and representation in its elected members to parliament, both through cultural and age diversity. Um, as a young parliamentarian at the IPU, I had the opportunity to participate in the Assembly's general debate on the theme of gender equality and gender-sensitive parliaments as drivers of change for a more resilient and peaceful world. In my speech, I made the point that while women make up 54 per cent of all parliamentarians and comprise the majority of the Senate, which is a great achievement for women in Australia, we are not finished. Um, however, we need to do more to address the barriers that stand in the way of young women seeing politics as a legitimate career, um, as a legitimate career option and Parliament as a place that they will be welcomed, valued and encouraged. Dr Reid and I uh, also took the liberty as young parliamentarians to make the I Say Yes to Youth in Parliament pledge because we believe that young people deserve a seat at the decision-making table and need to represent the, the youth demographic who often fall through the cracks and with them remain groundbreaking ideas that ought to be listened to. 
Attending the IPU assembly provided an opportunity for Australian parliamentarians to participate in the various IPU committees and to meet international colleagues through, through bilateral meetings, um, which Senator Reynolds has already outlined, um, and to consider matters of mutual interest. For example, the collective effort of many democratic countries standing in solidarity with Ukraine to endorse um, the resolution calling for condemnation of the invasion of Ukraine and of the subsequent annexation of territories in defence of the territorial integrity of all states. This resolution emphasised the call for an immediate end to the Russian military occupation of sovereign Ukrainian territory, the restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity, uh, of acknowledging its internally recognised borders that extend to its territorial waters, and the rule of international law. Um, there was further condemnation of the serious violations of human rights perp perpetrated in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, Cherniv, and other regions of Ukraine. The resolution reinforces the creation of courts with special jurisdiction to investigate possible aggressions perpetrated and to hear cases of war crimes and human rights violations committed on Ukrainian territories. Um, and it was really good to see uh, the, the resolution calling upon all parliaments um, across the world to raise awareness among state authorities and civil society of the need to contribute to a solution to the human, humanitarian crisis involving the migration of six million Ukrainian citizens as refugees, um, to encourage the support and cooperation of international community in the process of reconstructing Ukraine, um, and to recognise that the war is impacting energy supply. Thus, we need to establish a commitment to climate change reduction targets. Um, so justice needs to be restored, and I'm proud to say that the Australian delegation wholeheartedly supported the resolution. Um, this trip to Rwanda allowed me to appreciate the importance of the IPU in bringing together parliaments and parliamentarians and to promote peace, democracy and sustainable development, and to provide a forum for Australian parliamentary representatives to contribute to global discussions. Um, it, w it also provided an opportunity for the Australian delegation, skillfully led by Mr Speaker, to, walk, to work towards uh, uh, advancement of issues of interest to Australia. Um, in this regard, I draw particular attention to the work of Senator Reynolds, who on behalf of the Australian delegation successfully secured support for a proposed resolution to prevent orphan trafficking and tourism. I thank uh, the Secretariat for their incredible work, along with the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Parliamentary Library. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Payman. The question for the chair is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, no. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. We'll now move to ministerial statements. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the Gabba Stadium project and modelling and analysis and legal advice relating to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Childcare Bill uh, 2022. Thank you, Senator Watts. The President has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Are those no? I think the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Indeed. The president has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the following bills without amendment the Health Legislation Amendment, Medicare Compliance and Other Measures Bill of 2022 and the Maritime Legislation Amendment Bill of 2022. Messages have also been received informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the following bills, the Privacy Legislation Amendment, Enforcement and Other Measures Bill of 2022 and the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 3 Bill of 2022 and the Treasury Laws Amendment Electric Car Discount Bill of 2022. Clark.
Government Business Order of the Day number one, National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and a related bill in Committee of the Whole. Senators, the committee is considering the National Anti-Corruption Bill of 2022 and a related bill and amendments 126 on sheet 1769 moved by Senator Pocock. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to amendments 5 and 6 on sheet 1769 moved by Senator Pocock. And I, I particularly want to draw the Senate's attention to amendment number 6. Um, uh, this is about ensuring, as best we can, the financial independence of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. I know from my experience in state politics with the New South Wales ICAC that one of the most effective ways the government of the day had of limiting the reach of that state anti-corruption body was to strangle its funding. And we've seen over the last decade in particular moves by the current coalition government in New South Wales to, to literally starve the, the Independent Commission Against Corruption of Funds and to do so with minimal, minimal public scrutiny. There is an oversight committee, a multi-party oversight committee for the, for the ICAC in New South Wales, and it has a retrospective role of reviewing the budget, um, the, the previous year's budget of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. Um, it doesn't have the capacity to review the draft budget, the budget estimates, and to make recommendations to the government of the day um, in, in the budget-making process. Now, in the Commonwealth sphere, we have a very good working model, being the, the role of the Public Finance Committee, a multi-party committee, that reviews the finances of the, um, the Audit Office. Um, and if we, we spoke to the Audit Office in the committee, and the Audit Office, admittedly speaking only from their experience and consciously, as good auditors will do, not not, not themselves extending their practice to, to the potential practice of the NAC Oversight Committee, but the Audit Office said that it has worked extremely well for the Audit Office and has required and has, and has been a key reason why we have a genuinely independent and adequately funded Audit Office at a federal level. And that's because that committee can review the budget estimates, make recommendations for the budget estimates, in the, in the budget process to ensure that the Audit Office has the funds it needs. What Senator Pocock's amendment is doing here is to say, well, if this oversight committee for the NAC undertakes that role, and, and we have amendments that would give that the explicit role for the committee, I understand that the government and the opposition may not support those amendments, but nevertheless acknowledge that there can be that proactive budget role in this committee, and we will address that when we get to it. What, what Senator Pocock's amendments propose to do is to say, if the committee makes a recommendation to the government about the NAC's finances, and the minister decides not to follow that recommendation, not to provide the funding in accordance with the committee's recommendation, then the minister has to explain him or herself. The minister has to explain themselves. Um, and and, and that is a key element of transparency. There are similar provisions that apply in other jurisdictions, most notably right here in Canberra. The ACT, Legislative Assembly's Oversight Committee, um, has this exact same process. A committee with a non-government chair, non-government majority, that oversights the budget of their um, anti-corruption commission, and when it makes a recommendation, if the Legislative Assembly, if, if the ACT government does not accept it, the, the, the Treasurer doesn't accept the, the budget recommendation, well, the Treasurer has to explain that to the House in the course of the budget. Um, we see it as a core transparency measure. And what I'd hope to hear from the government is, if, if they don't accept it in black and white, do they accept that that's the process that they expect to follow? That if the NAC Oversight Committee does make a recommendation about funding, without the being compelled to by this amendment, does the government expect that that's the practice that will follow um, in due course? 
once we get this NAC up and running. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Uh, Thanks, Senator uh, Smith and Acting Deputy President. I've addressed the government's position on this amendment uh, when we were dealing with it before the break. The question. There being no other contributions, uh, the question is that the amendments 1 to 6 on sheet 1769, moved by Senator Pocock, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I no. think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question, the question is that amendments 1 to 6 on sheet 1769, moved by Senator Pocock, be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I'll appoint 
Senator Chacon, tell her for the eyes. Sorry, so Senator Chacon, tell her for the nose. Oh, sorry, sorry, Senator, sorry, Senator Cardell, uh, tell her for the nose, and Senator McPocock, tell us for the eyes. The result of the division is 16 ayes and 30 noes, and the matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Senators. We'll continue in the committee stage. Just looking for a senator to move the next group of amendments. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Sorry, Mr. President. Uh, I, mo I move. Um, I move amendments. Where are we? Senator Lambie. Sorry, I move. I, sorry, sorry, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I move amendment one triple. One triple seven on sheet one. Great. Thank you very much, Senator Lambie. Uh, so the question before the chair is that amendment one on sheet one triple seven be agreed to. Senator Cash. I'm happy to uh, speak up. The government's amendments uh, we believe moved in the House of Representatives on journalist protection action um, is the consensus recommendation of the Joint Committee uh, regarding journalists, uh, and it is a position of, of the op opposition uh, that we believe that the government has got the balance right here and that the amendment that has been proposed is not required. Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. I might be missing something here, but I'm just it's trying to find— Oh, it's a new one. It's a new amendment. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we, will, we will be opposing the amendment as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Shoebridge. Um, thanks, Acting Jep Deputy President. And I want to thank Senator Lambie for bringing this issue to the Senate. Um, it's my understanding 
the concern that drives this amendment is, is to ensure there's adequate protections for journalism undertaking journalist activities within the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and the Special Broadcasting Service Corporation, ABC and the SBS. And, and I note that the um, I note that, the bill, that, that as a result of amendments in the other place, um, there have been um, increased protections for journalists um, from warrants being served that, that may be served on them um, um, under the NAC's powers to seek warrants. Um, and I'm glad to say, and, I, and I'm glad to see the, the attorney moved beyond the very narrow recommendations that came out of the committee to provide broader, broader protections for journalists in the amendments that the House adopted. They, they, were, they were amendments that um, I know myself and I believe the deputy chair of that committee, the member for Indi, uh, Dr Haynes, were seeking to have adopted in that committee. Um, we couldn't persuade the committee to move to adopt those greater protections, but I am glad to see the attorney nevertheless has adopted that, those greater protections for journalists from warrants. I also note that section clause 117 of the, um, of the bill um, expressly protects um, the premises of the ABC and the SBS um, from, um, from the operation of search warrants under the Act. So there is already express protections for the ABC and SBS in the Act. Our concern about the drafting of this amendment, and we, we accept it's been done in a great, great hurry, is that it, it potentially extends the protections I think we would all want to see for the ABC and the SBS to any Commonwealth agency and arguably anybody engaged in, and I'll, I'll read the amendment, the business of reporting news, presenting current affairs or expressing editorial or other content in news media, um, and arguably picks up any, any agency that has that kind of conduct in it. Now, that broad definition might include the media officers in prime ministers and cabinet. Um, and there would be occasions when we would want to ensure that the NAC could investigate what a media officer had put out if it was potentially trying to mask or hide corrupt conduct within PM PMNC. We'd say the same for the media unit of the Australian Federal Police. We would want to not ensure that we would want to ensure that isn't shielded from the operations of the NAC. And I accept that this amendment has come through very late, and I accept it hasn't had the benefit of going to the committee and being reviewed by the committee. But I'll, I'll, in its current format, it would potentially, and I think quite likely, exclude a whole series of um, employees and potentially agencies well beyond the ABC and the SBS that should be within the purview of the NAC. But I want to say expressly, from our, from our position, from the position of the Australian Greens, and I would hope that we get this echoed from the government and from the opposition, that individuals engaging in the practice and the profession of journalism within the ABC and within the SBS are not intended to be caught within the provisions of the NAC. They're challenging the, federal, they're challenging the government, potentially, publishing and reporting on documents that there may be some statutory secrecy to or some other kind of secrecy attached to, would not and should not bring journalists within the ABC or the SBS within the purview of the NAC. And I hope that that's the united position that we can adopt. And at least this amendment allows us to share that acknowledged position in the chamber. Senator Lambie. I would hope with this amendment, this, this, this is in a really grey area here. I know that we do have whistleblower legislation coming up, and if for some reason this gets mixed, that, that will be tackled up. I, I believe the Attorney General has made it quite clear he intends to get onto that very early on uh, next year. But I do believe this is a grey area when it comes to journalists, and that worries me considerably because without them, many things never come out into the open. So. I understand that we were probably not going to get the support from both the majors, and that is rowing, and journalists will have to put up with this over the Christmas period, and that is rowing in itself, rowing about whether or not they are going to end up at the NAC or in court eventually. So 
I am asking the government of the day if it is not going to be dealt with today and we can't get clear air in this, we sincerely or sincerely do the right thing and when you do the whistleblower legislation that it needs to be looked at very thoroughly. Minister. Um, thanks. Just to add to what I said before, my understanding is we've literally just received this amendment, um, so there hasn't been adequate time to even consider it. Um, so, well, Senator Lambie, you know, I don't think people just dump amendments on people and then expect them to vote for them. Um, so uh, we will not be supporting the amendment. And uh, I'm reading this amendment for the first time myself. Uh, what I can only come back to the general position, which is that the Commission will have the power to investigate systemic and serious corruption. Um, if behaviour does not amount to that, then uh, people have got nothing to be concerned about, whether they be journalists or anyone else. There being no other senators who wish to speak on that motion, I will put the motion, which is the amendment moved by Senator Lambie on sheet 1777, be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I move Greens Amendment Number One on sheet one seven one four. Um, this amendment seeks to remove the restraint on the National Anti-Corruption Commission um, in terms of holding public hearings, um, as as senators would know, the, the Labor Party took to the election the very simple proposition that the National Anti-Corruption Commission should be able to hold public hearings if the NAC thought it was in the public interest to hold public hearings. And that should be the test. And people voted on that basis in good faith. And then when we were first having discussions with the government, after the election, that seemed to be the position. But then somewhere along the line, between the election and now, something happened that flipped the government to now move to this higher threshold, which is contained in 73.2, which provides that the commissioner may decide to hold a hearing or part of a hearing in public if the commission is satisfied that exceptional circumstances justify holding a hearing and there's a public interest. The exceptional circumstances test, of course, is no doubt convenient to the opposition, um, who would love to see less public hearings. And we've suddenly seen some kumbaya between the government and the opposition on the whole issue of the NAC, once public hearings were shut down. Now, we heard from the, from the New South Wales ICAC, from the Victorian IBAC, that this is a test that should not be put into the NAC bill. The Victorian IBAC has it. They say don't repeat it. It doesn't work, ties them up with lawyers and prevents them doing the job. The New South Wales ICAC says they don't have it and they're very glad they don't have it because public hearings are a key way of fighting corruption. They bring out additional witnesses. They hold the institution itself to account. They hold anti-corruption commissions to account because they have to justify their conduct and their use of public resources and their dealing with witnesses in the full bright glare of public view. And that's, that's an integrity measure for integrity commissions. We heard from the inquiry a number of unsettling instances where state in integrity commissions had had private hearings over months and sometimes years where the witnesses felt oppressed, they felt like they weren't getting natural justice, and it was all happening in secret and they couldn't tell anyone about it. And pretty much all of the cases that I saw that were potentially disturbing about the way st state anti-corruption commissions operated came from private hearings where witnesses felt they could not defend themselves in public, they had their careers put at risk. Um, Councillors, we know, in Queensland have raised their concerns about private hearings of the Queensland Anti-Corruption Commission, and they've said that they were unfair. Having public hearings is not just good for the integrity of the broader, government, of, of the broader Commonwealth government and politicians, 
It's not just good for informing the public about what the bloody hell goes on in this place, but it's also good for holding anti-corruption commissions to account. And that's the lesson that the government and the opposition seem to be ignoring. And it's almost as though there's a calculus between the government and the opposition in this, that they'd rather one bad story on shutting down public hearings and squashing the NAC's ability to have public hearings, because they'll take that one bad story, because it'll protect business as usual in this place from the next 40 or 50 stories that will play out in public hearings as the real way in which federal politics is done is exposed in the NAC in the years that come. One bad story of shutting down the NAC shuts down 40 or 50 future bad stories in full public glare about how business is done in this place. That's the calculation that's been made by the major parties in this place. That's why the crossbench have been pretty much united in saying, let's have public hearings. Let's expose how business is really done at a Commonwealth level. That's why we move this amendment. It gets rid of exceptional circumstances. It reinstates Labor's promise in the election, and it's critical for the functioning of the NAC. Senator Lambie. Um, I, just want to, I just want to clarify something. So, um, I believe the NAC is supposed to be truly independent. Can you just, is that a yes or no? Is the NAC can truly independent? Minister. Yes. Order. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Sorry, thank you. So if the NAC is truly independent, then why are you putting um, restrictions on it when you say under, only under exceptional circumstances? You don't say that's dictating to how things would be. I just don't understand how you say it's independent on one side and then you dictate to it how it's going to be public hearings will be in exceptional circumstances. How does that possibly make it independent? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Lambie. Um, the discussion we were having about this bill before question time, and I don't think you were in the chamber at the point when this came up. Um, Senator Shoebridge was actually asking why we weren't prepared to put examples of what exceptional circumstances might be, and the, re the answer I gave him was that we wanted to preserve the Commission's independence by not set dictating to them or limiting them as to what the exceptional circumstances can be. So we're trying to strike the right balance here um, between providing the Commission with the measures that it requires. Uh, along with uh, making sure that uh, people involved in the Commission are given appropriate natural justice. Uh, we think that by granting the Commission power to have public hearings in exceptional circumstances without setting down exactly what those circumstances are and leaving it to the Commission to determine that for themselves is the appropriate balance. Senator Lambie. Uh, Okay, so you can't. Uh, when it comes to the exceptional circumstances, you can't. Um, so, if the if the shoe's on the other foot and it's it's a public hearing, you can't tell. So you can't tell me either what exceptional circumstance. Well, how, uh, how how does the commission itself? How does it interpret this to be exact? Seriously. I mean, why did you bother putting it in there then? Is it, is it just a fear thing, like you want most of the things done behind doors? Because that's how we understand it and that's how the public understands it. Minister. Um, well, Senator Lambie, I don't think that is how the public understands it. I think what the public understands is that for the very first time as a result of the change in government and with the support of the crossbench, uh, we are going to have a National Anti-Corruption Commission for the first time in this country. That's what I think the country understands. And I also think that the country understands that this commission will have the power to hold public hearings in, in exceptional circumstances. Um, we think that's an appropriate, appropriate threshold, uh, which reflects the significant nature of the power to compel a person to answer questions at a public hearing. Uh, it also reflects the sensitivities involved in holding public hearings. For example, the risk of prejudicing a future criminal investigation or trial, uh, and also the issues of reputational harm that may arise. But, but, but where the Commission um, considers there are ex exceptional circumstances that justify having a public hearing, then they will be able to do that. There being no other senators wishing. Oh, sorry, and uh, apologies, Senator Lambie. Senator Pocock was on his feet, so I'm going to give the. Uh, Senator Lambie, you have the call. So. Um just um, actually, do you want to get up? I'll come up after you. 
Can I get up? Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your uh, explanation. Can I just put on the record from the consultations that I've done across the ACT how disappointed people are with the Labor government to have promised an independent commission against corruption where public hearings will be held when in the public interest to now have done a deal with the opposition to insert exceptional circumstances where, as we've heard from experts like um, uh, Professor Toomey, it is almost impossible now for the, uh, for the NAC to have public hearings. I've had a number of uh, senior former public servants raise concerns about this. It does not seem necessary, and from my engagement in the com committee process, it seemed like again and again people talked about uh, the need to keep it independent, to allow the NAC to decide for, for themselves whether or not it was in the public interest. Senator Lambie. Um, so I just want to go back into the public interest. First of all, what, what does that look like and how do, you inter how do they interpret that since we can't interpret that in here? Minister. Well, Senator Levy, the bill doesn't refer to the public interest. The, refer, re, re, the bill refers to the Commission having the power to hold public hearings uh, in exceptional circumstances. And the bill also sets out factors which the Commission may consider when determining whether to hold a hearing in public, and they include the seriousness or systemic nature of the corrupt conduct, any unfair prejudice to a person's reputation, privacy, safety or well-being that would be likely to be caused if the hearing were in public, uh, and the benefits of exposing corrupt conduct to the public and making the public aware of corrupt conduct. So if the Commission considers uh, that, it is, uh, that, that there are benefits in exposing corrupt conduct to the public, and making the public aware of corrupt conduct, they have the power to decide the public hearing if they want to do so. It's not as if, it's not, it's not as if um, they uh, are prevented from doing so. Um, and I'm sure this has been pointed out to all of the senators questioning us about this, but it will often be appropriate that hearings be conducted in private, for example, to avoid prejudicing an ongoing investigation or related criminal proceedings protect the privacy of witnesses or to ensure national security information is protected for, from disclosure. It will be a matter for the Commissioner to weigh up all of these considerations, um, but I don't think um, I would be surprised if any senator thought it would be a good idea to allow a corruption commission or, or force a corruption commission to hold a public hearing when that could prejudice an ongoing investigation or related criminal proceedings. Um, and that, that is the risk if the power is opened up more widely, as is being suggested. As I say, we think we've got the balance right in allowing the Commission to hold those public hearings in exceptional circumstances, for instance, where they do think that there are benefits in exposing corrupt conduct to the public um, and where the seriousness or, or systemic nature of the corrupt conduct uh, justifies it. Senator Shoebridge. Now, that would have to be some of the most boulderised reading. Some of the most the rubbish reading of how this this act of this bill works that I've ever heard, and it does the minister no credit to de deliberately, or perhaps accidentally, totally misrepresent how the bill actually works in practice. All of those elements the minister spoke about will be separately considered already, and are required to be separately considered already by the commission when it's working out whether or not a hearing is in the public interest. So all of those matters are already considered and appropriately considered. The checks and balances are in place. No trial will be, um, will be prejudiced. National security information, although extremely broadly defined, will be protected. All of those matters are already covered by the Commission when considering the public interest. And assume on this, on this bill's drafting that the Commission forms the view, yep, I've considered that. All of those elements, they're all sorted. Nothing's going to go wrong. And it's in the public interest that we have public hearings. We absolutely want to do this, the Commissioner says. Absolutely, 100 per cent in the public interest. And then they say, well, actually, we can't satisfy exceptional circumstances. So all the protections are in place. It's clearly in the public interest to have a public hearing. But the government has decided, whether or not it's a deal with the coalition or not, I suspect it is, 
that they want to be able they, they want to, to to bind the commission's hands and say even if it's in the public interest even if all of those matters are protected you still can't do it unless there's exceptional circumstances and we know from case law in Victoria that exceptional circumstances means what it says exceptional so the run of the mill ugly corruption that we've seen time and time again in states and territories and in this place there's a really real doubt that any of that will get a public, a public viewing because they can't meet exceptional circumstances. This is not helping the Commission. This is deliberately designed to tie its hands. Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the Minister again whether, given all of those other checks and balances in the public here, interest, not prejudicing future um, legal cases, whether exceptional circumstances would apply in, for example, equivalent cases to Premier Dan Andrews in Victoria, where there have been two, we we're told, although it's been in private, it's been in secret, hearings against him under the Victorian IBAC. I campaigned very hard, did lots of talking to many, many voters in the lead up to the Victorian state election. Our state team had, as part of their platform, strengthening the Victorian IBAC so as to have more public hearings rather than the private hearings that are currently in place in Victoria and what this um, legislation seems to be modelled on. And I can tell you, Minister, that there was a huge amount of support for having public hearings. People were very aware of the fact that there were private hearings involving their Premier that they were not privy to that the Victorian public were being kept in the dark about and comparing that with the situation in New South Wales, where because of public hearings, when you had a Premier that was under scrutiny by the New South Wales ICAC, well, surprise, surprise, the Premier decided that she had to resign. So, Minister, would exceptional circumstances apply if it was a Premier? That was under investigation, if it was a Prime Minister or a Minister of the Crown under investigation, would that be exceptional circumstances that, as long as everything else it was in the public interest, no legal cases were going to be prejudiced, would that be the case? Minister. Well, um, I'm not going to get into what may or may not be exceptional circumstances, and I'm surprised that the very parts of this chamber that say that they're about making sure that we have an independent corruption commission now want to get a government minister saying what amounts to exceptional circumstances. Order. I have no intention Order. whatsoever. I have Order. no intention I have no intention whatsoever in saying what amounts to exceptional circumstances or what does not based on hypothetical examples because I respect the independence of the commission and I'd encourage you to do so as well. Uh, Senator um, Orman Payne. Um, Minister, of the 140 or so submissions that were made to the inquiry, do you accept that the overwhelming majority of those submissions were not in favour of including the exceptional circumstances test? Minister. I, I accept that there's a range of views on this matter. There were a range of views presented in submissions. There's a range of views within this chamber, uh, and I can't add to uh, what I've already said as to why the government is going down this path. But, but the good thing about this is that at the end of this debate, uh, once we see the Senate vote, we will, for the very first time in this country, have a strong, independent national anti-corruption commission. Senator Orman Payne. Order, Senator Lamy. Senator Orman Payne, you have the call. Is the minister able to inform the chamber? as to how many of those submissions were in favour of an exceptional circumstances test and how many were against? Minister. I'm, I'm happy to provide that on notice um, to Senator Ormond Payne, um, but what I am aware of is that there was a variety of interests. I, I understand that the Greens don't support this. I understand that there are some independent senators don't support this, um, but this is an appropriate balance uh, to be struck. Uh, and unlike Unlike the Greens, um, a Labor government is what is delivering a national anti-corruption commission for the very first time, and I'm very proud of that. Senator Orman Payne. Uh, as a senator for Queensland, I would like to place on the record that an overwhelming 
number of Queenslanders voted for parties that stood for an independent integrity commission, and those Queenslanders expected that justice would be done in public, and they agree that daylight is the best disinfectant. And I think we can all agree that putting in this test does not do that. Senator Lambie. Um, I was just wondering, um, where did you get your advice from then to put in exceptional circumstances? Could you provide that advice to us, please? Minister. Um, as I've said before, we consulted broadly about this topic. Um, uh, there are. I, I, I accept. I accept. Order. Are you right? Order. Are you right? Order. Senator Shoebridge, you don't have the call. The minister has the call. Uh, I've said we consulted widely about this. I accept that there are um, groups in the community um, that that think that um, there should be public hearings in every instance. I also accept, and I don't know whether the senators asking these questions accept, that there are people who don't support that. Um, and uh, what we have tried to do is to strike a balance. Uh, I've already given the very good reasons why it is not wise to provide um, the commission uh, with a default public hearing power, uh, but they do have the powers to go down that path if they choose um, that there are, if they decide there are ex exceptional circumstances that warrant it. Um, but I'd ask you to respect the fact that there are actually people out there who disagree with you as well. Senator Lambie. I'm wondering if you could please advise us a list of the people or the persons or the institutions out there who gave you advice to use those specific words, exceptional circumstances. You're being very broad there. It's a pretty simple, G. There must be someone out there that had great legal advice to give you. You must have that on paper. Who gave you that advice to put those two words in the bill? Minister. I've already taken that on notice. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, as, as I pointed out earlier, of, of the people that believe that there was no need for exceptional circumstances, may I just point out that the Labor Party before the election was in that group and you potentially would have been sitting uh, alongside us on this one. Um, given the importance of this, I, I really do want to stress how important this is to so many Australians. Uh, this last election, many Australians cast their vote thinking about transparency, wanting more transparency and more accountability, and elected a government who promised a NAC, which, as you point out, you're delivering. But a key part of that was public hearings where it was in the public interest. If, if the Senate would indulge me just to read some of the responses that I've had sent in to me. Susan Vickers in Red Hill says, a federal integrity commission is crucial. Hearings should be public in interests of transparency and accountability. Sarah in Gerolang says, this is really important. We need public hearings and action taken on outcomes. There needs to be a tightening on lobbyists and a review of media power as this influence election outcomes and ministerial decisions. Caroline Reid and Fraser puts it, the NAC bill must be amended further as per Helen Haynes' defeated amendments to ensure that public hearings are not restricted in any way because the low rate of prosecution of politicians through ICAC processes is too low to act as a deterrent against pork barrelling, nepotism and fraud. And just lastly, Gary Shapcott from Woden says, a NAC that investigates secrecy, corruption and sleaze in government in secret hearings ain't going to build public trust in government. And NAC is supposed to deliver transparency and accountability to the public, not on another layer of smoke and mirrors. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. And again, I, I respect the fact that there are people in this chamber uh, and people in the community uh, who have a different view on this point. But I think for anyone who's listening to this debate, they need to be assured um, that what we will have as a result of this legislation being passed, historic legislation, for the very first time in Australia, is a national anti-corruption commission that is strong, that is independent uh, and that will dig out um, corruption within federal politics 
uh, and federal government, and that is a good thing. It will have the power to act retrospectively. It will have the power to compel the production of documents. It will have the power to hold public hearings in exceptional circumstances. Uh, it will have the power to initiate investigations of its own accord rather than only those investigations that the government of the day wants commenced. Um, so I think people would be doing a disservice if, we were to, if people were to shoot down this historic bill um, and this National Anti-Corruption Commission, which will do more for restoring public faith in our democracy in Australia than any other institution that this parliament has created. Senator Lambie. Um, South Australia's ICAC ran into real problems because everything was done in secret. This caused the public and parliament to lose confidence in South Australia's ICAC. Do you, do you concede the secrecy you are proposing will erode the public confidence in the knack from the Australian people? Minister. Uh, no, I don't. Um, for starters, there will be robust and transparent reporting at the end of corruption investigations and public inquiries, and that will provide transparency and support the, prevent the Commission's prevention and education function. Um, it is incorrect for any senator to be suggesting um, that the work of this Corruption Commission will be entirely done in secret and people will never find out about it. Um, there, there will be times when private hearings will be held. There will be times when public hearings will be, will be held. And at the end of those investigations, the findings of those investigations will be made public uh, and, if appropriate, prosecutions will then commence. Uh, I'll go to Senator Lambie and then I, I notice that Senator Shoebridge wishes to call. Um, public hearings help to inform and educate the public and are used as a deterrent. They also help to educate public servants, politicians and institutions by reinforcing the rules by which public administration must be conducted. Do you agree this is a political fix to, to de designed to protect the self-interest of the Labor and the Liberal Party? Minister. No. Senator Shoebridge. If there's a public hearing, the report must be made public. And at least in that, to that extent, the minister is correct. But if there's private hearings, there is absolutely no obligation for the report to be made public. And the minister is either, again, unintentionally or, or, or deliberately misleading the House and misleading the public. So far from taking comfort from what the minister said, people should be deeply, deeply troubled. But if that's what the government has been telling its, its you know, less engaged ministers and backbenchers that don't worry, it'll all become public after a private hearing. Wrong. Totally wrong. The, 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 the commissioner may make a hearing, may make a report public. Totally discretionary. The only person we know will get a copy of a report if there's been a private hearing, the one person that is absolutely going to get a copy of the report is the attorney general. That's the only person who can be guaranteed getting a copy of a report if there's a private hearing. And the rest of the public may be kept in, dark, in, the, in the dark for as long as we know. And then the, we may get some tiny, tiny clue, a crumb, in the annual report published by the, by the Commission where they have to, in a generic way, perhaps no more than one line long, describe the general nature of the investigations they've done. So far from being comforted by what the minister has said, we should be deeply troubled that either the minister doesn't understand how the, 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 the bill worked or he's been badly briefed because these private hearings may never get the light of any public review. And the reports may never be seen by anyone other than the Attorney General of the government of the day. Senator Lambie. You want an answer to that? Could I just... Yes. I'll go to the minister and then Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Senator for Shoebridge, for acknowledging uh, that the Commission can and may make findings of a public inquiry uh, of a private inquiry public thank you for acknowledging that senator lambie so the attorney general has said that he won't use his powers to stop the prosecutions of whistleblowers like richard boyle or david mcbride unless there are what do you know exceptional circumstances the attorney general has defined and i quote exceptional circumstances as meaning almost never so that's what this bill is proposing, isn't it? That public hearings will be almost never. Minister. No. Does any honourable 
member have any further contribution ahead of me putting the question? The Honourable Senator has indicated to me, so I'm intending to put the question. I put the question that the amendment on sheet 1714, revised as standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells. the doors. The, qu the question before the chair is that the amendment number one on sheet 1714 revised, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Those for the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Teller for the ayes, Senator McKim 
and tell her for the nose, Senator Scar. Honourable Senators, there being 14 ayes and 30 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Shoebridge. Thanks, Deputy President. I move Greens Amendment No. 2 on sheet 1714. Um, <clears throat> Given the previous amendment to remove the exceptional circumstances test has not been accepted by either the, the government or the opposition, um, this amendment is designed to provide some certainty as to what exceptional circumstances means and do it in a way that it encourages more rather than less public hearings. Now, rather than just a stab in the dark and have a guess and you're not willing to say anything about what exceptional circumstances means, which is the, the kind of go-to position from the government, this proposes to clearly say that for the purposes of section 73, subsection 2 of the NAC bill, exceptional circumstances include where it's preferable and appropriate for evidence to be given in public rather than private. And that obviously would be a major step forward for transparency. You get to keep the exceptional circumstances test that the government seems so loved, you know, so 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 attached to, such emotional and political attachment to the exceptional circumstances test, and then we get to define it in such a way that it doesn't shut down the knack. And I want to credit the CPSU in particular for their advocacy in the inquiry that we had, where they suggested this as a solution, a solution that might get past the political impasse of ha insisting on having the exceptional circumstances test. So it's with the hope that we can move beyond political deadlock, clearly define what exceptional circumstances mean, and, and allow the NAC to do its job. And if it thinks it's in the public interest, and if they think it's preferable and appropriate for evidence to be given in public rather than private, they can get on and do it. Minister. Well, again, we'll be opposing this amendment, and it's uh, passing strange that, having just told us and lectured us why we needed to make the Corruption Commission independent, Senator Shoebridge now wants to uh, dictate to the Commission what constitutes exceptional circumstances. Um, as we have said all along, we think that the Commission should be allowed to act independently without a government um, dictating to it what amount to exceptional circumstances. Uh, we have full uh, confidence in the Commission to be able to work that out by exercising their own discretion. 
Are there any other contributions, Senator Shoebridge? Well, I mean, that's a bizarre uh, contribution from the minister. The definition here is an inclusive definition designed to empower the NAC, and it includes where it's preferable and appropriate for evidence to be given in public, and there's a public interest in place. The, the, the minister's contribution does him no credit. Are there any other contributions on this amendment? I intend to put the amendment. I put the question that the amendment number two on sheet 1714 revised, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. I understand that. Uh, the no, I, said, I said the no's. Did you, I'm, I'm looking to you whether you uh, <laughs> don't stress the deputy president. The, <laughs> um, I was looking longingly to, to, towards you to see whether you wanted a division. Uh, I understand that um, the, the amendments in the name of Jackie Lambie Network and Senator Pocock will, will not be moved. So we come to. Uh, the amendments three and four on sheet 1714 revised. I give the call to Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. These amendments three and four seek to do a very simple thing. Uh, they, they will allow a journalist or, a, or an entity that employs a journalist that's been served with a warrant to produce documents or attend um, to, a, to an examination they will allow that journalist or, or that employer of the journalist to contest the warrant, to, to be there in court and articulate to the judge why the <coughs> warrant shouldn't be issued and, and, and or why the warrant should be narrowed, um, or set out such other appropriate submissions as journalists should be able to make before the coercive powers of the NAC can be exercised against, against a journalist. Um, I've said before, and I'll repeat it, we, we think it's good that the attorney moved beyond the recommendations that came from the committee, the very narrow recommendations that came from the committee, to slightly increase journalist protections, to ensure that when a warrant is going to be issued, public interest, the public interest in protecting journalism and journalists protecting their sources must be considered by the court when issuing a warrant. But this amendment goes that further necessary step to say, unless, there's a, 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 there, unless there are reasonable grounds for believing that there's a serious material risk that the journalist will seek to um, conceal or destroy the evidence, unless there's that concern, that the journalist has to be given notice and allowed the, the, the opportunity to contest the warrant. Why do we do this? We do this because it already is in practice in the United Kingdom and it works in the United Kingdom. And there's not a single instance from the, from the practice in the UK where a journalist that's been served with a warrant and given the opportunity to contest it has ever destroyed the evidence. But it allows the public interest to be fully contested. It protects journalism. And it would be a deep irony if this parliament, in moving to empower the National Anti-Corruption Commission to create an anti-corruption body at the, at the centre of the Commonwealth um, integrity agencies, in, in the same move harmed journalism and made it harder to be a journalist and challenged the existing integrity measures in journalism. That's why we move these amendments and we commend them to the House. Uh, just before I call the minister, Senator Shubert, can I just have you ask for leave to move three and four together yep. and actually yep. move the amendments? I, I seek leave to move amendments three and four on sheet 1714 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move those amendments. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President, and thanks, Senator Shoebridge. The government is committed to upholding and strengthening the freedom of the press in Australia. The bills contain strong protections for the identity of journalist sources. The government has moved amendments to the bill in response uh, to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights recommendation uh, to broaden the public interest test 
that would apply where the Commission seeks a search warrant in relation to a journalist or their employer to apply in relation to any such application, rather than applications made as part of an investigation into a secrecy offence. This amendment would require issuing officers to weigh the public interest in issuing the warrant against the public interest in protecting the source's identity and in facilitating the exchange of information between journalists and members of the public so as to facilitate reporting of matters in the public interest. Uh, the bills also contain strong safeguards to protect the identities of journalists' sources and uphold the public interest associated with the free press. Journalists and their employers will not be required to do anything under the bill that would disclose the identity of their source or enable that identity to be ascertained. The government has made amendments to the bill to strengthen those protections in response to recommendations made by the Joint Select Committee reviewing the bills. The scope of the protection has been expanded to protect persons assisting a journalist who are members of staff of the same media organisation, as well as other persons assisting a journalist in their professional capacity. This will ensure persons who are assisting the journalist and who may be aware of the identity of confidential informants are protected, for example, a camera person, editor or lawyer, providing legal advice in connection with an article. The government has also broadened the public interest test that would apply where the Commission seeks a search warrant in relation to a journalist or their employer to apply in relation to any such application, rather than applications made as part of an investigation into a secrecy offence. The government notes that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security considered in its bipartisan 2020 Freed Press Freedoms Report that warrants under Section 3 capital A of the Crimes Act uh, should, in, should continue to be issued without notice um, to the relevant journalist or media organisation. The government, for those reasons, does not support the proposed amendments. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I do note the comments that have been made by the minister. Um, in that respect, the coalition does believe that the government amendment uh, has appropriately addressed the issue of journalist protections, uh, in particular as highlighted in the consensus recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee. Uh, and as such, we will not be supporting the amendment. Senator Shearidge. Um, well, well, thankfully, the attorney went well beyond the um, recommendation that came from the Joint Committee already in amendments. But, but even with those amendments, which I accept were a step forward for the protection of journalists, all of these decisions will be made ex parte. Warrants will be issued. They'll be made within, often in chambers, in the absence of any submissions from the journalist or any representations from the journalist about why warrants, warrants should not be issued. And the Greens firmly believe that in this space the interests of justice are best served by allowing the media itself to make the arguments in court about why their sources and why their work and their function should be protected, if it's appropriate, from the reach of the knack. As I said before, we don't want a cruel journalism as we go through and create another anti-integrity body. Because up to now, and hopefully going forward, journalism has been one of the critical anti-integrity measures. Are there any other contributions on this amendment? I intend to put the amendment. I put the question that the amendment, amendments three and four on sheet 1714, standing the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. We now come to amendments five and six on sheet 1714. I, 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 sorry, I apologise, Senator Shubridge. I understand they will not be moved. Is that correct? That's correct. So we now come to seven and eight on sheet 1714. Revised. I'll give you the call. Um, Thanks, Deputy President. These amendments take. Oh, I seek leave to move amendments seven and eight together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move the amendments. Thank you. These amendments taken together will expressly empower the Oversight Committee to request draft estimates, the draft budget effectively, for the National Anti Corruption Commission, and then to um, require the NAC to provide those draft estimates to the committee, and then to allow the, the committee expressly to make recommendations to both Houses of Parliament and to the Attorney-General on those draft estimates. In other words, there's not enough money in the kitty for the, for the NAC. There's not enough money being provided for them to do their job. The committee can recommend during the budget process what the level of funding should be. 
Like I said before, and I won't repeat, the submissions we made about how this already works for the National Audit Office. That say that the, this, these amendments seek to draw from that experience and the long-standing provisions for the National Audit Office and simply repeat them, those workable, functioning provisions for the National Audit Office for the National Anti-Corruption Commission. And for those reasons, we commend them to the House. Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge, for your amendment. Uh, the bill already provides the Parliamentary Joint Committee with a broad function to review the Commission's budget and finances. This includes reporting to the Parliament on whether the Commission's resources are sufficient to effectively perform its functions and whether its budget should be increased. The powers and proceedings of the Committee would be determined by resolution of both Houses of the Parliament. If both Houses of the Parliament provide the Parliamentary Joint Committee with the powers to call witnesses and require the production of documents, the Committee could, re could require the Commission to provide information on the Commission's budgets, budget and finances and request a response within a given time frame. No amendment to the bill is required to achieve this. For that reason, the government does not support the amendment. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, on behalf of the opposition, I do note uh, the reasons given by the minister, and I would only add that the coalition believes budgetary decisions in relation to any government agency should be left to the government of the day, and uh, as such, we will also not be supporting the amendment. Senator Shoebridge. The difficulty, of course, with the opposition's proposition, and I think it's one of the concerns we have about the approach to the NAC, is to treat the NAC as just any government agency. And it's clearly not. Integrity agencies, whether it's the Audit Office or it's the NAC, are not just any government agency that can be either starved of funds or not by the government of the day. These are really agencies that we should see as an extended fourth arm of government. We have um, the legislature, we have the executive, we have the judiciary, and given the complexity of modern government, we should also be seeing integrity agencies as effectively a fourth arm of government, the need to have secure independent funding. And to simply say, as the opposition does, that they should be treated as any other government agency, able to be starved of funds by the government of the day at their whim, I think um, highlights a real concern we have about the approach that might be taken in the future to the finances and the funding of the NAC. And in fact, if, if ever there was a powerful reason to support the amendments that were put here, it was the contributions we just heard that seek to treat the NAC as just any government agency. That's downright dangerous for the future operations of the NAC. Are there any other contributions? The Honourable Senator has indicated they wish to make a contribution. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the amendments 7 and 8 on sheet 1714 is revised in the name of Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the amendments 7 and 8 on sheet 1714 revised in the name, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge be agreed to. Those for the question passed to the right of the chair, against to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the eyes and Senator Scar for teller for the nose. Senators, there being 14 ayes and 27 noes, it's passed in the negative. We now come to sheet 1775. Now comes sheet 1775, which stands in the name of uh, Senator Shoebridge and Senator Pocock. Okay. Senator Pocock. Chair, I seek leave to move Amendment 1 on sheet 1775, circulated in the name of myself and the Australian Greens. You don't require leave. I just ask you to move it. I move the amendment. Thank you, Chair. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, um, this amendment would provide for the Oversight Committee when it's considering just two critical issues, which is the appointment of the Commissioner and the appointment of the Inspector, would provide that the Oversight Committee could only make that decision by a majority of members, a simple majority of members, not a super majority, but a simple majority of members. And it would it also provides that when determining that majority, that the provisions that provide for a casting vote of the chair do not apply. So in other words, fifty percent plus one of the members in attendance at the committee have to agree to the appointment of a commissioner or an inspector. Why is that important? Well, it's important because it's, it's hard to think of a more critical job for the Oversight Committee than determining who the Commissioner and Inspector of the NAC will be. And on the current drafting, where the committee is six members of the government, chosen from both houses, six members, um, six non-government members, four of the opposition, two of the crossbench, chosen from each house, as the, uh, we, if there is an equality of votes, 
well, then the government chair gets to determine the outcome. And that effectively hands complete control to the government of the day mm -hmm. in that critical decision about the appointment of a commissioner. Now, I acknowledge that there's been a fair bit of public debate about that in the last 24 hours. There were propositions being put forward by the opposition to have a 75 per cent supermajority. Um, and indeed, in the course of the inquiry, we heard time and time again from the government, from the opposition, but you don't need to have any kind of supermajority because these things are always done by consensus, we were told. That will always be unanimous. Everybody will always agree because that's how these committees work. Well, if that's the case, if the expectation that is that the, the, the proposed appointments will be of such quality that it will always be done by consensus, where's the harm in acquiring just a simple majority? And of course, we've heard from the government they were very concerned that this would somehow provide a veto to the opposition. Well, far from providing a veto for an opposition, this gives the government of the day three potential avenues to get their commissioner appointed. They can get either of the crossbench um, members to agree. And if either of them agree, there's the simple majority, or they can get the opposition to agree. Three different avenues to get the government's appointment agreed. And, and, and why is that important? Because we want to just check, to put a check and balance not just on the current government, but we want to put a check and balance on a future government that may be much more noxious, may actually want to appoint a commissioner to do over the opposition, may want to appoint a commissioner to do harm. And of course there should be somebody other than the government of the day having oversight of that commissioner, the appointment of the commissioner, so it's not just a blank cheque. So this amendment the Greens firmly believe, and, I, and, and, and I, I say the Greens, but I think a substantial chunk of the crossbench believe, and I'd include the member for Indi, Dr Haynes, um, and I know it's been, um, uh, this is an amendment moved by Senator Pocock, and I, and I appreciate and respect his position in this, in this debate, and it gets the balance right. It's not a blank check for the government, and it's not a veto for the opposition, but it is a check on the executive, not just for this government, but it's about future-proofing the NAC. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I thank Senator Pocock and Shoebridge for their amendment. The bill provides for multi-partisan representation on the committee and uh, ensures that the Commission, including its key office holders, have the confidence of the parliament. It is the government's intention and sincere hope that appointments to the Commission will receive multi-partisan support. Broad parliamentary support for, appointment, uh, for appointments will be integral to the Commission's credibility. Proposed recommendations for appointments will be subject to transparent and merit-based processes and statutory eligibility criteria. This will ensure that appointments are subject to appropriate oversight and the recommended candidates for these important roles have the confidence of the parliament. It is appropriate that the government of the day, which has responsibility for government decisions regarding the commission, such as funding, hold the role of chair and have the casting vote. The government, therefore, does not support this amendment. Senator Cash. Uh, the Coalition will also not be supporting this amendment. Um, the Senate will note that the Coalition had previously moved an amendment in relation to we believe bipartisanship is best achieved with the three-quarter majority uh, that we have proposed in our amendment, and I have set out our reasons as to why in my second reading speech I do know that it was not supported by the Senate. Uh, and on that basis, uh, we won't be supporting this amendment, and the status quo as outlined by the minister will prevail. Senator Pocock. Minister, uh, I'm, I'm interested why uh, you think we should uh, leave it to hope when we have an opportunity to legislate that the government of the day needs to simply convince one other member of the committee that they have the right uh, commissioner. We've heard much criticism, and, and rightly so, for captain's picks uh, by, by the executive over the years, and clearly there's a feeling amongst Australians that that needs to end. And here we have an opportunity to legislate a NAC that will ensure that the government of the day cannot just put whoever they like in there. Why aren't we doing that now? Minister. Thanks, Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Pocock. As I indicated earlier, uh, we believe that it is appropriate for the government of the day 
which does have responsibility for government decisions regarding the Commission, such as funding, also holds the role of chair and has the casting vote. Uh, but as I say, it is certainly our intention that appointments to the Commission will receive multi-partisan support, and that's the way we'll be approaching it. Does the Honourable Senator have any further contribution? As I intend to put, I intend to put the question. I put the question. I put Senator Thorpe. I'm about to put the question. I put the question that the amendment number one on sheet 1775, standing in the name of Senator Shubridge and Pocock, and as moved by Senator Pocock, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells. The doors. The question before the chair 
is that amendment number one on sheet 1775, standing in the name of Senator Pocock and Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint teller for the aye, Senator McKim, and teller for the noes, Senator Scar. There being 13 ayes and 32 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Shoebridge, uh, as I understand it, the next amendment is number nine on 1714. Uh, Am I correct that you will not be moving that one? Or have I? Uh, yes. Um, and instead you'll be moving yes. uh, number one on sheet 1778. Yes. Yeah, so I'll just indicate for the Senate, mm. I won't be moving amendment number nine on sheet 1714. But in lieu of that, I will be moving, and I move now, amendment number one on sheet 1778 that has been recently circulated. There's also amendment number two on that sheet. Thank you, Senator Cash. I seek leave, if it's convenient of the House. This is to, um, to move amendments numbers one and two together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move both those amendments. Um, Deputy President, the, the, the bill as initially drafted gave a very, very narrow role for the inspector, simply to determine whether or not any serious or systemic corruption had occurred within the NAC. Um, now, one would hope that would never happen. And, and, and for that reason, the inspector may well have had almost no functions at all under the original drafting. There has been a very small increase as a result of recommendations made by the, by the committee to, in, to, to provide some oversight of a small part of the compulsory powers of the NAC by the inspector. But we, Some of the most compelling evidence we had in the inquiry came from Bruce McClintock SC, who is the current inspector of the New South Wales ICAC and indeed also the inspector of the Northern Territory equivalent. And when he read the bill, he was very surprised to see the very narrow scope given to the inspector. And, and he, in particular, said that the inspector really needs to have the, the ability to have, have an ongoing audits of the NAC, ongoing audits of the Integrity Commission, uh, to ensure that it's not, enga not engaged in any kind of maladministration or abuse of powers. We're giving this body, the NAC, extraordinary powers, appropriate extraordinary powers, powers to issue warrants, to compel witnesses to attend. And we want to be sure that there's somebody keeping an eye on that, especially as much of this may well be done in private hearings. Mm. So if we don't have the ability to hold the NAC to account in public hearings, if much of this is happening in private hearings, who does someone go to 
if there's no natural justice in the hearings or if search warrants or other powers have been abused. Under the current drafting, there is nobody. Maybe a complaint to the ombudsman that might be heard in due course. But if we're going to have an inspector, then we should, we should listen to, heed the advice given by people already doing the job and, and, and who I think all of us would probably accept are doing a bloody good job of the inspector in the, the New South Wales ICAC um, and, and other inspectors around the country. So what this amendment seeks to do is to, is to capture the recommendations given from, by Bruce McClintock. And indeed, I'm very grateful for him providing to the committee not just the submission but the initial drafting for this amendment. And I'm grateful for the cooperation that we've had from the government to, I think, improve the drafting of it, to make it clearer what the role of the NAC is and to expressly set out what the, sorry, what the role of the inspector is and to expressly set out what the inspector's powers will be in conducting audits. For that reason, I'm glad Senator Cash reminded me to move amendment number two because it sets out in detail the ability of the inspector, when, it's con when, when, when they are conducting an audit, to enter and remain on the premises of the NAC, to have access to the facilities and to be entitled to full and free access to any of the information, documents or other property of the NAC critical powers that the inspector should have. So I know we've had some division in this debate, and I know that there have been a difference in views between the crossbench and the major parties on many issues. But what we're hoping for with this amendment is that we can all agree that a properly empowered inspector with the right powers and extensive powers to check on uh, potential maladministration, to ensure that the extraordinary powers of the NAC are not being abused, to ensure that natural justice is done, especially as many of the hearings will be in private. We can all agree that this is a step forward for transparency and is an important measure to ensure that the promise of the NAC, the promise of the NAC is not in some way betrayed or undermined by any kind of abusive process going forward. It's an important amendment and I commend it to the House. Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Shoebridge. Um, the government certainly believes that it's important for the inspector to have powers, uh, and that's exactly why, under the bill, the inspector is able to investigate complaints made in relation to the conduct or activities of the commission or a staff member of the commission. The inspector would also be responsible for detecting and investigating corrupt conduct within the commission and reporting on the outcome of those investigations. The bill actually already provides those powers. As Senator Shoebridge acknowledged, the government has also moved amendments to the bill in response to the recommendation of the Joint Select Committee uh, in relation to audit powers of the uh, inspector. And for these reasons, we don't think that this amendment is necessary uh, because the sufficient powers are already provided by the inspector uh, to the inspector under the bill. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I do indicate that in relation to this particular amendment uh, moved by the Australian Greens, the Coalition will be supporting it. Uh, and I do note uh, that it has been slightly updated, and I appreciate the explanation in relation to the tightening uh, of the actual drafting. In relation to the amendment, as Senator Shoebridge has stated, it expands the powers of the inspector, but importantly, the expansion is in line with the recommendations of former New South Wales ICAC inspector uh, Bruce McClintock. Uh, again, when you actually look at the, uh, the amended um, provision, it clearly sets out what the functions of the inspector are, and given that the inspector does provide an essential function uh, in ensuring that the National Anti-Corruption Commission operates lawfully and fairly, uh, the coalition, as I indicated, will be supporting this amendment. <coughs> Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just rise in support of this amendment. I'm very, very pleased uh, that this amendment has been proposed. I think a major theme coming from the hearings conducted by the Joint Select Committee was the question that was first put by the Roman philosopher and poet Juvenal, which is, who watches the watchman? Who watches the watchman? And the answer under this legislation is the inspector. The inspector uh, is the authority in this case who has the, has the role of making sure 
that the commissioner and people within the commissioner don't go off the rails. And we heard quite a bit of evidence from a number of jurisdictions in relation to uh, areas where other commissions uh, have not acted as one would have hoped. And in this case, by having a strong inspector, I think uh, we maximise the opportunity to make sure that the NAC operates in a way that we all expect it to operate. Um, two other quick points I'd like to make. I'd just like to echo uh, the gratitude and thanks that was expressed uh, to Mr Bruce McClintock, KC, uh, who took the time to make a very, very detailed submission uh, to the Joint Select Committee and gave some very passionate evidence and testimony, which I found very convincing uh, and I think other members of the committee found very convincing. And the last point I want to make, just as it's important that the NAC itself is provided with sufficient funding, it is also important that the inspector is provided with sufficient funding. And I think the first iteration of this bill, which has been substantially enhanced through the parliamentary processes, was underdone was underdone in terms of the, both the role of the inspector uh, but also in terms of how uh, the inspector was envisaged to be resourced. And I think we heard very compelling testimony from the Victorian inspectorate that we actually need adequate resources for the inspector as we need for the NAC. So I'm very, very pleased to see this amendment uh, come before the Senate. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, Deputy President. As um, Dr Seuss would say, Oh, the jobs people work at, um, and we need a be watch watcher, um, and that's what the inspector is here to do—to be the watcher um, and to keep to keep an eye on the operations of the NAC going forward. It, it's an important integrity measure for the NAC, and and it, it's one of the measures that I hope that we can agree to to provide longevity for the NAC, to ensure ongoing public confidence for the NAC. So I thank members for their contributions. Any other honourable senator wish to make a contribution? No, honourable senator, it's indicated, so I intend to put the question. I put the question that amendments one and two on sheet one seven seven eight, standing in the name of Senator Shoebridge, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to. Amendment 10 on sheet 1714, revised. Senator Shoebridge. Well, look, this should be fairly straightforward and um, non contentious. Uh, I move uh, amendment number 10 on sheet uh, 1714. Um, this amendment would provide that a person must not be appointed as the Commissioner if the person is or has been a member of the Parliament of the Commonwealth, the Parliament of a State, or the legislature of a territory. The main job of the NAC will be to keep an eye on politicians. I mean, of course, government, um, public servants and um, um, third parties, some people in corporate Australia who might be seeking to improperly influence um, um, uh, politicians and the Commonwealth, uh, they need to be, obviously, under the purview and the, 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 the observation of the NAC. But one of the critical jobs of the NAC will be to keep an eye on politicians. And we should not and we must not appoint a politician to keep an eye on politicians. That's what this, that's what this provision says. Um, if, if it's, it's one of those cases that justice not only needs to be done, it needs to be seen to be done. And if the public see the government appoint a politician to keep an eye on politicians, well, that will inevitably undermine the integrity of the NAC. So we believe this amendment is important. We believe that it again supports the longevity of the NAC and public support for the NAC. Because at the end of the day, we don't want police investigating police and we don't want politicians investigating politicians. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Again, thanks, Senator Shoebridge, for his amendment. Uh, the proposed nominees for appointment to the roles of Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner and Inspector would be sub subject to transparent and merit-based appointment processes and statutory eligibility criteria, as well as approval by the Parliamentary Joint Committee. This would ensure that appointments are subject to appropriate oversight and the recommended candidates for these important roles have the confidence of the parliament. It would be unlikely that a former member of parliament would be suitable for <coughs> appointment as a commissioner. 
However, while this is not a qualification, it does not need to be an immediate disqualification. It is unnecessary for the bill to be amended to rule out this possibility, and therefore the government does not support this amendment. Senator Cash. Do note the comments made by the minister. In the same regard, the coalition will not be supporting uh, this particular amendment. The coalition believes that the position of the commissioner uh, must be open to the most qualified and eminent person who applies. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, Acting, De Acting Deputy President. One of the reasons we need a NAC is because there's too many jobs for the boys. Um, the people cycle in and out of politics and corporate Australia. You know, one moment they're the minister, the next moment they're the, um, the lobbyist for the defence industry. One, minute, one moment they're the, 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 the treasurer or the finance minister, and the next moment they're working for, for one of the major merchant banks. Um, surely, when it comes to the NAC, we can agree that at least in this one, this one place, there shouldn't be jobs for the boys, that there shouldn't be a revolving door that takes you from politics <laughs> into the NAC. Surely we can agree on that. If there are no further contributions, I will put the question. And the question before the chair is that Amendment uh, 10 on sheet 1714, moved by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. So um, we're going to move on to the second bill now, which is the National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022. And there is an um, amendment there, and I'm going to call Senator Cash. Senator uh, thank Cash. you very much. And I move opposition amendment one on sheet 1763. And just in brief, uh, the amendment ensures that all parts of the National Anti-Corruption Commission bill will be subject to review under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. Given the extraordinary powers of the National Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, we believe that it is important that the decisions are subject to review uh, in the same way as any other administrative decisions made by government bodies. Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President, and thanks, Senator Cash, for your amendment. We did discuss this uh, earlier in the day, but just to put the government's position on the record, uh, we will not be supporting this amendment. The consequential bill provides that decisions relating to the commencement of an investigation or inquiry and intermediary or procedural steps by the Commission on the way to reaching its findings would not be subject to judicial review. Uh, this is appropriate to ensure that the Commission's statutory functions are not undermined and delayed as a result of lengthy litigation at each interlocutory step of, it, of an investigation and that investigations and inquiries can be conducted in a timely manner. A person may still seek judicial review of these intermediary or procedural decisions under the Judiciary Act 1903 or in the High Court's original jurisdiction. The government, as I say, does not support this amendment. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, for the reasons actually articulated by the minister, the Greens won't be supporting the amendment either. If this amendment from the opposition got up, it would, it would tie the NAC down in endless disputation and, and legal challenges under the ADJR Act. And that would largely be done by the powerful, the well-resourced corporations and individuals um, who we want the NAC to be holding to account. It would produce endless legal challenges and delay in the work of the NAC and would largely cruel the ability of the NAC to do its job. If there are no further contributions, the question before the chair is that item two of schedule one stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022, as amended, be agreed to and the National Anti-Corruption Commission Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2022 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it.
The committee has considered the National Anti-Corruption Commission Bill 2022 and a related bill and agreed to them with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question before the chair is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question before the, the chamber is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to provide for the establishment of a national anti-corruption commission and for related purposes. A bill for an act to deal with consequential and transitional matters arising from the enactment of the National Anti-Corruption Commission Act 2022 and for other purposes. Clark. Government business orders of the day number two, fair work legislation amendment, Order. secure jobs, better pay bill 2022, second reading debate. Um, before I call Senator Cash, I'd ask for um, order in the chamber, please, and if you could take uh, congratulations outside, that would be appreciated. Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. Thank you. And I rise to speak on the Fair Work uh, Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, what we have before us today is a bill that, in the very short time that we have had to examine it as a Senate, it has been exposed as an absolute shambles. Those on the other side don't seem to understand. Governments do not create jobs. Employers do. Businesses do. Industry does. What governments do is put in place frameworks under which employers have to operate. So, In relation to the bill that we currently have before us, let's look at what the job creators of Australia have to say. As at the 27th of November, and that is all of two days ago, this is what the Australian Industry Group had to say. The late-night deal between Senator Pocock and the federal government means Australian industry now faces an industrial relations system riddled with conflict, complexity and uncertainty. The deal as it stands does not remove the core concerns for industry. We now face the prospects of more strikes and fewer jobs. There has been no modelling of any economic benefit of the legislation, only the vague hope that employers with an industrial gun to their head will pay more and somehow not pass costs on to consumers or reduce their headcount. Let's now look at what the other job creator, the Australian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, have said in relation to this bill but two days ago. Unfortunately, this bill still puts Australian jobs and businesses at risk. It is fundamentally flawed and simply cannot be improved through the amendments that are now proposed. It is our view it is not fit for passage. The Minerals Council of Australia said this. They remain concerned that the government's proposed amendments to the Secure Jobs Better Pay legislation do not go far enough in addressing industry concerns about the unintended impact of the bill. And the Business Council of Australia had this to say. This is a huge economic risk, and there is no evidence multi-employer bargaining will lift wages. In fact, we remain concerned that this fundamentally flawed bill could make things worse. At a time of global economic uncertainty, skyrocketing inflation and a global cost of living crisis, Australia has almost full employment and wages are beginning to strengthen. Why are we taking this risk? Peter Strong, formerly of the Council of Small Business of Australia, said this. One of Labor's election promises for small business, now a broken promise, was to draw on Labor's history of working with unions, workers and industry to deliver better outcomes with settings that are simpler, more accessible and fair. The opposite of that is happening. So what we have, Acting Deputy President, is a bill. That is what we have said that the job creators of this country think about it. 
That is what the job creators of this country think about Labor's extreme industrial relations legislation. But let's now contrast that to what the head of the most militant union in Australia, the CFMFU, John Setka, has to say about the bill. As reported in the Australian newspaper, this is what he has said, Senator Scar. Writing recently to members, the union's Victorian secretary, John Setka, said he was impressed by Burke's move to scrap the ABCC and the building code. Without going the early crow, I'm hoping that this government is going to be different from the Rudd-Gillard governments, and from what I've seen so far, I'm quietly confident, Setka wrote. Our next DABO negotiations are not now going to be restricted to shit clauses, and we will have the power to go after non-union sites. So there we have it. At least Mr Setka, the head of the most militant union in Australia, about to be handed back on a silver platter, the, uh, the building and construction industry, is being honest, unlike Mr Burke and Mr Albanese, who refuse to listen to those people who represent the employers in Australia who say this bill will not have the effect that the Australian Labor Party says it will. But what gets worse, Mr Acting Deputy President, is this. The more we discover about this bill and how it was formulated, it has actually gone from completely absurd to a complete farce. Why do I say that? Well, let's look about the discoveries in relation to the costs that are going to be imposed on businesses. That is the bargaining tax that is Mr Albanese and the Australian Labor Party's Christmas present to the employers of Australia. The costs, of course, were revealed quite recently uh, in this bill's regulatory impact statement. And what we're learning is that the bargaining cost this government's radical shake-up of the industrial relations system will impose on small businesses is a Christmas present of $14,500, thereabouts. For medium businesses, let's not forget that the cost that was included in the regulatory impact statement is actually not the correct cost because they made a mistake in the calculation. Couldn't they the said math. it was, couldn't do the math, around $75,000. What we now know is it's actually $80,000 and for large businesses, $94,000. But it gets better. The contempt that the Albanese government has for the job creators of, on, in this country was on display in the exposure that there is a $5,000 error in the costs that were calculated for medium-sized businesses. That cost, as I said, is now $5,000 higher. It's an $80,000 bargaining tax when they are roped into multi-employer bargaining. But it gets worse, because what did the Minister for Small Business actually call this mistake? She said it is essentially a typo. Well, quite frankly, that could only come from a minister representing the Australian Labor Party. And why do I say that? Because blind Freddie can tell you that $5,000 is not a typo when it is a cost, an increased cost, that is going to be borne by the job creators of this country. Any business currently above 15 employees, so a business with 16 employees, a cafe in Sydney, $5,000? A typo? Well, quite frankly, that is treating those that are going to be paying the Albanese government's bargaining tax with contempt. But it gets worse. I mean, one would have thought that a $5,000 mistake that actually is going to cost business, um, you couldn't get worse from that, Mr Acting Deputy President, but it does get worse. Because when we then explored how the department, working with the Australian Labor Party, the government, came up with the costs that are actually going to be borne by business. What we actually find is, rather than consult, because God forbid you consult, because you see, if you consult, you actually get told by the job creators in this country, and I quote, this bill will only lead to more strikes and less jobs. This bill will not have the intended effect that the Albanese government says it does. So why bother consulting when you can actually turn to Mr Google? Now, footnote 70 in the regulatory impact statement says the department used an article entitled, and I assume this was the Google search term, how much should I charge as a consultant in Australia? From a website called authentic.com.au to calculate this cost. Now, anyone from business listening into this should know this. The author of the article, Benjamin J. Harvey, is described on the website as 
a cross between business strategist, modern day spiritual healer, self development exper expert, Benjamin J. Harvey, this is the good news for all those businesses out there, is as comfortable working with shamans to strategists, psychics to sales reps, healers to homemakers, Buddhists to businessmen, and meditators to mediators. You have to be kidding me. That is the source the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations used, signed off by Minister Burke's office as the relevant source to work out the costs that should be imposed on business. And when I asked the department at a very quick hearing into this, what industrial relations bargain experience do any, do any of these people have? Whoops. There was none. Again, that is the contempt that the Albanese government has for the job creators in Australia. And Mr Deputy President, yet again I'm going to have to put to you, you thought it couldn't get worse. Well, it does. Because let's now go to page 42 of Mr Burke and Anthony Albanese, our Prime Minister's regulatory impact statement. It refers to an article entitled, and guess what, yet another Mr Google search term, how much do payroll services cost? You couldn't speak to a small business, you couldn't speak to Aki, you couldn't speak to AI Group, you couldn't speak to Cosboa. Why would you do that? Because you might actually be told what it really costs, as opposed to what? The website bark.com actually tells you. Now, bark.com I bothered to have a look at this, um, is an interesting website uh, because the website lists its most popular services as dog and pet grooming, dog training, dog walking, life coaching, limousine hire, magicians and private investigators. You actually cannot make this up because this is what appears in a regulatory impact government from the Anthony Albanese Labor government in relation to the most fundamental changes that we are making or will be made to our industrial relations system in decades. And instead of consulting with the job creators of this country, this government holds them in contempt and uses the Google search engine, how much should I charge as a consultant in Australia and how much to pay sole role services cost? And, and they're wrong. That is actually right, Senator Brockman, because we actually asked the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, could you actually tell us what a more realistic cost is? The department came up with $175 per hour with their little Google search. Aki says, using the government's own methodology, but with a far more accurate minimum market rate, $438 per hour. Let's now look at what the government doesn't want businesses in Australia to know. Because guess what? Your bargaining tax that's about to be imposed on you by Mr Albanese has just increased. 19,574 uh, and 23,684 for a small business, 107,344 and 129,880 for a medium business, and between 126,307 and 152,824 a large business. These are significant costs. These are significant costs this appalling bill will impose on businesses of this country. And there is a reason the government didn't consult, because this legislation is all about creating conflict in workplaces, stopping businesses from negotiating pay and conditions with their own employees and basically handing over decision making to a centralised umpire. Labor have made it very clear in this bill. They want to hand over Australian workplaces to unions, including small and family businesses. Multi-employer bargaining, employers have said, will dramatically increase the number of strikes across the economy. We all want higher wages. We all want higher wages, but there is no evidence, because there has not been any modelling done in relation to this bill, that the reforms will deliver higher wages. And in fact, when Senator Pocock was asked. Did the government, in doing the deal with you, guarantee that wages would increase? Senator Pocock had to say, there is no guarantee that wages will increase. So, in other words, based on all the comments from employers, the evidence is the opposite. 
The evidence from the government is no modelling has been done. I, uh, I put to the department whose wages will increase. They couldn't tell me. When will aid wages start to increase? They couldn't tell me. And by how much will wages start to increase? Again, they couldn't tell me. When the job creators of this country stand united and say to the Prime Minister, this bill will only lead to more strikes and job losses. It will allow unions into small business, which they have never had to deal with unions before. It will potentially hold up wage rises because of increased complexity and delays. It will undermine competition, so Australians have fewer choices but face higher costs. It will force up prices and increase the cost of living and unfairly, fairly target small businesses because they do not have the resources to deal with this type of legislation, you'd actually think you'd quietly pull the legislation and listen to the job creators of this country. But that's not what the Labor government does. Uh, time is short, unfortunately. I would like to talk about the fact that also in this bill I feel very sorry for the construction industry uh, because they'll shortly be handed on a silver platter back to John Setka and the militant, uh, most militant union in Australia. Um, the government ignores all businesses. Why? Because it's not about the job creators of this country. Quite frankly, it is only about the Albanese Labor government repaying their union paymasters. And all I can say is shame on them. Thank you, Thank you Senator Cash. Senator Barbara Pocock. I rise to support the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill. There is much to like in this bill. It helps to deal with some of our big work challenges. It makes a good start, and there is more to do. We've heard a lot about the heart, how the sky will fall if this bill is passed. This is the world spruiked by those opposite, as we just heard, and on the front page of The Australian. The world of backward-looking employer organisations and old-time IR club warriors fighting the workplace battles of last century. A world of opponents of reform, of hired advocates and consultants singing from very old song sheets, spruiking alarmism about the catastrophe of multi-enterprise bargaining and the imminent collapse of small business. This mob are rerunning the IR debate of 30 years ago and their lines are tired. Out there, in the real world of work, things are different. The issues are not strike action. They're not enterprise bargaining. The issues are who will look after my kids tomorrow while I go to work. What hours have I got next week? If I knock back this shift, will I ever get another one? And how will I pay for childcare or rent if I don't get a pay rise? So many Australian businesses right now cannot find the workers they need because those workers cannot get the childcare or the flexibility that they need. If the roads that get us to work every day were failing like this, keeping people away from work, a national emergency would be declared. We'd have a critical roads to road to work infrastructure program of billions very fast. The failures of our work system are a failure of critical infrastructure and they are a failure of outdated labour law. Yet, led by the opponents of this bill, our shouty, blokey labour law debate, if we can dignify it with that title, is awash with alarm about the possibility of horrors like more collective bargaining. We need reform of our labour law, but it needs to leave the tired old preoccupations and myths of business collapse behind and instead recognise the reality of work now. We are not in 1950. We do not have a wife at home. We are in a different world, where half of workers are women, most of them carers, where a third of workers are insecurely employed where only 13 per cent of workers are covered by enterprise agreements, where union density is now at 14 per cent, where our underinvestment in the infrastructure of work, like childcare, has created a workforce shortage crisis, where undervaluation of jobs in the care economy means early childhood educators, teachers, nurses, aged care workers are voting with their feet and leaving jobs that they love where so many workers have no say over their rosters and have to choose between care for their kids and getting a pay packet. Australia's workplace relations system is broken. It is built for the workplace and workers of last century, not this one. 
and it is built for someone who can work a standard working week when our lives are no longer standard. It is not the 50s. It is not even the 1980s. Most of us hold down a job over our life cycle and have kids, kids who need our support and, as any parent who's parented a teenager knows, not for a few years but for decades. In an ageing population, we have older parents and friends who also need our care. We need a labour law that has our back as we put together our jobs and our care. We need a labour law that does not make insecurity, the absence of paid holidays or sick leave, low pay and unpredictable working time the price of being a mother or a father. A labour law that does not reward a lifetime of working and caring with an old age of poverty. And we need to ensure that the paid workers who do the work in our care system, in early childhood education and care, aged care, respite care, disability care, the people who enable the rest, so many others, to get to work, are paid decently with jobs that enable them to both work and care. Our IR system needs a complete reset. It is not fit for purpose. Australian workers are enduring real wage falls despite historic profit levels. Too many are working casually—25 per cent of our workforce—young people, women, migrants. Too many workers are on a perpetual cycle of limited-term contracts that get rolled over every year or every few months with no pay certainty, no career. The gig economy is growing very fast. It's now over 250,000 workers with no job security, no access to safe work and no predictability in terms of pay and hours. As things stand in Australia, our army of five million working carers most of us over our life, so life course, and 40 per cent of all workers that work on any day of the week in Australia are contorting themselves around outdated labour law unsuited to the world out there. In too many workplaces, wage theft is real. It is robbery. It needs to be outlawed with a criminal penalty. Unpaid overtime is common. The average Australian now works six weeks unpaid extra hours every year. Our workplace is now on the phone, in a handbag or in our back pocket, and it's in vigorous competition with the rest of our lives, especially if we have to stay sweet with the boss to keep our shifts or to get a promotion. A right to disconnect from work when the paid hours that we're paid to do are finished is a remote possibility but a real need for so many Australians. New technologies that promised freedom and a shorter working week have instead tethered too many workers to their phones and their laptops, extending the length of the working week but without pay. A proud nation that led the world on shortening the working week in 1856 with the eight-hour day is now going the wrong way, with long hours for many and no sign of the four-day week promised by new technology and productivity increases. The productivity gains of recent years have flown straight to profits with a wages system which has made it too hard for workers to bargain collectively to get a pay rise. Unless, of course, you happen to be in the executive class, where wages have accelerated obscenely in recent years, leaving ordinary Australian workers far, far behind. When the Keating Labor government introduced enterprise bargaining in 1991 with the Accord Mark 7, many women, including myself, said it would not work for women it wouldn't work for the low paid and for whole industries that had no elaborate working conditions or lengthy classification structures to compress or trade off for a pay rise. And so it has proved. It was an enterprise bargaining system that suited more powerful workers and male dominated industries, but it failed women, it failed the low paid, and it failed young people. 30 years on, it has run its course, and we have repped what the Keating Labor government sowed along with the fruit of successful Liberal government workplace reforms that have stripped back working conditions, accelerated an epidemic of job insecurity, seen real wages fall and stalled the gender pay gap. This system, with its failed regulation piled on failed regulation, has now failed most workers. It is rife with secrecy about pay. It has seen the introduction of repressive anti-union machinery like the ABCC and The Rock Order. built to create a punitive anti-union regime 
that stops unionists from doing their jobs and stops workers from being able to join their union. In my state, South Australia, only 5 per cent of workers are now covered by collective agreements. Most Australian workers have to wait for a national minimum wage increase to get a pay rise, and they are falling behind. We need a return to a more collective arrangement that sets decent, livable wages and conditions, not a bare minimum that leaves too many in working poverty. And we need to make it easier for undervalued occupations, women's jobs like childhood educators, to get better pay that recognises their skills and their experience. Too many workers now cannot predict the ro their rosters of work. Not next week, not tomorrow. They're nervous about refusing a shift or about asking for flexibility. Their employers can put them on minimum hours contracts of, say, 10 hours and then every week give them an extra 15 hours without any penalty rates for their extra time and no guarantee that they can truly rely on those hours into the future. How can they organise care for their kids or a housing loan? Roster injustice is rife in our workplaces and it must be fixed. We Greens have pushed hard from the very beginning of this process of reform to get some long-standing Greens policies reflected in Labor law, and I'm pleased that Labor has heard us and built some of them in. This bill will help lift the pay of the lowest paid. With new Fair Work Commission objects of job security and gender equality and new panels, the Commission can more easily act to revalue care jobs that are underpaid. It removes the anti-union devices of the ABCC and the ROC. It takes steps to abolish endless limited-term contracts. And most importantly, we have very, worked very hard to ensure that the Better Off Overall Test continues to protect workers, that no one falls through any cracks in the boot, that it protects the most disadvantaged, including retail and hospitality workers, indeed all workers. The bill puts an end to corrosive pay secrecy, the enemy of fairness and of gender pay equity, and it offers improved prevention of sexual harassment and better prevention of discrimination around breastfeeding and gender identity. Importantly, the bill, with our amendments, fixes the anomaly that left just two of the 11 national employment standards—the right to request flexibility or to ask for an extension of unpaid parental leave—without any enforcement mechanism. What do you call a labour law without enforcement? A failed gesture. We have the evidence on this. Around five in ten Australian workers would like to ask their bosses for flexibility, and around two in ten do ask, and they get what they want. There are a further three in ten who would like to ask and who don't. They are fearful about the culture in their workplace and the stigma that will arise from asking. The existing unenforced right to request flexibility made no difference to that st statistic. This bill fixes that, and it's long been Greens' policy. We know that Australian workers need this flexibility and they need more. So we will move amendments to widen eligibility for the right to request flexibility. This right should be available to all employees, not just those with narrowly defined family responsibilities. It is only when seeking flexibility is something available to all that the stigma will be removed from asking for it. And we will see more men seeking flexibility and hopefully sharing domestic and care responsibilities as a result. Wider eligibility for flexibility has been adopted in the UK on clear evidence about its value. And guess what? The sky has not fallen. We will also move amendments to establish a positive duty in favour of creating flexible workplaces in Australia. A modern workplace should create an environment that actively anticipates the needs of workers and doesn't require individuals to have to push for it one by one. We will move an amendment that allows the Fair Work Commission to deal with employers who, are, who unfairly deny requests for an extension to unpaid parental leave. This will support parents to take the time they need to care for their child. It's an important step forward alongside other important steps, like an increase in paid parental leave. We will also move an amendment to increase the minimum wage to ensure all workers have a meaningful living wage. Our amendment aims to establish a new minimum wage at 60 per cent of the median wage. 
This is based on international best practice. It will lift the minimum wage, so important in the current cost of living crisis. Australian workers need improved workplace laws, laws that deal with 21st century life and work. The job of reform is not over. There is more to do. The Greens want to see all workers get paid sick leave and holiday leave. The pandemic has shown us how important sick leave is, and anyone who works for a year, whether casual or permanent, should get a chance for rest and recuperation. New Zealand has done this. We should do it too. We also need to see improved job security. Casual work should not be endemic. It should only exist where work is genuinely casual, intermittent or seasonal. We must protect the rights of gig workers. We must criminalise wage theft and we should improve roster justice. Workers need a right to disconnect from the technologies which tie them to work when their paid hours are done. They should not be doing six weeks unpaid work every year. We have made an important start on reforming Australia's labour law to make it fit for the current century and the kinds of workers that are at work in our workforce. It's an important and valuable set of changes. We'll be back. We want to see real change on other pressing work issues of our century, but this is an important positive step to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Little. Thank you. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022. Labor's proposed workplace changes represent the most radical shake-up of Australia's industrial relations system in decades. The Albanese government's new IR laws blatantly provide unions the tools to show their workplace muscle. And in my home state of South Australia, union demands and bullying is already rattling businesses and threatening investment and growth, particularly in the construction industry. In South Australia, the construction industry is a major employer of nearly 75,000 people, equivalent to 8.6 per cent of the total workforce, contributing $8 billion to Grace State product in 2021. Total construction work in 2021 in South Australia was valued at $14.5 billion, equivalent to 6.5 per cent of all construction work carried out in Australia. This critical industry to the South Australian economy is being put at risk by this IR bill, which is turning investment and developers off from financing building and infrastructure projects that employ many hundreds of South Australians. Among these developers to voice concerns is well-known Adelaide property developer Theo Maris, founder and chairman of Maris Group, who raised the risks of millions of dollars in investment and scores of jobs. His next project, the Rymal, a 27 million 16-storey apartment complex, could be unviable amid instability and uncertainty in the sector. He's not anti-union, but has said a lower-cost state such as South Australia cannot compete with the eastern state wages and conditions as demanded by the CFMEU. Already, the CFMEU is spending tens of thousands of their members' money to wrap an Adelaide tram completely in the CFMEU slogan, a union of opportunity. Their membership drive is up and running absolutely in South Australia. Trade union membership Australia-wide has been in decades-long decline and stands at 14 per cent nationally and 14.1 per cent in South Australia, as outlined in the latest ABS stats. We heard in Senate estimates that union membership will likely rise with the passing of this bill. Labor says they stand for regulation, transparency and women, but not, it seems, when it relates to its union paymasters. Recently, in the Education and Employment Senate Committee, a union-aligned think tank organisation per capita told us it draws the line at accepting donations from the CFMEU because of its treatment of women. Yet, Labor dances with them when it suits. Let me demonstrate the hypocrisy. During the SA state election, the Labor Party accepted, then later returned a donation of some $125,000 from the CFMEU. This is bad for the economy. Master Builders SA has outlined that workers were being intimidated to join the CFMEU, while builders were being pressured to agree to pay deals 
that could send them broke. Business SA, the Australian Industry Group, Motor Industry Association, SANT, SA Wine Industry Association and Australian Hotels Association have raised concerns over this legislation. Business told you their concerns, yet they got ignored. At a time when businesses are struggling with staff shortages and rapidly increasing power costs, this is yet another impost. Nothing in your plan for cost of living for Australia, let alone businesses that employ them. Multi-employer bargaining will force employers to bargain with other businesses who may even be competitors because they are deemed to be of common interest or reasonably comparable. We heard some outrageous examples of the potential to be caught by this legislation with other businesses that might be seemingly similar but are significantly different. We all want higher wages in Australia, but there is no evidence that the IR reforms proposed by this bill will deliver higher wages or even higher productivity. In fact, based on comments from employers, the people who employ Australians remember that's not the unions and it's not the government. The evidence from them is quite the opposite. Earlier this month, in my home of Adelaide, a group of union workers launched industrial action against a South Australian-based crane company vowing to not fold until they receive a pay rise and better conditions. That type of behaviour is not conducive to constructive negotiations in any responsible way, and abolishing the ABCC does not help that. It was claimed the union rejected a 16 per cent pay rise, instead demanding a pay rise of 25 per cent. The Crane Service employs 78 people. And if you think the Senator Pocock deal doesn't make this bad bill, Better? Think again. These minor amendments will do nothing to allay the concerns of small, medium family businesses across Australia and in my home state of South Australia. Changing the definition of a small business from fewer than 15 employees to fewer than 20 goes nowhere near far enough and still includes casuals. The other suggested amendments are minor and have no real impact on the overall bill. But let me tell you what we understand is the impact. This bill could affect 350,000 South Australians who work in the 145,000 small businesses in South Australia. The Albanese government's own modelling shows that small and medium businesses will have to pay between 14,000 and 80,000 in bargaining costs because of these industrial relations changes. There is a basic calculation error by the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations in the regulatory impact statement, which means the bargaining costs for medium businesses will be $5,000 higher than documented. That error means that medium-sized businesses will pay over $80,000 when roped into multi-employer bargaining rather than the $75,184.48 figure quoted in the document. We know that the Labor Party doesn't have regard for businesses or the jobs it creates, but surely it must have been important to get the numbers right. This bill, in the very short time we've had to examine it, has been exposed as an absolute shambles, hastily conceived, designed only for their union paymasters. The Coalition Senator's dissenting report is the most accurate portrayal of this bill and what it will do to Australian businesses and the people employed by them. This dissenting report recommends the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 is not passed by the Senate. The Albanese government apologised to the Australian people for promising that industry-wide bargaining was not part of our policy before the election and then attempt to legislate it by stealth once elected. Australians deserve an apology for that. Labor speaks of equality and of supporting women back into the workforce, yet this IR bill will impact negatively mostly on women. According to Workforce Gender Equality Agency data, 
Women represent almost 57 per cent of the retail workforce. That's 57 per cent of the retail workforce across the nation. They account for 68 per cent of sales assistants, 75 per cent of checkout operators and cashiers, 58 per cent of retail supervisors. Retail told us about the likely impact of this bill. Women control 75 per cent of consumer spending, and according to the Australian Retailers Association, and with their jobs gone, the impact on family incomes will be dramatic, and it will only add to the cost of living pressures they are already experiencing. This is not what Australians or their employers need. Thank you, Thank you Senator Little. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. We have no evidence this legislation will result in more secure employment or improved wages, but it has served as a good indication of how the Albanese government will conduct itself in this parliament in the future. It will carve into union bo bosses and rush through bad laws that will undo years of painstaking work by this parliament to improve Australia's economic productivity. Labor may have won this year's election, but the result was more definitely not a mandate for the regressive measures in this legislation. In fact, this bill, does go, in fact, this bill goes against the only mandate which truly exists for industrial relations laws. The 2016 double dissolution election triggered by bills to establish the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisations Commission. Those bills were the subject of months, if not years, of inquiry, debate and negotiation and were taken to the Australian people in an election. In the last parliament, the most recent amendments to the Fair Work Act were the subject of inquiries lasting at least three and a half months. On this occasion, however, only three weeks were given to the Senate Education and Employment Legislation Committee to inquire into the bill, and this was during budget estimates. As a result, public hearings were held at very short notice and witnesses who appeared did not even have time to make their submissions. Labor was announcing amendments to its own legislation while this inquiry was taking place. Today, following only a few days of cursory scrutiny and limited debate, this parliament seems likely to pass a poorly drafted bill with unjustified haste and no electoral mandate. I am compelled to remind the government of something which should be obvious but apparently es escapes them. A person's wage cannot increase if they do not have a wage, and that's what this rushed bill is risking. The, that the corrupt thugs masquerading as union bosses want this bill that very badly is all the evidence we need that it's a very bad bill. They're looking forward to returning to the bad old days when they could hold businesses and economic productivity to ransom over trivial issues like a worker not being up to date with union fees. The ABCC prevented a lot of that, and now we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's pretty obvious this legislation is ultimately just a ploy to gain more union members and therefore more money for the Australian Labor Party. Don't think for a moment we've forgotten previous attempts by Labor governments to do this. For example, the farce that was the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. At one stage there last week, I held some hope Labor would slow things down and allow the Senate due time to consider the implications of this bill and make it better. There was some hope the really awful parts of the bill, like multi-employer bargaining, the poor definition of small business, the attempt to decouple productivity from wages and measures to force small business into crippling enterprise agreements they have no part in negotiating could have been separated. But no, 
Labor had to have everything passed before Christmas and successfully gambled on pressuring a rookie cross-bench senator into letting it happen. Senator Pocock was only saying a few days ago that much more time was needed to review this omnibus bill, but he's rolled over for a couple of trivial and ultimately useless concessions. Senator Pocock gave his word to other crossbenchers that we would stand together and demand the more contentious parts of this bill be split from it and considered separately without undue haste. That hasn't happened. There's an article in the Sydney Morning Herald today with Senator Pocock telling readers he wrote, D W Y S Y W D in his rugby locker. What do you say you will do? Do what you say you will do. Repeat it. Do what you say you will do. Well, that wasn't the case, was it? That hasn't happened. Doormat Dave's word means nothing. My chief Sorry, concern. Excuse me, um, Senator Henson. Senator Billick. Uh, point of order. I think um, senators need to be referred to by their title, not by um, nicknames put upon by other members of the Senate. Thank you, Senator Billick. Se Senator Hanson, if you could refer to colleagues by their correct title, please. Thank you. Thank you. My chief concern is that this bill is going to drive up costs for the small businesses which can least afford it. There has been no meaningful consultation with the small business sector. At a briefing on the bill last week, I was provided with a lot of detail about extensive consultations with at least 50 unions and a handful of large employer groups like the Minerals Councils. While there was about 50 consultations with the unions, probably in total maybe about eight to ten different union groups. Who knows, it might have been more. But the unions got through the Fair Work Commission's door rather than small businesses or anyone else or even big business. So they were high on their agenda to hear what they had to say. When I asked the Fair Work Commission about which small businesses they had met with, they couldn't answer me. They couldn't give me the names of it. And I even asked the general manager if he'd ever run, or actually everyone on board, if they'd ever run a small business or worked in one. His answer was that he had always been a public servant. In other words, no, never run a business, never employed staff, had no idea what it was like. I have run my own small businesses. Plumbing, farming, food processing, and of course my fish and chip shop for 10 years as a single, a single parent. And also grew up in one for the first 16 years of my life. Grew up in a small business. So you really, you know, small business has been part of my life, most of my working life. Not with, not with the, the people in this place. Most of you have never, never Order. run probably a small business with employed like. staff. So the fact is you Order. have no idea the impact that you're going to have on businesses out there. It's a two-way street whether you're an employee or an employer. They go hand in hand. And in speaking to them over the past few months, um, it's very clear they're struggling with the consequences of inflation as much as, if not more than, Australian households. They are experiencing big increases in operating costs, insurance premiums, rents and government taxes or rates. So many of these small businesses have been established by owners with capital raised from credit or from mortgaging their homes, so they too are feeling the, the bite of rising interest rates. And this is what people have to consider. They all go out there and think we should be part of the profits. Well, you know what? If you want part of the profits, then go out and, and you know, take out your loans, your interest loans, um, put yourself in mortgage up to the hilt, mortgage your home, and you can run your own small business as much as you want to, and you can get the profits. We don't live in a communist country. We live in a democratic society, whereas this bill is just dictating of what the workers should have. That's communism. That's socialism. That's communism. That's what this is about. And you think that one business over another business, you know, you're, you're tying it all in. If it's like-minded business, 
That, and you haven't really explained that in itself. What's a like-minded business? So you're saying enterprise bargaining. If you really are serious about this, then what you do is you look at the, the um, state and federal awards. That's what you do. And you raise the state and federal awards. You don't tell businesses, the private enterprise, that they must then um, bargain as far as everything else. It's plus, plus, plus. And no one has bothered to actually ask the question, can businesses afford it? You have never asked the question, can businesses afford it? Yeah. It's OK. I'm all for the worker and the inflation rights and looking after the worker for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. But you are pushing it from one side. This is the unions. This is the unions. It's about unionisation. It's about unions getting into businesses and it's about the unions signing up more people because you've only got about 13 or 14 per cent of Australians who are part of the unions. So that's what this is all about. Nothing more than that. The, business, the businesses they are having difficulty sourcing skilled Australian workers and their productivity is falling as a result. They are also now required to pay out up to 10 days of domestic violence leave thanks to this government, another at a cost of business. This bill does nothing about these issues and in fact places yet more costs on small businesses which is ultimately being passed on to the consumers. We should not be pushing small businesses to take on more costs to fund enterprise bargaining. This increases inflation, not wages, and threatens jobs rather than make them more secure. Also missing from this debate is the fact that if higher wages are forced upon small businesses, they will face increased payroll tax from greedy state governments. Have you considered that? Have you considered that if you're actually going to increase the wages on small businesses, then their, their payroll tax is going to go up? For what? This is why, if you had any common sense, that's what you would address. You'd actually work with the state governments to get rid of payroll tax so that the employers can actually employ more people without being fined a tax. For what? Because they employ people. How, what a stupid tax it is. You've done absolutely nothing about that. If you had any common sense, do you deal with the payroll tax before you start um, telling businesses what to do? This bill should never have been introduced without a serious discussion with the states about reducing payroll tax. One nation cannot and will not support this bill. And what I ask the, the, the bureaucrats, wonderful bureaucrats, know everything, read it in the textbooks, want it, learn it from universities and come in here and start telling the ministers who don't even know their own jobs and then start going along with everything the bureaucrats say. But what should have happened with this whole thing is um, you know, a sensible debate, consultation process to understand because you have not proven to me that there is going to be an increase in wages. You have not proven your point here. And that's what it's all about. Even your mining industry should never have been tied up in this, should never have tied up the mining industry in this. Most of the mining industries pay above the award wages with anyone to do with the, this fair work. You've, it's ill thought out. You've actually got a rookie senator who is actually going to go along with you and doesn't understand, who was not part of the ABCC, which One Nation was, in the first, you know, for three months we debated this cons consultation that went on, that we investigated, we spoke to businesses, we spoke to unions, we spoke to everyone. And now with the ABCC, the thuggery that goes on in these construction industries due to the unions that small businesses were going under, that if they didn't actually join the union and pay their $5,000 fee, they didn't, couldn't unload the concrete and uh, it hardened on them. They lost the truckload of concrete or unions go in there and thuggery. Or it was about these building construction sites are an increased cost to it, about 30 per cent of an increased cost to these construction sites because of the union's thuggery that was going on. That stopped under the ABCC. So it's going to be quite interesting what happens in Australia now when this passes under Labor. And I wonder if some people are going to say, well, whether they got it right or whether they got it wrong. But it just frustrates me to no end that I, you know, the Labor Party relies on the unions for their funding, for their donations, and you have a look who's on your benches. All union reps, most of you are from the unions. 
You actually move up through the ranks, you actually have been part of the unions, and you all end up here in Parliament. Great pathway for people to actually end up in this place is the unions. And it's not the union members I'm having a go at, I'm having a go at the union bosses because you're pushing it because of your own self interest, your own self gains, to end up on the benches here in this place. And that's what frustrates me is that the, the general populace is going to be the ones who will suffer because of this ill thought out bill. Um, that is being brought before this parliament. We call for sensible, one nation calls for sensible measures to address the rising cost of living and doing business, tax reform, welfare reform, and especially immigration reform. We call for this legislation to be thrown out into the rubbish bin where it belongs. Hey, hey. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Whew. So there's no doubt that Australia is in the midst of a cost of living crisis. For Australian households, basic costs like rent, mortgage repayments, electricity, childcare and GP services are going through the roof. Whoever would have thought that Hobart would have the highest rentals in Australia? Whoever would have thought that? And everyone knows that we inherited this crisis from the previous government. But now that they're in opposition, they have the temerity, the temerity to demand that we instantly fix the mess that they created. And if the opposition continue on their current course, then it begs the question, what is their plan to get wages moving again? And the fact is, they have none. They have none. Zilch, zero, nothing. When those opposite have abandoned any commitment to real wage growth, then they have zero credibility. Zero when it comes to talking about cost of living pressures. When they were in government, they presided over record low wages growth. They refused to support an increase in the minimum wage for Australia's lowest paid workers. So we saw an explosion under the previous government of insecure forms of work, such as labour hire and contracting, even in the public service. And those opposites stood idly by while gig economy workers were mercilessly underpaid and exploited. Who can ever forget the former finance minister admitting that low wages were, and I quote, a deliberate economic policy? Those opposite admitted proudly and unequivocally that they sought to keep wages low. When those opposite cry crocodile tears about the cost of living pressures Australian households are facing, their words ring hollow because they have zero commitment to real wage growth, absolutely none. When enterprise bargaining is working, productivity gains get shared between business and workers. But the bargaining system is clearly broken. In the last 10 years, business profits have grown 133 per cent. 133 per cent. And wages, how much have wages lifted? A little over 35 per cent. So who's reaping the benefit there? And after waiting 10 years for their fair share of productivity gains, workers have waited way too long for a decent pay rise. How much do the opposition, how much longer do the opposition want them to wait? Come on, give me a timeline. How much longer do you want low-paid workers to wait? To those listening, I would say, don't be fooled by the all, all the confected outrage from those opposite on behalf of business. They do not have a monopoly on understanding the needs of business. For the benefit of Senator Hanson, I grew up in a small business family and I've run my own business. I've also worked as a union official and negotiated agreements on behalf of workers. And as a former early childhood educator, I think I can speak with authority that it is one industry where wages really need to get moving. But those opposite would be happy to deny early childhood educators a pay rise. This is a prime example of an industry dominated by female workers where the importance of the work and the level of qualification needed to do the work is simply not reflected in the pay. I challenge anyone on that side to spend a week changing other people's nappies in an early childhood education area. Any one of you change other people's babies' nappies for a week, see how much you think they should be paid. Because I can tell you, I know people that gag at changing their own people's babies' nappies, especially males, 
let alone going in and changing other people's. You have no idea how the early childhood educators work. Not a speck. Educator pay is at complete odds with the value we placed on children in their care. And it shocks me, it still shocks me, that the argument workers and their unions in that industry are making are the same arguments that I put forward when I worked in the industry more than 30 years ago. We're still having the argument, and those on that side want to block those workers from getting a pay rise. You are disgusting. So, as a former educator, I was pleased to hear support for the government reforms from Ms Julia Price, Executive Director of the Community Child Care Association. Ms Price, who represents over 750 community not-for-profit early childhood education and care centres, told the Senate inquiry into this bill that multi-employer bargaining is, and I quote, a fantastic instrument to help ensure better wages and conditions. She said that a multi-employer agreement covering 60 early childhood education um, services in Victoria was of great help to small community-owned centres that, quote, don't necessarily have the expertise in industrial relations to be able to negotiate an agreement themselves. Mr Acting Deputy President, let's not forget that bargaining has benefits for businesses, not just for workers. For example, Agreements can have a simpler set of tailored conditions when compared to the award, and businesses can also negotiate productivity improvements with their workforce. And it's unfortunate that others also in this place have chosen not to play a constructive role, and some have effectively dealt themselves out of any meaningful engagement on shaping the provisions of this bill. Sadly, the opposition have such an ideological hatred of unions that they will oppose anything that might involve them, even if it's good for business. It's knee-jerk. It's almost Pavlovian. Not one of those based on a consideration of good, decent public policy. But if they don't support this bill, let the record show that Labor sought to address the pain of cost of living pressures by getting wages moving again, while those opposite continued to stand in the way. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs, Better Pay Bill 2022. Well, it didn't really take long, did it, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, for this government to resurrect the industrial relations uh, wars of long ago under the guise of growing wages, as we've just heard, uh, this government has undertaken, firstly, a sham process of consultation and, secondly, an extraordinarily rushed inquiry process. And Despite some very strong criticism of this bill from many sectors of the economy, the government is pushing on regardless without any modelling, with no funding and, importantly, no election mandate. This bill will cost jobs. It's going to drive down productivity, it's going to increase costs to small business, and it's going to add to inflation. There is no guarantee that it's going to grow wages. Firstly, the consultation process. Now, the government was motivated by pure ideology and displayed a blind disregard for the usual procedures and processes involving the scrutiny of legislation that is usually accompanied with such a substantial piece of legislation, let alone an omnibus bill. I mean, here it is here. It's nearly 250 pages of legislation, and the committee was given 22 days to undertake an inquiry. Now, we all work here. This is our job to scrutinise legislation. I didn't mind the, the long days. I didn't mind the late nights. It's, it's my job. But what about the stakeholders that needed to consider the bill, take the time to put some effort in, to put their thoughts on paper, send it through to the committee, give time for the committee to have a read of it, and then maybe form some questions that they could ask them in an inquiry? We weren't given that chance at all. Now, despite what it spins—and we've heard plenty of it. The government did not take the significant industrial relations reform to the 2022 federal election. In fact, the then shadow treasurer, the member for Rankin, appeared on television in November last year—I think it was on Insiders—he said 
uh, he was asked if industry-wide bargaining was on the agenda. Now, the Treasurer replied, it's not part of our policy. It's not part of our policy, he said. So maybe the Treasurer is not in the loop. Maybe the Treasurer is uh, not in the loop on the government's industrial relations agenda. Or, or he was answering with real honesty back then when he knew that the real cost to such a move would be to the Australian economy. Now, holding a sham talk fest like the Jobs and Skills Summit so closely after the election, it does not substitute for a mandate from the, uh, from the Australian people for the introduction of a very radical and extreme new industrial relations reform that will, make no doubt about this, devastate the Australian economy. It was evident very early on that the depth of this bill came as a shock to many stakeholders. You only had to gauge the red-hot reaction from many sectors in the Australian economy that this bill had come like a bolt out of the blue. Some vague references about low-paid workers and female-dominated sections of the sectors of the economy at the Jobs and Skills Summit is no substitute for consultation, is no substitute for a mandate. This isn't about they, they didn't demonstrate industry-wide consultation. So back on election night, sadly, and we're still living that, when the now Prime Minister spoke about conciliation and seeking a common purpose and promoting unity, I don't think many people thought that we'd see a bill like this. Then there was a time frame, as I discussed, that we were given. 22 days this committee was given. 22 days to consider such a comprehensive, such a significant bill that is overhauling the industrial relations system. Now, I remember we had a couple of bills that were paled in insignificance in terms of the complexity in the last parliament. I was on the committee, the Education and Employment Committee at that time. Four months! And this lot over here were complaining that we only went to five capital cities for the inquiry. You were on it, Mr. Uh, Senator McGrath. That's right. You were the chair, and we got—we were absolutely hauled over the coals for it. But this lot gave us 22 days. Now, the first two public hearings occurred even before the date that the submissions were due. We, we had this ludicrous situation where we were being handed. Now I'm the deputy chair of this committee, so I followed it all the way through. Where we were sitting there having people in front of us that actually hadn't had time to be able to put in a submission. Now, I don't blame them. I don't blame them because it was this government that gave them that ridiculous time frame. Now, the fifth hearing was held, would you believe it, on the day that the committee had to table its report. Now, anyone that follows this, and I don't expect people at home would necessarily get this, but you can't use the evidence from a hearing until it's on Hansard. Now, we don't get the transcript of Hansard, for a couple of days after. Now, thankfully, Hansard were very, very efficient. Thank you, Hansard. You got it to us the next day, which was fantastic. Thank you very much. We got it the next day. But that was like after the report had to be in. So I just want to foreshadow at the end of my remarks here, I'll, I'll actually be seeking, to, seeking leave to uh, table some additional comments. Now, you compare this, as I said, uh, to the previous government. We, had four, we gave four months for the, uh, the uh, the Supporting Australia Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill, and it was over three months for the Ensuring Integrity Bill. Uh, you know, we're, what we've seen here is not proper process. They're avoiding scrutiny on this bill. They're trying to rush it through before Christmas, just so they can return to their paymasters in the unions and show that they did a good job. This is what it's about. It's about giving the unions a very large Christmas present. You know, it was such a rushed process that when the bill was tabled in the House of Representatives, the minister that went tabling the bill also moved 155 amendments. Apparently. Unbelievable. I mean, has this happened? I, can't, I, I, I haven't been around long enough to know, but I'm sure it's been a very long time since we've seen something as ridiculous as that. That's how rushed this has been. It's disorganised, it's haphazard. Anything to avoid scrutiny sums up the process that we're seeing with this bill. Now, during the first couple of uh, EEC public hearings, it became 
uh, it quickly became apparent that since the introduction of enterprise bargaining 30 years ago, we've seen less and less strikes. Now, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. It's good for productivity. However, I'm not convinced that those on the other side, or those within the union movement, think that, uh, that there's been enough strikes in that time. And that's the core of what this bill aims to do. It's re-energising the strike capability of unions. It has been interesting to read some of the, the, the recent comments of Paul Keating and Bill Kelty, two of the architects of enterprise bargaining in the late 1990s, uh, on, on why the framework they devised has been failing uh, has been failing in increased productivity and overall wages growth. They lay the blame squarely at the feet of the Gillard government. In fact, they believed that it was, it was that government that made enterprise bargaining much, much harder. Even more fascinating is that because of the free fall in union membership over the past three decades, which is currently around 14 per cent, according to the ABS, Mr Kelty thinks that we may see an uplift in union militancy if, if there are not enough ordinary workers to counterbalance militant leadership. And I quote Mr Kelty right now. I said, he said, I, it, I would be seen as some right-wing crank in some of these unions because of, because of the trots that currently run them. Now, this brings me to my second point about what this bill is actually about. This is about growing union membership by stealth. Unsurprisingly, this has sent off alarm bells in many sectors of the community because they do not want to see a repeat of the 1970s when unions were out of control and ran rampant through Australian workplaces. The protective strike action was a, a strong theme of the 1970s, reaching a peak in 1974 during the incompetent Whitlam government. Now, Without doubt, one of the sectors that will be worse off under this bill will be the very an all-important small business sector. According to the Small Business Development Corporation from my home state of Western Australia, 97 per cent of businesses are classified as, uh, as small. So how will this bill be good for small business? Or more to the point, is it about giving unions a foothold in a sector that they've never had access to before? During the second hearing, I asked one stakeholder, the Franchise Council of Australia, you know, mostly small businesses in that sector, uh, wh wh whether this bill will lead to an increase in wages for employees <coughs> or an increase in union involvement in small business. And Ms Alfred said, we would suggest that the union involvement in small business may ultimately undermine the sustainability and viability of small businesses, which undermines the viability of jobs, so we have grave concerns on that basis. Now, small businesses they don't, they don't have, small, they don't have uh, uh, HR departments and legal departments to shield union melding and fend away applications being filed against it by organisations who do not respect the, the law. In fact, uh, they have stated that they believe that it is okay to break the law. Small business operators and mums and dads who work long hours, often seven days a week, who just want to get on with running their business, not examining the reams of complex legislation and keep keeping unions at bay. Now, I'm very concerned that small businesses could be compelled into bargaining process involuntary and that they could be swamped by larger employers in the same sector while, uh, under the majority vote support proposition. Now, we could have a crazy situation in a shopping centre where Coles and Woolworths are dragged to bargain together. I mean, these guys are competitors, we know that. And they are dragged in with smaller businesses who don't have the same scale, which don't have the same scale to be able to deal with it. There are serious impacts on small businesses through this bill. Now, on the point of serious impact, this bill abolishes the ABCC and the ROC. And the Albanese government's animosity of this important regulator, of course it's well known, we hear it a lot. As recently on the 27th of July 2022, the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations said of the ABC, this has not been a good regulator. This is a regulator that has simply increased conflict, that has got, that has got in the way where agreements exist and where agreements are possible. Now, the reasons for their dislike are hardly surprising. The ABCC was actually very good at its job. Time and again, the ABCC prosecuted terrible recidivist behaviour of the union allies. Which has, which, of the Labor Party's union allies, which has included the verbal abuse and threats against inspectors, an outright, outright breaking of the law. Its success rate was commendably high, and the list of union transgressions are too many to name here. 
We know what the minister thinks of the ABCC, and this, but this is what the master builders said of the same regulator that the minister has labelled as simply uh, increasing conflict. The, this is what the master builders have said. The ABC has made a significant difference in ensuring that industry participants comply with the rule of law and has driven much needed positive industry cultural change. The work of the ABC is not done yet and its removal will undo the significant improvement that it has delivered for our building and construction industry. Now, tasking the Fair Work Ombudsman is not a like-for-like -like comparison. This bill removes the building code. The, 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 the Ombudsman does not have the same powers that the ABCC has. Now, the government will say that this bill does not apply to the CFMEU because the bill provisions exclude general building and construction work. Well, well, thankfully, it will now include uh, civil as well as commercial construction, but the bill does include some contractors, such as electricians, plumbers, metal workers uh, from the multi-employer uh, bargaining. And we sure know that the CFMEU they are going to find a way around these exclusions, any exclusions. Why would they do that? Well, because they are very, very well versed in breaking the law. It is any wonder that the CFMEU thinks that it's Christmas has come early. It's come even before we're in December. Now, never mind the inflation crisis that's going on, uh, that's unfolding under this watch, uh, under the watch of this government. This is the priority of this government: the bringing on this bill. Now, RBA forecasts that uh, we're going to see inflation hit 8 per cent by Christmas. There's no talk of tackling this uh, this crisis that we've got right now. Instead, they're introducing bills like this. Now, I, I um, foreshadow that I'll be. Uh, uh, tabling some additional comments, but I do also want to, on behalf of Senator Cash, move, uh, move an amendment uh, on sheet 1697. So I'll move, move that on behalf of Senator Cash, and I seek leave to table uh, additional comments. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. And that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And so far, what we've heard from the coalition is a, <coughs> the same old tired contributions they do to um, debates around industrial relations, time in, time in, year after year. Always, it's the hatred of organised labour. They can't stand it. They can't stand workers ha getting a, a, a even go at um, negotiation. They can't stand it. They can't stand workers organising for themselves. And, and you know that was the, at the heart of the contributions that we've heard thus far, because what they keep t um, talking about and what they refuse to accept is the fact that we've just had nine years, nine years of a government that deliberately kept wages low. Now, you know, I didn't bell the cat on that. Senator Cormann did, or former Senator Cormann did. He, he, he belled the cat on that. And this is a piece of legislation that uh, covers, uh, is, all about, is all about secure jobs so, secure jobs and better, um, better pay, because what Australian workers were uh, left with was tasting left with after um, nearly uh, ten years of the coalition government was a bitter cocktail. That was what they were left with: a cocktail of an environment of insecure work, deliberately um, deliberately designed policies keeping wages low. And a massive trillion dollar debt. Each of those, each of those, count them off, one, two, three, can't be denied from those opposite. Cannot be denied. That is, that is that is, they are facts. So, Mr. President, the bill I rise to speak on today will enable workers to oh, sorry, Mr. Acting Dep oh sorry, dear. Sorry, I shouldn't um, Maybe one day, you never know, Senator Ban. Maybe one day, the bill I rise to speak on today will enable workers to bargain across 
enterprises and clamp down on the scourge of insecure work uh, across our country, and particularly in my home state of Tasmania. The Secure Job Better Wage Bill implements our election commitment and delivers on some of the immediate outcomes of the Jobs and Skills Summit in September. Now, this bill is the first tranche of the Albanese Labor government's workplace relations reforms, designed to modernise Australia's workplace relations systems. And finally, and finally, after nine years of coalition government, get wages moving. This bill will bring Australian industrial relations up to speed with many countries around the world, and it will allow workers doing the same job to be paid the same wage through industry-wide bargaining. Industry-wide bargaining will finally stop the, pra the practice of large corporations paying employers less than, um, than others in the same job, in the same uniform. President, oh, Mr Acting Deputy President, Tasmanians have received the short straw when it comes to wages and conditions, something which has not been helped by consecutive federal and state Liberal governments. Tasmanian workers earn on average $200 a week less than their mainland counterparts, equating to about $10,000 a year. On top of this, if you are a woman in Tasmania, you can expect to take home a further $163 less than the male doing the same job. So, as well as battling insecure work and the lowest wages in the country, Tasmanians are also experiencing the highest rate of inflation out of all jurisdictions. And despite wages currently growing at a slightly higher rate in Tasmania compared to the rest of the country, the difference is so small that Tasmanian workers won't actually catch up until next century. So finally, Tasmanians can take a breath and know that this government, the Albanese Labor government, will finally spend their time fighting for them. We're not wasting any time in making improvements to the workplace relations system, so it can work better for everyone. This bill will ban paid secrecy clauses in enterprise agreements so workers can freely speak about their pay and conditions to their co-workers. Paid secrecy clauses are typically used to stop co-workers comparing their salaries and collectively pushing for pay, pay rises, something those on the other side, of course, have spent a decade trying to stop. We know that pay secrecy clauses are rife in the banking sector, and I want to congratulate the Finance, Finance Services Union for their long and relentless campaign to have the practice outlawed. Hundreds of thousands of workers will be better off for this work. In the work of unions secretary, uh, the union's Tasmania secretary, Jess Monday, the, the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill will deliver meaningful change to our industrial relations system, a system that has been failing Tasmanian workers for close to a decade. And I, commend, I commend to the Senate the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill and urge senators to support the bill. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And before I begin my contribution, I will just foreshadow that at the end of the second reading debate, I will be moving the second reading amendment on sheet 1772. Would well, come to no surprise to those in the chamber and those listening that I do not support this bill. This bill, simply put, is a union business model. That is what it is all about. Before the election, what did the government say? The current government before the election, what was its policy in this area? Sure, Senator Scar knows. They said that this sort of multi-business bargaining was not part of our policy. Not part of our policy. Then suddenly, gosh, gosh, at the at the what's it called? The Jobs and Skills Summit. Most people know it as the Union Summit. But the, the union stitch up, but um, suddenly it appears. Suddenly it appears, and suddenly the industrial relations policy of the 70s and 80s is back in the frame for our nation. 
back to the future it is indeed, because what this government is delivering is not an update to our industrial relations system. It's, in fact, not a way of delivering secure jobs and better pay. It's a way of delivering a union business model. Now, Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, has argued that the bill will get wages moving. Well, wage growth has actually already commenced on the back of a very high inflation number. Does the government actually support that? I actually don't think the government does, because the finance minister in this place a few days ago said, and I quote, no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the, at the pace of inflation. Now, listen to that. Think about it for a moment. No one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. So, therefore, the finance minister is saying that wages shouldn't be growing at the pace of inflation. A decline in real wages is what this currently this government is overseeing. I just want to dispel one myth, because we've heard this from the other side quite a lot, that real wages didn't grow. Uh, under the coalition government. In fact, real wages grew in 13, in 15, in 2016, in 2018, in 2019. And guess what? They did go backwards in 2020 and 2021. And I think there may have been a reason real wages went backwards in that year. Something happened in that year, Senator Scar. Uh, what, what was it that happened in that year? Oh, that's right. There was a global pandemic that shut the economy down for a year and a half. And gosh, it had an impact on wages. Surprise, surprise. Does anyone find that even remotely uh, surprising? A remotely um, something that, 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 that should be driving a modern economy's wages policy today? I mean, this is a ludicrous proposition. There was no mandate. There was no mandate for the changes contained in this bill. Sen Senator, Ayres, Senator, Ayres, Senator Ayres described this as a simple bill—250 pages, a simple bill, a rushed inquiry where business organisations, certainly small and medium-sized businesses, had absolutely no chance of understanding the content of the legislation, let alone its impact on their business. And, and I did manage to, to sit on, on the last uh, day of the uh, hearings into this bill. Uh, uh, as I said, an extraordinarily rushed process, and, and Senator O'Sullivan uh, did, did an outstanding job on that inquiry and uh, in the dissenting report from coalition members. Uh, and I did manage to, to sit in on, on the last few hours of that, the hearing. And what was very clear from the interrogation of the Fair Work Commission and the department is that even if business had had the time to read this, even if business had had the time to digest the 250 pages of legislation plus the hundreds of pages of explanatory memorandum, even if they'd had the time to work through that, they still wouldn't know the answer to some really basic questions, such as when are they going to be dragged in to one of these multi-employer bargaining sessions that are the centrepiece of this bill. This is, this is how the government is promising they're going to get wages moving, by dragging businesses into these multi-employer arrangements. But the department couldn't answer when businesses would be considered to be in the same sector, when they would be joined together uh, to be part of these uh, bargaining arrangements. The Fair Work Commission couldn't answer these questions either. There's no explanation in the explanatory memorandum, so it would have been a waste of time, Senator Scar, for businesses to actually go out and read the explanatory memorandum, because the Department and the Fair Work Commission couldn't explain it, and presumably they're the ones the government at least partially consulted on this bill if they weren't just talking to the unions, which is entirely possible. So when my good friend, Ms Marino, uh, member 
for Forrest asked a pretty simple question in the House, a question concerning whether and this occurs in her electorate quite a few places. You've got a beautiful, lovely rural block on it. You've got a, a little brew house. And they serve a bit of food, and it's a lovely place to go. I've been to one or two of them myself. And then right next door to it, you've got a winery. It sells a little bit of wine. It sells a little bit of food. It's got a restaurant attached. They look, they look pretty similar. But when Nola Marino, the member for Forest, asked about this. Uh, the Minister for Housing, uh, Minister for Homelessness and Minister for Small Business, Ms Collins, said, seriously, we keep getting all sorts of analogies from those opposites. We have said they need to be comparable. They are clearly not. Well, wait a sec. What? They're not comparable. Right next door to each other, selling food, selling alcohol, uh, uh, tourism, hospitality. They're not. I mean, uh, so if, if simple questions can't get an answer out of the department, can't get an answer out of the Fair Work Commission, can't get an answer out of the minister, how are businesses supposed to go through these 250 pages of legislation? to go through the hundreds of pages in the explanatory memorandum and understand? And the answer is, obviously, they can't. So they'll probably need a little bit of help with this new industrial relations regime. They'll probably need a little bit of help. They'll probably need to get some IR consultants in. And, of course, Senator Cash has prosecuted uh, the case on the, the, the extraordinary failure of due diligence from this government on their own regulatory impact statement a regulatory impact statement that allocates $175 as uh, approximate cost per hour of bargaining. I, I was sitting in the inquiry, as I said, when uh, Senator Cash was asking these questions, and so I quickly thought, hmm, how, can I, how can I find out what the real cost of some advice of this sort would be? And I'm sure, as many of us do, I've got a mate who's a lawyer in, in the industrial relations area. So I, I sent him a quick text message and said, you know, what's it, what's it cost? What's it cost to get a non-legal uh, IR representative to give you some advice in this space? You ask someone who does it. You ask someone who does it. I asked a lawyer in the IR space what a non-lawyer would cost, and he said around $450 an hour. Now, what did the government allocate in their regulatory impact statement to the cost of this kind of advice? That's right, Senator Scar, $175. $175. And I'm not going to go through again where that $175 came from. Michaelia, uh, Senator, Cash has <laughs> Senator Cash has embarrassed the government enough. The fact that they re referenced a spiritual healer for the cost imposed on small business should be a deep shame, a deep shame to the minister, a deep shame to every member of the government. And then what did they do? They had the department come out and issue a statement saying that, oh, oh no, that's just the reference that was wrong, even though $175 in the regulatory impact statement, $175 on the website of the spiritual healer, Exactly the same number. They said, oh no, oh no, actually it was just a bad reference. We looked at the AFR as well. Um, well, I'd like the government to show me exactly in the AFR where it says that the cost of IR advice for small business is 175 bucks an hour, because I don't reckon they'd be able to find it. I don't think they'd be able to point to it. And I don't think any of those other uh, sources, quote unquote, they cited would have $175 because it's a non-credible number. But did the government own the mistake? Did they just say, yep, OK, sorry, that was a silly number. We shouldn't have used it. Cost is way higher for small business. No, they didn't. Instead, they got the department to try to justify that number by saying, oh, it came from a whole lot of different sources all over the place, when in actual fact they know it came from a spiritual healer. And that should be a deep embarrassment to the government because it shows, it shows the contempt 
the absolute contempt with which the government holds small and medium-sized business. Now, in the few minutes remaining to me, I just want to address a couple of the, the changes that have been uh, uh, made to the bill uh, in the deal with Senator Pocock. Uh, in particular, I wish to talk about the change from 15 to 20 uh, employers, employees being the threshold uh, for a small business. Sounds, sounds like a good change on the surface. Sounds like a good change on the surface until you delve into the numbers a little bit more deeply. And when you delve into the breakdown of small business in Australia, you'll actually realise that the vast majority of businesses classified as small businesses have no employees. They're effectively sole traders with no full-time employees or um, part-time employees that would meet the, um, the standards of uh, having uh, considered to be um, a, a, an employment size of one to four. So some 59 per cent are non-employing businesses, some 30 per cent have one to four employees, some nine per cent have five to 19 employees. Now I can't find the exact breakdown for that five to tw 15 to 20 category, but the best guess you could make from those sort of numbers is that it increased the percentage of small business protected under the legislation by about four or five per cent. Only four or five per cent more businesses will be protected by moving that threshold from 15 to 20 people. So, unfortunately, it just doesn't provide the protection that small business particularly deserves. Uh, I hate to, admit, uh, hate to admit my age, but I can remember the 1970s and early 1980s and the industrial disputation in Western Australia. Yeah, I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe, but I can. And I can remember. And I can remember the impact it had on small businesses, particularly in rural and regional Australia. I can remember the impact of the industrial disputation on the ports of Western Australia, particularly on the farming industry, uh, in, including on our family farm. This was a time when industrial disputation saw business driven out of business. It saw rates of unemployment that we never want to see in this country again. And I'll remind everybody, I'll remind everybody that this government inherited from the coalition an extraordinarily low unemployment rate and a growing economy. And every job, every job that is lost under your watch will be a badge of shame. Because that, in the end, is what this legislation will do. It will drive up unemployment. It will make businesses uncertain about hiring new people. It will worsen the state of the economy. And you know that you aren't going to be delivering any real way rises because you haven't got inflation under control. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. During the election campaign, I told Canberrans that I would look at each piece of, should I become a senator, I would sit in this place and look at each piece of legislation on its merits. Look at it and say, how will this affect people of the ACT? How does this square with the kind of future that we want to create in Australia? And my commitment was that on the big pieces of legislation that were contentious, I would consult as widely and as thoroughly as I can. And this is what I've tried to do over the last month. I've listened, I've consulted, and I've negotiated honestly to get the best outcome for the people I've been sent here to represent. I was watching uh, the Senate earlier, and uh, uh, it really highlighted that I understand there's some uh, politicians in this place who can stretch the truth at times. And I would like to point out that in the meeting that uh, Senator Hanson referred to, she was not present. And uh, I've been very upfront with concerns about how rushed this 
legislation has been. This is a big IR omnibus bill. Uh, indeed, standing here, I, I moved a motion to push the reporting date out so the Senate had more time to consider this bill. And in the vote that was narrowly defeated, may I point out that a credible source informs me that Senator Hansen was in the Virgin Lounge on her way home. So uh, I, I, I take on board her, her comments, but um, as far as engaging with this bill, uh, she is a long way off the mark. After, after that vote went down and it became clear that this was going to come on uh, for a vote in the, in the last week, I knuckled down and got to work and tried to get across this issue as best I could to be able to make a decision and vote on behalf of the people of the ACT, something that I take very seriously. I have consulted, I've held a round table with, with business, I've had a town hall attended by um, 200 people or so, I've met with workers, business owners, big and small, unions, employer representatives, and I've tried to do the best with the time available to me, and, and I am now happy with where we have landed. I understand that with most of these debates around contentious issues, we hear extreme sides of, of the argument, and my sense is that uh, we should probably be heading somewhere, somewhere in the middle, looking for, for that middle ground. And it's absolutely correct that workers have waited too long for a pay rise. There are so many Australians doing it tough. Their wages have not kept, kept pace with inflation, have not kept pace with the cost of living. And many of these workers are the same heroes in our community, people who have put their, their, their time and their lives on the line to get us through COVID. Those people deserve a pay rise. I appreciate too the anxieties of business, especially small business. My parents were small business owners. I've seen their, their um, efforts at, at times not result in, in much reward and just how hard they have worked to keep that business going. Many of the um, things that happen are outside of small business owners' control and at times there is a huge burden uh, in terms of administration and, and red tape. And we all need to appreciate the huge contribution that they make to our nation. The long list of amendments uh, that have been negotiated with government addressed most of these anxieties, certainly the most pressing. 97.5 per cent of businesses in Australia will be excluded from the changes in this IR bill. For those that are excluded, I've secured a commitment from the minister to review modern awards. And sitting on the committee, this was something that kept coming up, people wanting a review of the modern award. Uh, a whole range of views from some people wanting them simplified, others wanting more awards so that if they have a, a more niche business, rather than having a 150-page award, they can have something that just applies to, to their line of work. For the 2.5 per cent of businesses who will be affected by this bill, there are a range of new safeguards that the government will have to put in place. There will be a longer grace period so businesses have more time to negotiate a single enterprise agreement. There's, a, as pointed out earlier, a total carve-out of civil construction alongside residential and commercial. A new reasonable comparability threshold in the common interest test to provide more clarity and to deal with one of the issues that, that kept getting raised was the need to ensure that, for example, the big supermarket chains are not able to drag your IGAs and independent grocers 
into a, um, into a bargain. As pointed out too by many, there's a high threshold for small business, 20 uh, headcount, and that doesn't include seasonal workers, doesn't include irregular casuals. There's also a new safeguard for medium-sized businesses of 50 people or less that makes it harder to get in and easier to get out of multi-employer, multi-enterprise bargaining. There's, there's, in this, there's a recognition that if you have a business under 50 employees, it's unlikely that you have a dedicated HR uh, person or department and have less resources. The onus is now uh, on the applicant, which in most cases will be a union, to provide why it is in the common, common interest for a smaller employer to bargain in a multi-enterprise stream, taking some of that onus off businesses under 50. There's the requirement for conciliations to take place before arbitration um, when, when you're dealing with, with working arrangements, unless there are exceptional circumstances. Um, another clause that's had some, had some work today. Uh, there's also removal of the absolute, absolute right unions have to veto an agreement. This was another concern that was, was raised through the committee process and has been raised with me personally, where, where there are uh, two or more unions uh, involved and they withhold their vote. Uh, the Commission can now determine if they are unreasonably withholding agreement and it can be put to a vote. There's also a statutory review no later than two years after the passage of this bill so that we can see what's working and what isn't. And that will be ahead of the next election. The Australian people will be able to decide what they think of this based on, on that review and what people, people are seeing. Uh, I would really like to see a, a lot more uh, reviewing and um, adapting legislation as we go. This, the approach of, of setting and for, forgetting things uh, I, I don't think is appropriate given how big many of the decisions in this place are. Then there are other parts of um, the agreement I'd like to, to speak to. Uh, Senator Cash uh, rightly pointed out that it was struck late at night. I was, I was here for the College of Nursing uh, ball and, and we'd been um, negotiating for, 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 for a couple of days and finally landed in a spot where I can now hand on heart vote for this bill and believe that uh, I'm voting on behalf of the ACT people in, in good faith. Uh, one of the things I would like to address is that uh, there was no secret deal. I've been very upfront about the terms and how it was agreed and uh, who it was agreed with. This morning I met with local ACT firefighters who will now find it much easier to access workers' compensation benefits for eight additional cancers, including women's re reproductive cancers. This is included in this, in this bill and is incredibly important for people who put their lives on the line, uh, not only through bushfire season, but every day in, in towns and cities across the country. Uh, we now go from uh, having decent uh, coverage for fireys to now having world-leading coverage when it comes to fi firefighters and presumptive legislation uh, to do with cancers. Uh, the week after next, I'm meeting with subcontractors who will be better protected, who will stand a better chance of being paid on time every time, following a commitment from the PM to review and respond to the recommendations of the Murray Review. This is something that unions and businesses across the, the sector want dealt with. Uh, a review has been languishing on uh, a desk somewhere um, since 2017 and hasn't been responded to. And then there's a the commitment to a, a new legislated expert committee uh, that will finally give the more than three million people living in poverty a shot at getting out of it. And I understand that there's a range of views in this place um, saying that the last thing we need is a committee. For me, this is about transparency and being able to see the expert advice, not only expert advice, advice that is uh, produced by 
a committee that includes experts, people with lived experience, uh, someone from unions, someone from business, uh, to look at social security payments, provide advice to government, and then we'll be able to see what is being done with that uh, advice with, with this government and, and with, with future governments. Clearly, it's a great thing to get wages moving. We have to remember about the people who aren't in the, the job market, who are currently unemployed for, what it, for whatever reason. And despite the rhetoric that you'll hear from, from various people in this place, we saw during COVID when the former government lifted the rate of job seeker. We saw people coming off job seeker. All of a sudden, people had more time, they had more money to, to think about getting into work. They weren't constantly scrambling just to put food on the table. They weren't under chronic stress. This is really a, about the kind of future that we want to create together. And I'm really pleased and proud to have put this into uh, this, this agreement and it will be acted on. I'd, I'd really like to um, address again just how uh, important it is that we um, get wages moving for people in our communities who clearly need it. And you know, the highly feminised industries, the, the, the people who uh, are educating uh, future generations are looking after the generations that are at the end of their, their life and are cleaning our offices here in Parliament House, the, the Senate floor. I understand that the, you know, there is criticism from the big business uh, lobbies. I'm not here to represent big business. I'm, I'm very open about that. I'm happy to cop the criticism. I've engaged with them. I've been up front uh, with them, and I believe that this is uh, the right decision um, on this on this bill. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, fellow senators for their engagement on the committee uh, process. Um, on, on all sides of politics. I really do find it such a valuable process. It is a real privilege to be able to interrogate and, and ask questions of experts, people with lived, lived experience, um, and really has been fundamental to uh, being able to ask better questions, to have questions answered, and then to form a position on this on this bill. I would urge and ask the government in future to allow more discussion and scrutiny on big pieces of legislation. This has been rushed. I think big changes do warrant more scrutiny. And I've made that clear throughout. As I said, I moved a motion to, to push the reporting date back. That was unsuccessful. And so I've, I've, I've made do with the time allocated and um, I will be supporting this bill. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Polly. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secured Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022. This bill is about secure jobs and better wages, a bill to reform Australia's workplace relations framework in relation to gender equality, gender equity, workplace health and safety, jobs and wages, security for those jobs and those wages, bargaining and industrial action. This bill is about the future of jobs in Australia, the future of a fair pay and conditions for Australian workers, for the future of take-home pay in every household across the nation. In my home state of Tasmania, people are doing it tough right now. Wages are historically low in Tasmania compared to the mainland. The cost of living continues to place great pressure on family budgets. House prices remain high, mortgage repayments and rents are increasing. We have two options in how we deal with this situation. We can sit on our hands and make no changes. Those opposite would have us go down that path. 
or we can act decisively to bring greater fairness to workplaces and people's livelihoods across the country. The Labor movement has always fought for the better pay and conditions for the Australian people, and that is what this bill entails. And I thank unions in my home state of Tasmania, the SDA, the AWU, the TWU and Unions TAS, who visited me in my office last week. They care about their fellow Tasmanians. They fight every day for better paying conditions for Tasmanian workers. So just as it, it is in my DNA to fight for better wages and conditions and equality and equity for Tasmanian workers. It is in the DNA of those opposite, as was their government's policy over the last 10 years, to keep wages low. That's what they said. They said it, they acted upon it, and that's why, after 10 very long years, they allowed the economic drift and they kept wages low by design. The Albanese Labor government is taking significant action with this bill, which will improve the lives of working Australians. The Albanese government is putting jobs and skills at the top of the government's agenda, which is what we promised during the election campaign, and it is what we are going to deliver, because we know the importance of a job to individuals' lives. A secure, well-paid job not only provides Australians with dignity and purpose, it serves our community and our economy. For too long, workers have had to deal with a situation whereby their wages had stagnated. It is a too common situation where businesses can employ a fellow Australian as a permanent casual for more than 14 years when they actually want more hours or a part-time contract but they are unwilling to make them permanent and give them job security. How can it be that someone can work for the one company for 14 years as a casual, working every single weekend without ever being offered a permanent job? These practices are shameful and they must stop. Australians are crying out for leadership on wages in this country, and therefore the Albanese government does not want to waste any time before making improvements to workplace relations system so it can work better for everyone. Ten years has passed under the former Liberal government, and it was a deliberate intention, as I said, of theirs to keep wages low. They have admitted that was a feature of their industrial relations architecture to keep wages low in Australia, to keep the take-home pay of Australians to a minimum, and now they dare to debate in here and ultimately will vote against this legislation. That is in direct contrast to what the Albanese government wants to do. That is in deliberate contrast to what the Australian people voted for. They voted for a new government. They voted for change. We want to get wages moving. Within days of being elected, the Prime Minister wrote to the Fair Work urging a pay increase for those on the minimum wage, and it was granted. There can be no fair criticism that there has not been consultation on this bill. The government has been consulting before the election and during the election, and consultation on this bill has been extensive and underway since then. As a result of that ongoing consultation, further government amendments have been made to this bill. These amendments will support the government's objectives. This bill will be good for individuals, good for the community, good for the economy and good for national productivity. There has been much debate and commentary about this bill in the media, but if anyone wants to see the stark difference within the two major parties in Australia right now, this is the bill that clearly demonstrates that. We are a government that is fighting for the rights of working Australians, a government that is unbridled in our passion and perseverance to bring down the cost of living and get wages moving. However, those opposite want to leave this bill until next year. 
In fact, they would rather we not debate it at all. They want to go away from this place and come back after Christmas while wages remain stagnant and the economy continues to place greater pressure on Australians to struggle with the cost of living. Well, while those opposite are sitting back at Christmas barbecues, drinking out of their crystal and drinking their penfolds, Australians will still be seeking a pay rise. I note Senator Lambie, who pretends she stands up for working people in not supporting this bill. Well, it isn't a secret anymore, Senator Lambie and the Lambie Network. You are not standing up against wage increases for Australian workers. You are not supporting Tasmanian workers. The Liberal Party of Australia, the National Party and the Senator Lambie Network the coalition wants to allow wages and take-home pay to be cut. That's what they stand for. There is no ifs and buts about this. They have put the sentiment in writing. The Australian people have been waiting now for too long for a government to stand up for their interests, to stand up for better paying conditions, to stand up and say wages are too low in this country. Wages are not in line with the rise in grocery and full fuel prices, increase in rents and mortgage infl and inflation. We on this side of the chamber have waited 10 long years for this bill to reach this place, and now is the time to pass it and vote it into law. This bill, which will make pay equity and job security objectives so our system works, a bill that will allow a pathway for enterprise agreements and for multi-employer agreements to get wages moving. And I'd like to place on my record my thanks to Senator David Pocock for his for his contribution in negotiating and finally coming to support this bill. Because, as he said, so many of the frontline workers that we relied upon during the COVID pandemic are the people that will benefit mostly from this legislation. People have been waiting, as I said, far too long for this pay rise. They should not have to wait a day longer. And I urge those people in this place, on the opposite side and on the crossbench, to actually support this bill because it is in the interest of all Australians, but particularly for working Australians. And I'm proud to be part of the Albanese Labor government who will deliver this for Australian workers. Thank you, Senator <clears throat> Polly. Senator Macdonald. Clear. Let's be clear this legislation is an election promise. It's a secret promise. It is a secret deal with the union movement and a secret deal that Australians didn't know about, Australian employers didn't know about, and this is the greatest breach of trust, of faith that could have been delivered to the Australian workforce. The Treasurer said before the election that multi-employer bargaining was not a part of their agenda. Another Labor lie because this is only about delivering for union membership. Union movement membership is down to 14 per cent. 14 per cent because Australian workers say, I am not spending my hard-earned dollars on this lack of representation, where my money is hived off for donations, for big fat salaries for union reps who end up here. The union reps end up here, and I would love to know how many of those sitting on the other side have not been on a salary paid for either by workers, hard-working Australians, or by some other um, union deal. Yeah, show your hands, because I keep looking at the number of how many years. How many years since you've sweated over a mortgage and paying people yourself? That's what I'd like to ask those on the other side, because this is a payoff for donations from the unions. Because unions do not create jobs, government doesn't create jobs except for with uh, taxes, businesses and employers do. Unions reckon this is about feminised workforces to get wages moving. Well, if they were serious about this, this would not be the way they'd go. Multi-employer bargaining is about paying off highly litigious, lawfare-driven unions like the mining unions, like the construction unions. This is not about women who are working in retirement homes and uh, cleaning jobs. This is about getting big unions fatter. 
It reflects how out of touch this government is. The talking points is all they know. Because if you listen to everyone on the other side, you'll get rolled out about getting wages moving, about the lack of action. Do they ever, ever talk about how tough it is to take out a mortgage, to sweat over how you're going to take uh, uh, income from people who are, you are um, uh, earning your income from to pay your workers, to secure their future? to secure your customers' future, to pay your suppliers. Nothing, nothing have they said about growing jobs and securing the very people who provide jobs. Medium-sized businesses, not big businesses, are captured by this extreme legislation. The reality of owning and operating a business. What about businesses doing it tough? What about those people? There is no reflection at all for businesses who have been shut down over the last two years, businesses who are stressed to the extreme, who cannot find workers, who are working seven days a week, who cry to me when I speak to them about another public holiday being given by their Labor government, who cry to me about how are they going to do the work for their customers who are coming in, who they feel so passionately about? How are they going to provide enough work and enough income with their limited workforce to pay the bills, to pay the wages and still be treated like the big end of town? Who's thinking about them? Because it's not this Albanese government. It is not them. It is tough. They are low margins. There are higher electricity costs. There are higher fuel costs. Transport costs are crippling businesses, higher costs of, of food. The uncertainty of this legislation will be the last nail in the coffin of so many of those businesses. I've got letters from small businesses and medium-sized businesses across Queensland. Sally says she will have to review staffing to stay below the 20 employee threshold or sell the business. She already pays staff above the award wage. She is heartbroken, and after dealing with COVID disruptions, overregulation and taxation, she does not need this as well. She actually named Senator Pocock as the Judas of small business. Leslie, another small business owner. Restaurants, cafes and catering businesses were some of the hardest hit venues during the COVID pandemic and now face crippling staff shortages. The rise in costs and supply chain disruptions now is not the time to punish business owners. Multi-employer bargaining is impractical and alarming. It would introduce a uniformity in an industry that is by its nature diverse, creative, innovative and constantly changing. And Leslie finishes with, please save the 58,000 restaurants, cafes and catering businesses and their 357,000 employees across Australia. I don't hear the unions talking about those business owners, those women. Another small business owner. The rush of this bill is extremely concerning. At present, every business is short-staffed and facing difficult circumstances. We are all trying to find our feet after COVID, and to rush through a bill without adequate understanding from the business community is unreasonable. This is another issue where employers will be forced to enter into a new agreement within 12 months, creating disharmony, hardship, costs and upheaval at a time when that is the last thing that is needed. This proposed workplace changes represents the most radical shake-up of Australia's industrial relations system in decades. Labor has made it clear they want to hand over workplaces to the unions. This breach of faith with the Australian voter and Australian businesses, large and small, who took the Treasurer at his word when he said last year that industry-wide bargaining was not part of Labor's policy, and at a time when businesses are doing it tough. They're struggling. They're struggling with staff shortages, rapidly increasing power costs, and union masters will not make it better. I know that in Townsville alone, the number of small businesses that are closing or are up for sale is increasing every month. I had my hair cut the other day and the hairdresser said she no longer employs anybody. She doesn't even have an apprentice. 
after the last uh, dispute she had with an employee who it went through. It cost her $50,000 in legal fees for it to be thrown out of the court. This small business owner, all of her savings gone because we are not a country that values employers anymore. We don't value the people who take out the mortgage, who stress over how they're going to make ends meet, because we've got those on the other side calling late payment on superannuation wages theft. What would they know about struggling to make cash flow stretch? Unfortunately, the minor amendments between Senator Pocock and Labor does nothing to ally the concerns of small and family businesses across Australia. These businesses will still be forced to bargain against their will as part of the supported bargaining stream. Businesses with more than 20 staff will still be able to be dragged into multi-employer agreements with their much larger competitors. And we have seen the modelling for how much the regulatory impact statement reveals that bargaining costs will impose on small and medium and large businesses. This bill will lead to more strikes, more job losses, more uncertainty. This is a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. This is nothing about productivity. This, this legislation does not mention productivity. All it mentions is wages growth without an understanding that somebody has to pay the bill. And I don't see anybody on the other side with any understanding of the stress of paying the bill. How much fairness is there in it for the people who take the risk, who mortgage their home, who employ and create these jobs? How much fairness is it in it for them? People who rely on the structure of awards, who rely on the structure of predictability, because you're right, there's not an HR department for a business of 20 people. There's probably not an HR department for a business of 100 people with a 3 per cent margin and every week struggling to pay the bills, the ever-increasing bills. So not only is this attacking medium business, small business, guess what? We're going to take on the very businesses that pay the, the, pay the royalties and taxes and the incredibly high paid wages in mining, because it is mining who is going to have to pick up the pieces. It is always mining that Labor turns to for more taxes. Up to 33,000 jobs, and remember, mining jobs are on average double the average Australian salary. The average Australian salary is $90,000, and mining jobs are double that. The administration clerks in mining companies are on double that. Truck drivers are on double that. And yet they're the jobs that this is going to risk. 140 projects worth $77 billion at risk. And of these projects, 46 are critical minerals. Apparently we need critical minerals, but not under this government, because they say one thing to industry, another thing to suit the unions. This will cost this will cost not just the business owner, this will cost the taxpayer, because for every week of strikes and lockdowns, it is millions, hundreds of millions in royalties, in company taxes, in PAYG salaries for these workers. In the last 20 years, employment in mining has tripled, wages have doubled, benefiting hundreds of thousands of Australians, especially in regional areas. And mining companies themselves are saying these changes will slow down Australia's energy transformation. And that while we need more lithium for batteries, more copper for solar panels and more cobalt for electric vehicles, not more, no, I'm sorry, not more uncertainty and risk that will chase away investment. Rio Tinto. Simon Trott says, I do have concerns, serious concerns, about the legislation as it is currently drafted. It will be a handbrake on economic growth. It will be a handbrake on productivity and ultimately a handbrake on wages and the rest of the economy. Hancock Prospecting Chief Executive Gary Court said a six-week period of strike action at Port Hedland would cost 
$9.9 billion in lost iron ore export revenue and an estimated $551 million in lost mining royalties to the Western Australian government. That is a six-week strike period. If this bill were to pass in its current form, it would open the door to a confrontational industrial relations system that will cripple our industry and result in poorer wages outcomes for our workers. And finally, BHP. And I know, I know those on the other side don't like hearing from these big employers who employ thousands of Australians and pay them more than double the average wage, who pay the royalties and the company taxes that allow us to have roads and schools and hospitals. But I'm still going to quote them. From BHP, Mike Henry says there is simply no case for multi-employer bargaining in the mining industry. This is an industry where the current approach has been working well. Wages have been on the move. We are a business that competes globally. It's just so essential that Australia remains competitive and any aspects of the legislation that run the risk of reducing flexibility, giving rise to increased industrial action and so on, that's all going to harm Australian competitiveness in our sector. So if this was truly, truly, as Labor likes to say, if this was truly about the feminised workforce, if this was truly about low-paid workers in our society, if this was truly about allowing more people more flexibility to get their kids to school and care for people, this would not be the way you'd go about it. This would not be the way you go about it. This would not be because this is the way that you will threaten you will threaten the jobs of thousands of Australians as small business owners shut their doors, as they say, enough. We cannot keep paying for the social demands of this Labor government. We cannot keep paying for the union demands, the union payoffs of this Labor government. And so, uh, as Senator Brockman said, for every job that is lost, for every small business and medium business that closes its door, for every mining company that doesn't reinvest in this country and goes offshore, for every electricity transmission project that does not proceed because of this legislation, for the millions and billions of royalties that are lost because of this legislation, it is on this government's head. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Yeah. Senator Alman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill, which the Greens are pleased to support with the changes secured through our negotiations with the government. Industrial relations in this country have been firmly stacked against workers for too long, so it's good to see some movement in the right direction to give workers more power to organise, particularly in lower paid industries. Workers haven't seen a pay rise in real terms for a decade. People on low incomes are being forced to endure inflation on essential items and housing costs and are being hit hard by interest rate increases while corporate profits continue to skyrocket. We support industrial relations changes that shift the dial back toward power for working people. The Greens have worked hard to secure changes to the bill and we are also pleased to see several long-standing Greens position within the legislation. These include an enforceable right to better work-life balance, banning of pay secrecy clauses and abolishing the ABCC. The government's original bill attempted to remove prospective workers from being considered under the Better Off Overall test when agreements are approved, something we were concerned could have led to prospective workers being worse off. The Greens have ensured that the test will remain in the legislation, protecting workers' conditions. I am particularly pleased that hospitality workers and those in retail will be protected under the agreement that we secured on the Better Off Overall Test. We had real concerns that some workers could be sidelined from being covered by the test, and I am very pleased to see these protections remain in place. For workers in feminised industries, especially early childhood educators and people in aged or disability care, a pay rise cannot come soon enough. Workers throughout Queensland and my home of central Queensland deserve a pay rise. These care industries are the backbone of our society and, in my view, the work they do is amongst the most important in our community. Respecting these industries is critical 
and respect means a significant pay rise and better conditions. Critically, it also means the right to organise and bargain collectively. I'm also pleased to see the end of pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts, which have also contributed to the persistence of the gender pay gap. I'll never forget how shocked I was when I discovered that a young male colleague in the law firm I was working for was being paid more than me, despite me acting as his mentor. I'm also proud to be supporting a bill that secures the right to flexibility for workers with caring responsibilities. The work that my colleague, Senator Barbara Pocock, has done on the Work and Care Select Committee revealed the importance of an enforceable right to request unpaid parental leave and the right to request flexibility. That is now enshrined in the legislation. This is just the start of industrial relations reforms in this parliament. There's a lot more to do. We need to get sick leave for casuals, we need to move towards a four-day work week, and we need to outlaw insecure work. That is now the next fight. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Walsh. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Fair Work Legislation uh, Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill of 2022, um, a bill that will deliver secure jobs and better pay for Australians, a bill that puts respect for women workers at the heart of our workplace laws, a bill that makes better wages a deliberate design feature of our government's agenda. This bill will modernise our bargaining system, opening up the process of making agreements and expanding access to multi-employer bargaining, making it easier for employers and employees to come to the table and end the race to the bottom on wages. It will help close the gender pay gap for millions of working women, creating two new expert panels in the Fair Work Commission for pay equity and the care and community sector making gender equity a central object of the Fair Work Act and opening up bargaining to millions of low-paid women in sectors like aged care, early childhood and disability services through the supported bargaining stream. But the bill also delivers so much more than this because delivering secure jobs and better pay means delivering a better life for working Australians. Because a secure job means finally having the ability to plan your life to be able to apply for a loan or a lease, to choose to start a family, or just know that you'll be able to be with them for the holidays. Because better pay means being able to make ends meet, to live without the constant stress and impossible choices of poverty wages, and instead be able to afford the little luxuries which make life enjoyable and which we all deserve. It means a better life with choice, with dignity and with respect. And working Australians deserve a better life now. After 10 years of low wages as a deliberate design feature of uh, the opposition's economic policy, uh, of growing gig work and casualisation, we've seen a race to the bottom on wages and conditions across some of Thank our you, most essential Walsh. sectors. There is tomorrow. Uh, the time for debate has adjourned, uh, has, has, has ended. Uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Recently, the US ordered an investigation into the death of one of its citizens. Her name was Shireen Abu Akil, a veteran Al Jazeera journalist and one of the biggest names in Arab journalism. She was also a Palestinian. Shireen was wearing a vest emblazoned with the words press when she was shot in the head and killed. The Israeli military immediately blamed Palestinians for her death. However, when independent probes, including by New York Times, found there was no Palestinians firing in the area, they retracted that statement. Israel's own probe now admits that there is a high probability that an Israeli sh a soldier fired the shot, but that was accidental and there will be no criminal investigation. Just to be very clear, she was working as a journalist, clearly wearing a press jacket and Israeli soldiers were the only ones firing. Israel has said that they will not cooperate with the US probe, even though they're supported by $3.8 billion US every year in military aid from the US. Shireen is one of 197 Palestinians killed by Israeli forces this year alone. This includes 43 children. Those killed in the last two months include a 15-year-old girl 
Fuller Razmi, who was shot while a passenger in a car driving slowly along Palestinian residential streets. Twelve-year-old boy Mahmoud, who allegedly threw a few stones at a military jeep in his town, a town where, under Oslo Accords, Israeli forces should not be. And in response, soldiers shot him with live ammunition. Speaking about Israeli's attacks on Gaza in May, the UN Secretary General said, I am shocked by the number of children killed and maimed by Israeli forces during hostilities in airstrikes on densely populated areas and through the use of live ammunition during law enforcement operations and by the persistent lack of accountability for these violations. An opinion poll con conducted by YouGov earlier this year revealed a majority of Australians want to end Israeli's military occupation of Palestine and an end to the Egyptian and Israel siege of Gaza. The opinion poll said Palestine should be given full recognition and to support the International Criminal Court investigation into war crimes in Palestine. I saw with my own eyes the impact of Israeli's military occupation of Palestine. I watched children being tried in military courts. These did not meet any of the basic standards of a fair trial. This process ends with a 99 per cent conviction rate for Palestinians can hardly be deemed just. I saw homes that have been demolished by Israeli forces. I saw families displaced by settlements and their family lands being declared closed military zones. I stood beside the nine metre high concrete wall that Israel has built, twice as high and four times as long as the Berlin Wall, which rips apart Palestinian neighbourhoods and annexes Palestinian lands. Military occupations are inherently brutal, but they are not, never supposed to be permanent. Military occupations must be opposed whether in Ukraine or in Palestine. A recent report by the UN Commission of Inquiry found that the Israeli occupation is unlawful under international law. And I'd like to quote Commissioner Chris Sadoti, formerly of the Australian Human Rights Commission. The actions, and he said, the actions of Israeli governments reviewed in our report constitute an illegal occupation and annexation regime that must be addressed. The international system and individual states must act and uphold their obligations under international law. That must begin at this session of the General Assembly with a referral to the International Court of Justice. Close the, quote. the Australian government is committed to an international rules-based order which upholds the rights of all people wherever they may live. Today is the United Nations Day of Solidarity with Palestinian people. This day exists to call on the international community to not just to speak but for us to act. We must recognise the rights of Palestinians as equal to Israelis, to have self-determination, to have security, to have and live equally amongst the world's nations. We must also support Israeli accountability in international courts and ensure Israel's violations of international law are challenged. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dean Smith. Mr Acting Deputy President, in March 2021, the WA Premier Mark McGowan and his Labor government were rewarded with a thumping majority based largely on their perceived handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. The line, Mark McGowan kept me safe from COVID, rung out like political gold across Western Australia. While the McGowan government may have handled aspects of the pandemic well, it has also used it as a political shield to hide its incompetence elsewhere. More people deserve to know the truth about the underperformance of the McGowan Labor government. Public sector wage rises have been capped at $1,000 a year since 2017, supposedly so the government could undertake budget repair. Now, with a $6 billion surplus, it's not unreasonable that nurses and midwives, among others, are asking for their fair share. In recent days, we've seen images of striking nurses because of the McGowan government's bungled wage negotiations. How did Mark McGowan respond to 3,000 striking nurses? He arrogantly declared on Friday that their actions were totally and utterly outrageous. Compare this to 2013, when the Barnett Liberal government listened to the concerns of nurses and signed an agreement to provide wage increases. At the time, Premier Barnett said, when you are faced as a Premier 
with clear professional advice that lives could be lost, and they probably would be, I think I had a responsibility to act on that. Those were the words of the former Liberal Premier, Colin Barnett. Mark McGowan's responsibility is no less, but he has just failed it. It's the same story with ambulance ramping. Under McGowan and his now Health Minister Amber Jade Sanderson, ambulances in Western Australia have spent more than 54,000 hours ramped outside state hospitals this year, a dramatic increase from just 25,902 hours in 2021. Labor's response has been to blame St John Ambulance and the Ambos in a pathetic re refusal to accept accountability. It's no overstatement that the McGowan government has generated a health crisis, a health crisis that is of its own making. They have more than 500, well, 500 hospital code yellows this year alone. The worst impacted was Sir Charles Gardner Hospital, which went into code yellow 144 times in 2021-22, an average of once every two and a half days. The Australian Medical Association WA President Mark Duncan Smith described code yellows as nearly unheard of when he was a junior doctor. These incidents are a direct consequence of the McGowan Labor government running the medical system into the ground over the last five years due to blatantly underfunding health services. WA Labor hasn't fared any better when it comes to law and order. The state's crime severity score has risen in seven offence categories, including abduction and harassment, including sexual offences and acts intended to cause injury. Premier McGowan has said, I take responsibility for these things. We are going to ensure we continue to roll out additional police officers in the city and regional WA, so said the Labor Premier Mark McGowan. But this financial year, 340 police officers left the WA Police Service, with 60 departing in June this year alone. Labor simply isn't working for WA. And the Premier has also made a hash of WA's transition to renewables. Power outages have become a regular part of WA life. Energy Minister Bill Johnson, or Blackout Bill as he's known in Western Australia, is begging West Australians via text not to use energy after a so series of outages me, last uh, excuse summer. Me, excuse me, Senator Smith. Uh, Senator Farrell on a point of order. I know. Um Minister Johnson, he's a very, very fine fellow. You know, and I'd, request, I'd request that, in accordance with the traditions in this uh, Senate, that uh, Senator Smith describe him by his correct title, which is uh, Minister Johnson. Th thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator Smith, if you could refer to um, uh, people by their correct title. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I know Mr Bill Johnson very well as well. And I don't think he'll be too offended. I don't think he'll be too offended. But it doesn't distract from Order. the most important point, Order. and that is that the Energy Order. Minister Bill Johnson is begging Senator West Australians Farrell, via text message not to use energy after a series of outages last summer. The National Electricity Senator Market Farrell. Regulator Senator AEMO. Farrell. Senator Farrell, sorry. Senator Farrell. I did request that, um, in accordance with the great, this bloke claims to be a traditionalist. Don't, in if, the, if you could direct your comments. Through the chair, please, Senator Farrell. Um, yes, in the traditions of this uh, Senate, can he please describe um, the minister by his correct title, Minister uh, Johnson? He should withdraw his claims about uh, the minister and describe him by his correct title. Senator Senator Smith. G. Thank you. Thank you very much, okay. Senator Farrell. Thank you. And I take it as a compliment to be regarded as a traditionalist uh, in this Senate, so thank you very, very much. So what is the McGowan government's scorecard? Health fail, law and order fail, energy fail, forestry fail, and WA Labor isn't working thank for you. West Australians. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today is the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. 
2022 has been a year of tragedy after tragedy. Yet, day after day, the courageous Palestinian people resist occupation and oppression. On April 15th, Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem and injured more than 150 Palestinians, including children. This was an appalling attack and a flagrant violation of international conventions. On 11th May, veteran Al Jazeera journalist Shireen Abu Akleh was killed by Israeli forces while on assignment in the occupied West Bank. She was wearing a protective vest marked with big bold letters called press and standing with other journalists when she was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. It was an assassination for which we have seen no justice and it is just the latest in a long line of journalists killed by the Israeli military. On 5th August, the Israeli regime began a three-day bombing assault in the Gaza Strip, which killed at least 49 Palestinians, including 17 children, and injured hundreds of others. On 18th August, seven Palestinian civil society and human rights organizations were forcibly shut by Israeli raids. Offices were ransacked, equipment confiscate, confiscated, and doors welded shut. Six were labeled terrorist organizations with no credible evidence. These are organizations working in areas such as human rights, prisoner support, children's rights, and health care. On 30th August, an Israeli court sentenced Mohammed Al-Halabi, former head of operations at World Vision in Gaza, to 12 years in prison. He has been imprisoned despite several independent investigations showing no evidence of any wrongdoing on his part. His sentence appeared to have only one purpose, to stop aid organizations from supporting the desperate humanitarian situation in Gaza. Earlier this month, Israeli forces demolished a recently built Palestinian primary school in the Masafar Yatta region of the southern occupied West Bank, where residents are facing the ongoing threat of forced displacement. The school was demolished while in session with students inside. The school demolition came just days after an 18-year-old Palestinian student was shot dead by Israeli forces while he was on his way to school. All this violence, this death, and this injustice, still there is no action from the Australian government. What is happening in Palestine is this. Israel is committing the crime of apartheid. Human Rights Watch has said it. Amnesty International has said it. The UN Special Rapporteur for Palestine has said it. The Australian government must loudly call out every injustice committed and firmly resist Israel's attempts to whitewash its crimes. We know from a recent report that the Israel lobby is in overdrive. In the last four years, Australian federal parliamentarians received more sponsored trips to Israel than any other country. As former Labor Minister for Foreign Affairs Bob Carr says, the trips and other activities have only one objective, and that's to see that no matter what Israel does, it will never, never be criticized by Canberra. The Australian government should also increase funding to agencies like the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for, Palestinian, for Palestine refugees in the Near East, known as UNRWA. UNRWA supports 5.7 million Palestinian refugees, including by providing education, medical clinics, food distribution, and emergency assistance. Most of these people are stateless and living in poverty. Among them are more than half a million Palestinian children who UNRWA provides with education. Under the Labour government, Australia quite rightly became one of UNRWA's largest do donors. But in 2018, then US President Donald Trump abruptly halted US funding for UNRWA. And pathetically and predictably, our own Trump wannabe PM at the time followed suit, halving the contributions from 20 to 10 million. Thankfully, Labour has reversed the coalition cuts, but it needs to be much higher. I urge the government to do the right thing and urgently increase funding to, the, to $40 million per year. The Greens express our full solidarity with the Palestinian people and their struggle. I will always unapologetically and proudly stand against occupation and for Palestinian rights Thank for self-determination. Senator Faruqi, Senator Lambie. Deputy President, 
This is the best time of the year. It's Christmas time, and I love it. It brings back many, many, many memories. So, um, for me, I, I know that we won't get much more of an opportunity up there this week. So, I just want to wish all those Tasmanians out there a really happy festive season. Um, please stay safe, um, and I hope you have a really great new year. I know, I know, it's been a tough few years through COVID. And uh, I know that you're all trying to find your way and get back on your feet this year. So I'd imagine uh, we are really, really looking forward to this Christmas. I do want to say this, though. I just want to tell a short story. For all you females out there, if you are planning on doing a barbecue lunch uh, or using your barbecue on Christmas Day and you are buying one for your husband or your partner, um, and you think that you can put all the nuts and screws together, I suggest you might want to get that ready about a week earlier, because I can assure you, take it from somebody who knows from experience, if you have a couple of drinks and you're still sitting up at one o'clock and you still haven't got it together, it's probably going to end up on a table with a gas bottle uh, hanging in the air. Not a good idea. And I also have a, a little tip for you men with the trampolines out there, very difficult one. Uh, the springs. The springs, I watched my husband or my partner the night before say, no worries, darling, get it done in an hour. We were up there at one o'clock in the friggin' morning trying to put this bloody trampoline together. So when you buy things with the nuts and bolts, please don't leave them um, till uh, Christmas Eve because it doesn't always turn out as well as what you hope. So, yeah, yeah, don't worry about what the trampoline. You put the button, you, can, you know, if you want to have a bit of fun with your hubby the night before, you can put some bubbles and some water on it, be my guest. No problem there. But seriously, I really do wish all of Tasmanians down there a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Um, and I certainly wouldn't feel right, and neither would Tasmanians, if I didn't wish the rest of you mainlanders a Happy New Year and a Merry Christmas. Um, and uh, just remind you that I know we're at the bottom, but we are at the bottom for a reason because we have to do all the heavy lifting. So Merry Christmas to you all out there in Australia. Have a good one, have a safe one, and have a fabulous new year. Because I can tell you, after coming out of COVID, after a couple of years and getting on our feet, surely next year's just got to get bigger and better. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Senator Lambie. Senator Roberts. Because we're double dipping, um, and that's a very Tasmanian tradition as well. Um, it's Christmas. It's Christmas. It's been a great year. Six months only. Five and a half to go. Look, I'm looking forward to spending time with my family, and I've had experience with the trampoline and the barbecue, so I reiterate what she said. Plan, plan, plan. Have a drink, have a feed, spend time with your loved ones. That's the best bit for me, spending time. No presents, just spend time with me. And thank you, Senators, for spending time with me. I know you're trapped sometimes, but I truly appreciate it. Look, the Senate has been an experience that I would never, ever give up. And the advice that you guys have given me, I will take for life. Enjoy it, embrace it, do the best that you can with what you can. Look, thank you. I appreciate you. I hope that Tasmanians will give me a chance in the new year to do more for them. Speak to me, listen to me, tell me when I'm wrong, because I know you'll do that. That's what Tasmanians do. Jackie tells me all the time. And trust me, I wish I could shut her up, but sadly it's not happening. Have a Merry Christmas, a beautiful New Year, and I'll see you all back here next year for another Fun and Games. Merry Christmas and thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Speaking as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that the RMIT fact-checkers jumped to the government's rescue last week when I asked questions about the reported decline in birth rates following the national COVID vaccine rollout. My questions were based on Australian Bureau of Statistics data that I posted on my website. My questions asked about the validity of the ABS data I previously cited in Senate estimates hearings. Senator Gallagher replied it would be investigated and I would be advised of the outcome. I never heard anything more. Then I asked in question time and was given a similar response, including that the department had different data. Where from? Then the ABS clarified the data on their website and the RMIT fact lab used that and information from unknown sources to fact check my question. The minister has once again failed to address the data issue with my office. Was the RMIT fact lab used 
instead as a mouthpiece for the bureaucrats. Everyday Australians must be able to approach the next health challenge united as one community, not in a state of civil war due in part to incomplete and competing data fueling fierce opinions around emotional issues of pregnancy, infant deaths and child deaths. We must fix this or the next challenge will end just as badly. These birth figures appear to be incomplete on the Australian Bureau of Statistics website going back to July 2021. Out of date, going back, out of date data going back 18 months. Note that the data I was presenting in this graph was monthly data, RMIT fact-checked annual data. Absurd. There was a surge in births in the first half of 2021, lockdown babies coming through. I mentioned that. Then a drop-off in the second half of the year. RMIT used annualised data to hide the marked mid-year change. RMIT's fact-checkers had to concede that the data I quoted supports my question. They said, quote, the ABS data cited by Senator Roberts indeed shows that after an eventful first 10 months, registrations by births, by date of occurrence, were lower in the last two months of 2021." End of quote. I checked and easily busted the fact checkers. The, fact checkers. the decline against long-term average birth rates started in July 2021. Six months of decline, not two months. The ABS data set cautions that these numbers are incomplete due to the lag in registration of births. This warning was attached after I raised this data with Senator Gallagher, not before. Birth data is collected at state level weekly and at 30 days is 95 per cent accurate. That's enough to publish provisional birth data, just as the ABS publishes provisional death data. To force policymakers to wait so long for the data needed to make good decisions is totally unacceptable. So is the manner in which this government is accessing ABS data and guidance. My first supplementary question to Senator to Minister Gallagher on Monday asked how diligent the government was in obtaining critically important data in a conscientious manner. Her answer was offered something like, yes, Minister, using phrases like, working closely with, and if they saw something, they would say something. If I was the minister responsible for an emergency health response that included mandated vaccination, and I knew these vaccinations are comprehensively challenged through peer-reviewed science worldwide, indicating serious and fatal outcomes, I'd be glued to my bloody computer, waiting on the latest data on harm, births and deaths to check our response had been safe and effective. Two federal governments have clearly not done that. Perhaps Australians would trust the science more if that science was subjected to a little more scrutiny. To that end, I joined with Senators Hanson, Antic, Canavan and Rennick to sponsor a motion to force the government to publish its Pfizer contracts. It was the Greens the My Body, My Choice Greens, who joined with Labor to block the motion, ensuring that when it comes to health, Big Brother knows best and there will be no dissent. No, not even questioning. I'm pursuing this line of questioning for a reason. It's been conclusively shown that COVID vaccination can harm or interfere with a woman's reproductive system. In August 2022, a Lancet study confirmed a firm link between COVID vaccination and menstrual irregularities that found 64,000 respondents almost reported menstrual irregularities or vaginal bleeding. We know the vaccine builds up in a woman's reproductive system. We know it interferes with the normal functioning of the female reproductive system. We know that birth rates declined co coinciding with the vaccine rollout. No matter what our Australian bureaucrats do, the research and science now underway worldwide will decide the truth and impacts of our COVID response. To exclude politics, this must be reviewed in a royal commission to get the truth. I look forward to the Senate's report, support for that. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation, and around this beautiful planet I wish everyone a happy, safe Christmas around the world to all, and especially to Queenslanders. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Sheldon. Thanks. I rise to um, pay my respects to Cole Neal, a wonderful um, tip truck owner-driver, which was actually the section head for the Transport Workers Union in New South Wales. And uh, Cole was a owner-driver who spent uh, a lot of his time going into excavation sites and demolition sites, but also organising around uh, workers, making sure as owner-drivers, making sure they got paid. And that industry was one of the toughest industries to make sure you actually got paid. I think when I first met Cole in the um, 1990s, um, in very early 1990s, uh, Cole was um, in, a, in, in a dispute which uh, I was called down then as a full-time official of the Transport Workers Union. And he, 
He was um, a dispute. People hadn't got paid. It's been two months. You know, they paid all their costs for fuel, paid their costs for their own wages, tried to support their family, uh, paid for the trucking costs. And um, he was at another dispute trying to organise those payments to be properly made. He got a phone call from some workers um, down, and they had very early mobile phones. Uh, and, he, and he got uh, a phone call to say that uh, some guys over at, uh, and a drivers over at uh, Wattle Grove uh, had been on, um, had been underpaid. And they said, "Can you how long can you how, how long before you get down here?" And he's and he said to them, well, it'll take us a couple of hours to sort this problem out here. The developers hadn't paid the contractor, the contractor hadn't paid the workers, and the workers haven't been paid for two months. They've gone through all these expenses. And the guy said, well, you better get down here real quick because we won't, we won't be staying here for very long. He said, oh, if you want to go home and we'll meet tomorrow morning and that'll put some pressure on the employer to make sure they actually play, pay because you've been waiting for a couple of months as well. He said, no, no, I've got a live grenade next to my foot. Now that was Wattle Grove was actually an old uh, site from the old um, army base, which had been turned into a um, into a uh, housing estate, which I subsequently lived some ten years later. It's sort of ironic, and um, and uh, when we got down there, Cole, you know, sorted the problem out. And he was my mentor. He was a great supporter. He was a person who really understood what it was like to be on the tools, and really gave me a very uh, great understanding of. Um, what it was to be a independent owner driver, but also with your mates who stand together to make a difference and um, thankfully, his mate didn 't get his foot blown off, and um, Cole also got his payment for him and I was uh, had a great deal of pleasure of being part of that um, uh, getting those payments made to one of his mates but also Cole was also a life member of the transport workers Union as an uh, active owner driver, a member of the branch committee of management, um, a very outspoken person, sometimes gave me a hard time and that's probably not a bad thing because I actually always respected that because he was always honest even though I didn't agree with him. And he was always honest when I did agree with him too. So it's actually a great person to have around you because you actually say to everybody um, in, in the union about what it needs to be to actually be, to make a difference. And when he turned 68, he sold his truck and retired, but such was his dedication to organising and supporting his tip truck drivers, he returned to TW's tip truck section on a part-time basis for many years. In 2012, I was proud to present Cole with his life membership of the union. Cole continued to advocate on behalf of drivers uh, when the previous Liberal government threatened to abolish the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal. Cole said, and I quote, the Howard government tried to take away our rights at work, but we stood and fought back. In 2007, we turfed them out, and I'm not going to lay down and watch work choices return, and I'm not going to stand by and see my kids and grandkids get ripped off. Well, while we didn't win the fight against the abolition of the RSRT, today we have broad support for owner drivers and road transport employers, employees, clients, academics and even gig companies to empower the Fair Work Commission to set minimum standards in the sector. There's people like Cole that actually says the fight is worth fighting. This is a major accomplishment when reflective of the decades of hard work from Cole and others like him who advocate on behalf of owner drivers and what he taught all of us. When we got, get down to the next year that will form part of Cole's legacy of course, Cole also had some tremendous accomplishments outside his working life. Most importantly, his long and happy marriage to his wife, Roz. And Roz is such a wonderful, Thank wonderful you, human Senator being. Sheldon, your time has expired. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, President. I'm delighted to have been asked to read out the speeches of several intelligent, passionate and articulate young people from Queensland as part of our Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign. The first speech that I'm going to read out this evening is by Lillian. And Lillian writes about listening to the voices of young people. Lillian writes, If you were to imagine the country run by today's youth, what would it look like? Young people are passionate and have a lot to say, but often don't get the opportunity to voice their opinions. We are socially conscious and in touch with the world through social media, the news, 
our families, our teachers and the people around us. My name is Lillian Goodwin. I am 15 years old and I live in Emerald, Queensland. My electorate is Flynn. I feel that youth deserve more of a voice than what they are given. It gives the opportunity to passionate youth to make a difference. Many young people are speaking at climate change conferences and helping run protests. They are making a difference in their communities. I am not focusing on one issue as everything ultimately affects us. What I do believe is that giving the youth an opportunity to have their voices heard may inspire them to become more invested in what is happening in the world today. Involving more youth in the decision-making process would mean that Australia may look different. Having more youth-led initiatives would impact the social perception of young people because we have so much to say and so much to offer. Young people deserve the chance to have their viewpoints considered. My hope is that through youth representation, Australia's new parliament will grow to be more inclusive. Thank you. President, my second speech uh, is by a young man named Evan, who writes about listening to regional young people on housing, homelessness and the cost of living. Evan writes, Hi, my name is Evan Townsend. I'm 14 years old and I was born in Gordon Vale in far north Queensland. Gordon Vale is a small town, 20 kilometres from Cairns, and it's surrounded by sugarcane farms. My favourite pastimes are fishing, camping, hunting and playing online games. Gordon Vale is one of the best places to live, in my opinion, because all of my favourite pastimes are available to me. From my perspective as a 14-year-old boy, these are some of the things I would like Parliament to accomplish. Young people are not listened to enough. Even though young people have limited life experience, we do have our views on things from our perspectives as we see the effects of decisions made by Parliament. Children and young people are entirely reliant on adults as we have no access to money and no influences on the decisions being made. I'm concerned about the rise of poverty and the rise of homelessness in my area. With the cost of everything increasing, I can see the struggle my parents are going through. They work hard to keep a roof over our head and food on our table. My concern is if, if this is how hard it is to do this now, how hard will it be to do when I'm an adult? Every child and young person has the right to have access to a roof over their head, food on their table, access to quality and engaging education and supporting adults in their lives. Another thing I'm concerned about for my future is the effects of climate change and how this may affect what I'm able to do in the future. Although I can see that this is being done now by the parliament recently, I think more can be done. We young people today may not have all the answers, but we need to be heard because it's our future that parliament is deciding. Parliament needs to hear more from young Australians. Parliament needs to have a bigger representation of young people from different backgrounds, especially those that are vulnerable. With this in mind, the decisions of the, par the parliament makes now will determine my future and what it consists of. Will I have an opportunity to have my own home, a family, a good job and continue to do the things that I love? Or will the decisions Parliament makes today make this just an impossible dream? Please don't just listen, but actually hear us young people and please invest in our future. Thank you, Lillian and Evan. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Coney. Thank you very much, President. Um, I know many Australians have been looking around for a bargain as Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales continue this week. But I want to shine a light this evening on the behaviour of the company that's been responsible for spreading Black Friday sales around the world, and that's Amazon. We've all heard horrible stories uh, about Amazon workers unable to take bathroom breaks and literally running between shelves in order to meet the company's ridiculous performance targets. It's clear Amazon has a long way to go in recognising workers' rights in Australia. The SDA union, where I've been a proud member of and also an industrial officer prior to coming to parliament, brought a case before the federal court on behalf of Amazon workers when a, an employee's job was offer was withdrawn after she told the company that she was pregnant. They reached a financial settlement earlier this year. On Black Friday last year, Amazon called the police to try and have the TW officials who were investigating safety concerns removed from their warehouse in Western Sydney. It, again, another clear example that 
Amazon has a long way to go in recognising workers' rights in this country. The Amazon Global Union Alliance is calling out Amazon for its terrible conduct. It's, it's, keeping, um, it's squeezing every last drop uh, from the workers who are responsible for the company's success. This behaviour is even more reprehensible at a time when working people right around the world are struggling with the cost of living crisis. Well, I could not attend um, due to the Senate sitting last uh, week, uh, but I was proud to see the SDA and the TW rallying outside Amazon Warehouse in my home state in Victoria in Dandenong. They had a very clear message. These workers are undervalued and their practices are unsafe and un-Australian. And I don't begrudge anyone trying to score a bargain as these sales continue, but I do urge all Australians to consider the workers that are behind the sales, behind the websites, to purchase from much more responsible businesses if you are able to do so. President, um, I also want to draw the Chamber's attention tonight to a, a, a very large contribution uh, to the Victorian economy, and that is the racing industry, uh, particularly in many regional communities. The size and scope of the Victorian racing industry report that was released earlier this year found that the industry contributes nearly $4.7 billion of value to the Victorian economy, and over half this value is added in regional areas. Of course, we all know the enormous recreational and tourism benefit of the racing industry, but it is also an integral part of many local economies throughout Victoria. Much of this economic benefit is generated primarily through race days. Uh, while racing has been impacted by COVID-19, like, like almost every other industry, uh, prior to the pandemic, more than 1.8 million people attended a race day in a year, with over half a million of these people attending a regional race day. This significant contribution to regional tourism cannot be overstated. And I'm glad that the Minister for Tourism is in the, in, in the chamber this evening. But in addition to race days, the industry generates ongoing employment for thousands of Victorians. And this independent report shows that more than 147,000 jobs are supported by the Victorian racing industry, and over half of the full-time jobs are in regional Victoria. In this place, we often hear about how difficult it is to, secure, to find secure full-time work in regional Australia. So the racing industry is a very important provider of employment in these areas. More than 8,500 volunteers also participate in racing, and I think this demonstrates the significant contribution to our community and also the community support for these very, very important race days, but also this important industry. I love hearing and he heading to races whenever I can go along with almost two million other folks in Victoria. It is always a great day out watching the years of hard work by the stable hands, the trainers, the breeders, the jockeys and others coming together to celebrate what they love on the track. And, President, I do look forward to seeing the industry grow and support the vi Victorian economy for many, many years to come. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9am.